Chapter 25 When O'Rourke was finished talking, the three of them stood in silent tableau there in the hissing lamplight. Lucian frozen halfway between the hot plate and the door, O'Rourke standing in shadow by the sprung sofa, and Kate standing closest to the lantern. Her gaze had been moving back and forth between the haggard-looking priest and the younger man, but now she stared only at Lucian. Her thought was, If he runs, we will have to chase him down. O'Rourke looks exhausted. I will have to do it myself. Lucian did not run. O'Rourke rubbed his stubbled cheek. There was no victory in his eyes, only sadness. If Lucian is one of them, thought Kate, then they know where we are. The men in black. The men who killed Tom and Julie and Chandra. The men who stole Joshua. She felt her heartbeat accelerate, was vaguely conscious of her fists nodding as if of their own accord. Lucian stepped back to the hot plate, lifted the wooden spoon, and slowly stirred the now bubbling soup. Kate wanted to strangle him at that moment. Is it true? she asked. Lucian, was it you? If he had shrugged, she would have lifted the wooden chair behind her and brought it down on his head at that moment. He did not shrug. Yes, he said. It was me. He looked at her a second and then lifted the spoon and tasted the soup. Put the spoon down, said Kate. She found herself wondering if she could dodge in time if Lucian threw the pan of boiling soup at her. Lucian set the spoon down and took a step toward her. O'Rourke stepped between them just as Kate raised both fists. Lucian raised both hands, palms outward. Let me explain, he said softly. His Romanian accent seemed stronger. Kate, I would never do anything to hurt Joshua. She felt her composure slip then and remembered pulling the trigger when the man in black had seemed to threaten her baby three months earlier, an eternity earlier. She wished that she had a gun now. No, I mean it, said Lucian, reaching past O'Rourke to touch her arm. She pulled her arm away. Lucian held up his hands again. Kate, it was my job to get the baby out of the country safely, never to hurt him. It seemed as if Michael O'Rourke had not blinked during the entire exchange. Now he stepped aside, unplugged the hot plate, and carefully set the pan of soup aside on a tile ledge out of Lucian's reach. You said you can explain. He crossed his arms. Explain. Lucian tried to smile. I expect you'll have some explaining to do yourself, priest. After all, it's hardly coincidence that you— Lucian! snapped Kate. We're talking about you. The young man nodded and raised his hands again as if urging calm. All right. Where to begin? It was your job to get the baby out of the country, said O'Rourke. What do you mean, your job? Who gave you that job? Who are you working for? Kate glanced at the door, half expecting Securitate forces to break in. There were no sounds except for the hiss of the lantern and the pounding of her heart. I'm not working for anyone, said Lucian. I'm working with a group that's been fighting for freedom for years, centuries. Kate made a rude sound. You're a partisan, freedom fighter, sure. And you fight the tyrants by kidnapping babies. Lucian looked at her. His eyes were very bright. By kidnapping babies from tyrants. Explain, said Father Michael O'Rourke. Lucian sighed and dropped into the couch. Can we all sit? You sit, said Kate, folding her arms to keep her hands from shaking. Sit and talk. Okay, said Lucian. He took another breath. I'm a member of a group that resisted Ceausescu when he was in power. Before that, my father and mother fought Antonescu and the Nazis. By kidnapping babies, interrupted Kate. She could not keep her voice from shaking. Lucian looked at her. Only when they belong to the Voyevode Strigoi. O'Rourke shifted his weight as if his artificial leg were paining him. His face looked very strong in the lantern light. Explain. Lucian twitched a smile. You know about the Strigoi, he said. You Franciscans have been fighting them for centuries. Lucian, said Kate, stepping between the men, why did you take Joshua from the orphanage in Tirgovishta? Were you working for Popescu's people? The young man laughed more easily this time. 
Kate, nobody works for Popescu. That medical pimp worked for anyone who paid him. We paid him. Who is we? snapped Kate. The order. The group my family has belonged to for centuries. Our struggle has been not just for the political survival of our country, but for the survival of its soul. Behind the Ceausescu's, behind the previous communist regimes, behind Jan Antonescu, behind them all, have been the Strigoi, the evil ones who walk like people but who are not, the dark advisers, the ones with power who drain our nation's future away as surely as they have drained the lifeblood of its people. Vampires, said Kate. Her attention was so focused on Lucian at that moment that the periphery of her vision seemed to fade. The young man did shrug this time. That is the Western name. Most of the myth is yours, the sharp teeth, the opera cape, Bella Lugosi and Christopher Lee. Your Nosferatu and vampires are stories to frighten children. Our Strigoi are all too real. Kate found herself blinking rapidly. Why should we believe you? You don't have to believe me, Kate. You were the one person who could discover the truth of the Strigoi on your own. Go ahead. Tell me what you and your fellow researchers found at America's famous CDC. Tell me. He did not wait for her reply. You found a child's immune system which can repair itself, reverse the effects of even severe combined immune deficiency, if it has blood. Kate tried to swallow, but her throat was too constricted. Did you isolate the blood absorption mechanism in the stomach lining? asked Lucian. I have, in the corpses of their dead and the bodies of their living, like Joshua. Were you able to track the immunoreconstruction process in T-cells and B-cells as the retrovirus revitalized the purine pathway? Do I really have to convince you that there are human beings here who rebuild their bodies using the DNA properties from other people's blood, or that they have amazing recuperative powers, or that they could, theoretically, live for centuries? Kate licked her lips. Why did you and Papescu take Joshua from the Tirgavishta orphanage? Why did you lead me to him and pull strings to have me adopt him? Lucian sighed. His voice was tired. You know the answer to that, Kate. You've seen our medical equipment in this country. We know that the Strigoi disease is similar to the HIV virus. We know that the Strigoi retrovirus has amazing properties. But serious gene therapy analysis is beyond this country's abilities. My God, Kate, you've seen our toilets. Do you really think that we can construct and operate an effective Class Six lab? Who is we? repeated O'Rourke. What is the order? Lucian looked at the priest towering over him. The Order of the Dragon. Kate heard the sudden intake of her own breath. I've read about that. Vlad the Impaler belonged to that. He defiled it, snapped Lucian, his voice angry for the first time that night. Vlad Dracul and his bastard son pissed on everything the Order stood for, stands for. And what does it stand for? asked O'Rourke. Lucian jumped to his feet so quickly that Kate thought he was attacking O'Rourke and her. Instead, the young man ripped the buttons off his shirt and exposed his chest. The amulet there glinted gold. A dragon, talons extended, body curling in a circle, the circle of scales superimposed on a double cross. The amulet was very old, the words inscribed on the cross almost rubbed away. Go ahead, Lucian said to O'Rourke. You can read Latin. Oh, how merciful is God, read O'Rourke, leaning closer, and just and faithful. He stepped back. Just and faithful to whom? To the Christ defiled by Vlad Dracul and his spawn, said Lucian. He closed the front of his shirt, sealing it with the only remaining button. To the people whom the order was created to defend. To defend by stealing babies, said Kate her voice dripping with sarcasm. Lucian wheeled on her. Yes, if the baby is the next prince of the Voyevode Strigoi. Kate began laughing. She backed up until she felt the wooden chair behind her legs and dropped onto it, still laughing. She stopped just as the laughter began sounding like sobs. You kidnapped Dracula's baby so that I could adopt him? Yes. Lucian smoothed his hair back with both hands. His hands were shaking slightly. He nodded toward O'Rourke. Ask him, Kate. He knows more than he has told you. 
She looked at the priest. The Franciscans here have heard rumors of this Trigoy for centuries, said O'Rourke, and of the Order of the Dragon. How do we know you're not one of the Strigoi? said Kate, never looking away from the young medical student. Lucian paused. Did you see John Carpenter's remake of Howard Hawks' The Thing? No. Shit, said Lucian. I mean, that doesn't matter. Anyway, they find out who's human in the movie by testing the other guy's blood. I'd be willing to give some if you two would. O'Rourke arched an eyebrow. You're serious, aren't you? You're goddamn right I'm serious, priest. I can vouch for Kate, but between thee and me, I'm not too sure about thee. What would a test prove, said Kate? If you don't show signs of having the retrovirus, you could still be working for the... Strigoi. Lucian nodded. Sure, but you'd know I wasn't one of them. Kate sighed and rubbed her face. I think I may be going crazy. She squinted up at Lucian. What was all that with Amadi tonight? Some sort of elaborate scam? No, said Lucian. My father and other members of the order have known about Amadi's contacts with the Strigoi nomenclatura for some time, but none of us have been able to approach him. But you did business with him. To gain his confidence. So the name he gave us is real? asked Kate. The man is really Strigoi? Lucian shrugged. During the past few months, both the Strigoi and the few surviving members of the Order have gone into hiding. If this person is Strigoi, it explains several things. I'm not saying that I believe any of this, said Kate. But if it's true, and you say your parents are members of the Order of the Dragon, can they help us find this man? Kate had only met Lucian's parents once, but it had been a gracious afternoon of special wine and home-cooked treats in a lovely old apartment in East Bucharest. Lucian's father, a writer and intellectual, had impressed her as someone of great wisdom and influence. The Strigoi murdered my parents in August, said Lucian. His voice was soft. Most of the members of the order here in Bucharest were tracked down and killed. Most simply disappeared. My parents' bodies were left hanging in the apartment where my sister or I would find them. A warning. The Strigoi are very sure of themselves these days. Kate fought down the urge to hug Lucian or touch his cheek. He may be lying. Every instinct she trusted said that he wasn't. You talked about the hospital administrator, Popescu, in the past tense, said O'Rourke. Lucian nodded. Dead. The police found his body, drained of blood, in the same week that Mr. Stansu, your ministry man, ended up on the slab at the medical school. Why would they kill Mr. Popescu? asked Kate. She heard the answer in her own mind a second before Lucian spoke again. They tracked the child, Joshua, from the orphanage to Popescu's hospital. I'm certain that the weasel told them everything he knew about you and me before they cut his throat. And you've been in hiding since then? said O'Rourke. I've been in hiding since the day Kate left, said Lucian. I urged my parents and friends to flee, but they were stubborn, brave. Lucian turned away, but not before Kate saw his eyes fill with tears. Maybe Strigoi are good actors, she thought. She was exhausted. The lingering smell of the hot soup in the room made her a bit dizzy. Look, said Lucian, spreading his large hands on his knees as he sat on the sofa arm. I can't show you any other credentials than this, he tapped his chest, proving that I belong to the Order, or that the Order exists. But use common sense. Why would I have helped smuggle Joshua to the hospital and then helped you adopt him if I were Strigoi? We don't even know if your Strigoi exists, said Kate. Lucian nodded. All right, but I think I can give you a demonstration that may prove it. Kate and O'Rourke waited. First, we go to the medical school tonight and do a blood test on me to prove that I am not Strigoi, said Lucian. The equipment is primitive, but a simple interactive test should show whether my blood exhibits the Strigoi retrovirus reaction. J-virus, Kate said softly. What? J-virus. She looked up. We named it after Joshua at CDC. Okay, said Lucian. We do a simple J-virus test, and then we stake out, 
if you'll pardon the expression, the house of the man Amadi named. We follow him wherever he goes. Why? said O'Rourke. Because if he's Trigoy, said Lucian, he'll lead us to the others. My father was certain that Joshua had been the child chosen for the investiture ceremony, and it must be almost time for that to begin. What is... began Kate. I'll explain when we drive over to the medical school labs, said Lucian. He lifted the soup onto the burner and plugged the hot plate in again. What are you doing? asked O'Rourke. If we're going vampire hunting, I want something in my stomach, said Lucian. He did not smile as he began stirring the soup. The university medical school was dark except for the south wing, where a guard sat dozing. Lucian led them through leaf-scattered gardens to a basement door. He fumbled with a heavy ring of keys and unlocked a portal that Kate thought would have looked more at home on a gothic castle than as part of a medical school. The basement corridor was narrow, crammed with battered chairs and cobwebbed desks, and it smelled of rat droppings. Lucian had brought a penlight. At one point he unlocked a side door which swung open with a creak. "'Who's waiting for us?' thought Kate. She tried to catch O'Rourke's eye, but the priest seemed lost in thought. The room appeared to be a storage room for even more ancient medical texts. Kate could smell the mildew and see the rat droppings here, except that a blanketed cot, a reading lamp, and a countertop hot plate had been added. Kate noticed recent American paperbacks stacked alongside medical texts. "'You've been living here?' asked O'Rourke. Lucian nodded. "'The Strigoi ransacked my apartment, terrorized homes of friends of mine, and—I told you about my parents, but they only made a cursory check of the medical school.' He smiled. "'If I were to return to classes, well, a dozen of my friends and instructors would inform on me, but this wing of the building is empty at night.' He shut off the light and led them farther down the corridor, then up two darkened flights of stairs. In the lab, Kate said, I don't understand. Are the Strigoi in charge of the police and border guards? Are the police part of this? Lucian paused in arranging his microscope and equipment. No, he said, but in this country, and others, I am told, everyone works for the Strigoi at one time or another. They control those who control. Kate was finding it hard to believe that this area was the working section of a medical school laboratory. There was a clutter of pre-World War II-type optic microscopes, cracked beakers, dusty test tubes, chipped tile counters, and battered wooden stools. The place looked like someone's nightmare image of an American ghetto high school science lab years after it had been deserted. Only Lucian had said that this was the laboratory area for the medical school. So Ceausescu was a Strigoi? asked O'Rourke. Lucian shook his head. Ceausescu, both of the Ceausescus, were instruments of the Strigoi. They took orders from the leader of the Voyevode Strigoi family. The dark advisor, said O'Rourke. Lucian glanced up sharply. Where did you hear that term? So there was a dark advisor? Oh, yes, said Lucian. He moved an antique autoclave onto the counter and plugged it in. Kate, would you find some lancets? Kate glanced around, hunting for sterile packs, but Lucian said, No, they're in the sink. A chipped enamel bedpan held several steel lancets. She shook her head and handed the pan to Lucian. He set the pan in the autoclave, and it began to hum. This test isn't important, she said. It proves nothing. I think it does, said Lucian. He pulled down blackout shades on the windows and turned on a light over the microscope bench. Besides, I have something else to show you. Lucian crouched in front of a small refrigerator and removed a small vial. Standard whole blood, he said. He used an eyedropper to prepare three slides with the whole blood. Then he removed the lancets from the autoclave and brought alcohol and swabs out from under the counter. Who's first? What are we supposed to see here? said O'Rourke. Little vampire platelets leaping on our blood cells? Lucian turned to Kate. Do you want to explain? When Chandra, when the experts at our CDC had isolated the J-virus, she said, it became easy in retrospect to notice the effect on whole blood and immunodeficient precultured samples. The J-virus, it's really a retrovirus, binds GP120 glycoprotein to CD4 receptors in T-helper lymphocytes. Whoa, whoa! 
said O'Rourke. You mean you can just look at blood samples in a microscope and tell if they're strigoi? Kate paused and looked at Lucian. It's not quite that simple. We can't just look in the eyepiece, but, yes, you can tell a difference when the J retrovirus interacts with alien blood cells. Lucian set the first slide in place. Did you discover the amazing ratio of infected cells? He was talking to Kate. We placed it at almost 99%, she said. What does that mean? asked O'Rourke. Kate explained. The HIV retrovirus goes after about one CD4 cell in a hundred thousand. That's a lot when you realize how many billions of cells we have. But the J virus, well, it's greedy. It tries to infect all of the alien blood cells it encounters. O'Rourke took a step away from the counter. His face looked very pale above his dark suit and Roman collar. But it can't be that contagious. We'd all be vampires. Strigoi, if it worked like that. Kate made herself smile. No, it's not contagious at all, as far as we can tell. It's generated in the host's body by a complex recessive-recessive gene trait that we don't understand. It's also codependent upon the SCID-type immune deficiency disease that comes as part of the package. Which means, said O'Rourke. Lucian answered without lifting his face from the microscope. Which means that you have to be dying of a rare blood disease in order to gain virtual immortality from the same disease. It's not catching. He looked up. Although we might all wish that it were. Who goes first? Kate made a you-first gesture. Awesome, dude, said Lucian in his mock mutant turtle dialect. He lifted a lancet, pricked his finger, squeezed enough blood free so that he could transfer a smear to the prepared slide, and handed the lancet pan to Kate. You want to do the honors with our father here? Kate swabbed O'Rourke's middle finger, drew blood, prepared his slide, and did the same for herself. I still say that this proves nothing, she said. Lucian spent several minutes treating the samples while Kate watched. Well, at least it proves that we can't see any little vampire platelets in my sample, he said at last, standing back from the microscope. Kate bent over and peered through. O'Rourke waved away his turn. I could never see anything but my own eyelashes, he said. What's all the stuff you're doing to it? Kate's sample went onto the slide tray next. Preparing it for an essay to check reverse transcriptase, said Kate. O'Rourke sounded disappointed. So we couldn't see little vampire platelets even if we tried? Sorry, dude, said Lucian, and brought out a centrifuge that Kate thought looked as if it had been designed in the Middle Ages. But the essay shouldn't take too long. He held up a clean vial. Now I want to take one more sample. Kate had the impulse to glance over her shoulder. She wondered what she would do if someone were standing in the shadows there. From whom? she said. Exactly, said Lucian. He doused the light and led them by penlight down the corridor, back into the basement, and then down another flight of stairs into an even deeper basement. Kate smelled it first. The morgue, she whispered to O'Rourke. Lucian stopped at the last set of swinging doors. It's okay. This is the old morgue. The students and teachers use the newer, smaller one in the West Wing. But this is where the cadavers are stored before the students get them, and sometimes the city uses it as an overflow depot for unclaimed bodies. Mr. Stansu from the Ministry? said Kate. Yeah, this is where I saw him. But my letter to you wasn't totally candid, Kate. I'd been tipped by a friend in the order that Stansu had been murdered, just like Popescu. Can we meet this friend of yours? said O'Rourke. No. Why not? He was murdered the same week they killed my parents, said Lucian. They cut his head off. He opened the doors, and the three of them went into the chilly darkness. Bare steel tables with ceramic basins and pedestals loomed in the darkness. They were not clean. You know, said O'Rourke, his voice flat, that we only have your word that your parents were killed. Mm-hmm, agreed Lucian. He handed the penlight to Kate. Thank you he said as she held it steady. He opened a door and slid the long tray out. Lucian lifted the sheet. Kate, do you recognize? said Lucian, his voice very tight. Yes. The last time she had seen Lucian's father, 
The man had been complimenting her in French, laughing, and pouring more wine for everyone at the table. Now it looked as if his throat had been cut in two places. His skin was very white. Lucian closed the drawer and opened the one next to it. And this? Kate looked at the middle-aged woman who had blushed with pleasure at Kate's invitation for the 4C family to visit her in Colorado when Lucian brought them over after finishing medical school. Mrs. Forsey had done her hair especially for their afternoon meeting. Kate could still see a curl of the graying hair. The throat wounds were almost identical to her husband's. "'Yes,' said Kate, grasping O'Rourke's hand and squeezing without meaning to. "'What if they were actors, not really Lucian's parents? The whole thing a complex plot?' Kate knew better. Lucian slid the drawer shut. "'Is this what you wanted to show us?' said O'Rourke. No. He fumbled with the ring of keys and unlocked a heavy steel door set in the far wall. It was colder and darker in the next room, but Kate could see glowing dials and diodes illuminating a low metal cylinder that looked like one of the steel watering tanks she had seen on ranches in Colorado. The surface of the tank was bubbling and broiling. Two steps closer and Kate stopped, her hands flying to her face. Jesus! breathed O'Rourke. He raised one hand as if to cross himself. Come, whispered Lucian. We'll take the final sample. He led them forward. The steel tank was about three feet deep and seven feet long, and it was filled with blood. At first Kate could not believe it was blood, despite the color revealed in the dim light and the obvious viscosity, but Lucian had watched her reaction and said, Yes, it is whole blood. I stole it from District One Hospital and other places. Much of it comes from the American relief agencies. Kate thought of the dying children who had needed whole blood transfusions while she was working in Bucharest the previous May, but before she could snap something at Lucian, she saw what floated in the tank just beneath the roiling surface. Oh, my God! she had whispered. Now, despite her horror, she leaned closer to peer into the tank, squinting in the red and green glow from the dozen or so medical instruments that clustered at one end of the trough, insulated leads and cables flowing into the bath of slowly bubbling human blood. It was, or had been, a man, naked now, eyes and mouth wide open as the face floated just beneath the surface. Different parts of his body gleamed in the oily light as unseen currents in the blood moved him to the surface and then let him submerge again. He had been slashed almost to pieces with what looked, to Kate's eye, trained to trauma wounds, to have been a large, bladed weapon. A sharpened shovel, said Lucian, as if reading her mind. Kate licked her lips. Who did it? She knew what Lucian would answer. I did it. His gaze seemed normal, neither angry nor penitent. I found him alone, knocked him on the back of the head with a long-handled shovel. I think you call it a spade and then chopped him up, as you see. O'Rourke crouched next to the tank. Kate could see droplets of blood spattering the back of the priest's hand as he clutched the steel rim. Who is he? Lucian raised his eyebrows. Didn't you guess? This is one of the men who murdered my parents. He moved to the oscilloscope on the metal cart next to the tank and changed the display by throwing a switch. Kate stared at the corpse in the tank. The man's left ear was missing, and that side of his face had been sliced open from the cheekbone to chin. The neck was almost severed. She could see the spinal cord as the body bobbed slightly, and there were massive gouges on his upper shoulder, arm, and chest. Kate could see exposed ligaments and ribs. The body had been opened up at the waist, and the interior organs were clearly visible. The body opened like a medical student's cadaver. Kate looked at Lucian. Then she noticed for the first time what the electronic monitors behind him were monitoring. She backed away from the tank with an involuntary intake of breath. It's alive, she whispered. O'Rourke glanced up, startled, and then wiped his hands on the side of the tank. How could this poor... It's alive, Kate whispered again. She walked to the instruments, ignoring Lucian. Blood pressure was flat, Heart rate was so low that it registered little except the occasional spasm of a random surge as the cardiac muscle moved blood through its chambers and back into the medium of blood that surrounded it, and the EEG was like nothing she had ever seen, alpha and theta spikes so irregular and far apart 
that they might as well have been messages from some distant star, but not flatline, not brain dead. The thing in the tank was in some state more removed from reality than sleep, but more alert than a coma victim, and it was definitely alive. Kate looked at Lucian again, still the friendly, open expression and the soft smile, the smile of a murderer. No, the smile of a sadist, perhaps. They slaughtered my parents, he said. They hung my mother and father by their heels, slit their throats as if they were swine, and drank from their open wounds. He looked back at the corpse in the tank. This thing should have died a century ago. Kate moved back to the tank, rolled up her sleeves, and reached in with both hands, her fingers sliding through lesions and broken ribs to touch the man's heart. After half a moment there was the slightest movement, as of a swallow stirring slightly in the palm of one's hand. A second later there was an almost indiscernible movement of the man's whitened eyes. How can this be? asked Kate. But she knew, had known since she herself had pulled the trigger of Tom's shotgun and then seen the same man again on the night of the fire. Lucian gestured at the instruments. That's what I'm trying to find out. It's why I can't leave the medical school. He waved at the body in the tank. The legends say that the Nosferatu come back from the dead, but the fact is that they can die. How? said O'Rourke. If this man is still alive after this savagery, how would you kill one? Lucian smiled. Decapitation, immolation, evisceration, multiple amputation, even simple defenestration, if they fell far enough onto something hard enough. The smile wavered. Or just deny them blood after their injuries and they'll die. Not easily, but eventually. Kate frowned. What do you mean, not easily? The retrovirus feeds on foreign blood cells in order to rebuild its own immune system, or entire physical systems, said Lucian. You've seen it on the micro level at your CDC lab. He opened his palm toward the tank. Now you see it on the macro level. But... He walked to a multiple IV feed above the tank and unclipped the drip. Deny it fresh blood, host blood, and the virus will feed on itself. Kate looked at the man in the tank. Feeding on its own cells? Cannibalizing its own blood cells, even though the retrovirus has already transcribed the DNA there? Not just the blood cells, said Lucian. The J-virus attacks whatever host cells it can reach, first along the arterial system, then the major organs, then brain cells. Kate folded her arms and shook her head. It doesn't make sense. It has no survival value for the person at all. It... She stopped, realizing. Lucian nodded. At that point, the retrovirus is trying to save only the retrovirus. Cannibalism allows a few weeks grace time, even while the body is decaying around it. Perhaps months. Perhaps, in a body that has been transcripted for centuries, years. Kate shuddered. O'Rourke walked to the instruments, then back to the tank. His limp was visible. If I understand what you two are saying, then a Strigoi could linger in a type of physical hell for months or more after clinical death. But surely he couldn't be conscious. Lucian pointed to the EEG. Where Kate had palpated the man's heart, the brain waves had shown a definite series of spikes. O'Rourke closed his eyes. Are you torturing this man? asked Kate. No, I'm documenting the reconstruction. He opened a drawer in one of the cards and handed Kate a stack of Polaroid photographs. They looked like standard autopsy photos. She could see the steel examination table under the white flesh of the corpse, but the man's body was much more mutilated than it looked now in the tank. There were deep wounds in the photographs where only livid scars were visible on the actual torso. Sixteen days ago, said Lucian, and I'm almost sure from the data that the reconstructive process is accelerating. Another two weeks and he'll be whole and hearty again, he chuckled, and probably a little bit pissed at me. Kate shook her head again. The simple question of body mass. Every gram of body fat is converted, absorbed, and reabsorbed, and gene-directed to fill in as building material where needed, said Lucian. He shrugged. Oh, you wouldn't get the whole man back if I cut off his legs or removed his pelvis. Mass redistribution has its limits, but anything short of that and... 
Voila! He bowed toward the tank. And they need fresh blood, said Kate. She glared at the medical student. Is this Joshua's fate? No. The child has received transfusions, but as of the time he left Romania, he had not partaken of the sacrament. Sacrament? said O'Rourke. The actual drinking of human blood, said Lucian. That's sacrilege, said O'Rourke. Yes. The shadow organ, muttered Kate. Then, louder, when they drink the blood directly, the J-virus carries out the DNA transcription and immunoreconstruction more efficiently? Oh, yes, said Lucian. And it has other effects? On the brain? The personality? Lucian shrugged. I'm no expert on the effects of psychological and physical addiction, but... But the Strigoi change, after they've actually drunk human blood? said Kate. We think so. Kate leaned against an oscilloscope. Random spikes pulsed green echoes onto her skin. Then I've lost him, she whispered. They've turned him into something else. She stared at a dark corner of the large room. Lucian moved closer, lifted a hand toward her shoulder, then dropped it. No, I don't think so, Kate. Her head snapped up. I think they're saving Joshua for the investiture ceremony, he said. That will be the first time he partakes of the sacrament. Father Michael O'Rourke made a sarcastic noise. You're suddenly quite the expert on matters, Trigoy. No more than you, priest, Lucian snapped back. You Franciscans and Benedictines and Jesuits, you watch and watch and watch, for centuries you watch, while these animals bleed my people dry and lead our nation into ruin. O'Rourke stared without blinking. Lucian turned away and busied himself with the IV, resuming the drip. You can't just leave it... him... here, said Kate, gesturing toward the tank. Lucian licked his lips. There are others who will benefit from the data even if I die. Even if all of us die. He whirled at them and clenched his fists. And do not worry. There are few of us in the Order of the Dragon who have survived. But even if I die, someone will come here and cremate this... this Dracul. There is no way that I will allow it to live and prey upon us again. No way at all. The medical student removed a large syringe from the drawer, extracted blood directly from the body's neck, resumed the IV drip, locked both the inner door and the morgue, and led them upstairs to the lab. He finished the assay in ten minutes and showed Kate the results three normal samples, and one teeming with the J retrovirus attacking introduced blood cells. Lucian led them out of the lab, out into the rainy night again. Kate breathed deeply in the parking lot, allowing the soft rain to wash away the stink of formaldehyde and blood from her clothes. What now? asked Kate. She felt exhausted and emotionally brittle. Nothing was clear. Lucian turned on the single wiper blade, its squeak timing the night like a metronome. One of us should stake out this man's house. He held up Amadi's slip of paper. Let me see that, said O'Rourke. He looked at the slip of paper in the dim light, blinked, and then laughed until he collapsed against the hard cushions of the back seat. What? said Kate. O'Rourke handed back the slip of paper and rubbed his eyes. Lucian, does this man work for the ONT? Lucian frowned. For the Office of National Tourism? No, of course not. He's a very rich contractor who dabbled in the black market for heavy equipment. His state-supported company erected the presidential palace and many of the huge empty buildings Ceausescu ordered built in this section of the city. Why? O'Rourke looked as if he was going to laugh again. He rubbed his cheek instead. The name. Radu Fortuna. Is he a short man, swarthy, a thick mustache and a gap between his front teeth? Yes, said Lucian, puzzled. And one of us should be watching his house around the clock. He glanced at his watch. It is almost eleven p.m. I will take the first shift. O'Rourke shook his head. Let's all go, he said. We'll watch the house while we watch each other. Lucian shrugged and then pulled the Dacia out into the empty, rain-glistened streets. Chapter 26 Mr. Radu Fortuna's home was hidden behind high walls in the nomenclatura section of East Bucharest, 
Large homes like this in the center of the city had long since been converted into embassies or offices for state ministries, but here, in the oldest and finest section of the city, Ceausescu and his political heirs had rewarded themselves and the chosen of their nomenclatura with fine homes unchanged since the pre-war reign of King Carol. Shit, muttered Lucian as he drove by the walled estate. I should have realized from the address. What's the matter? said Kate. Lucian turned and went around the block. The streets here were wide and empty. During Ceausescu's days, no one but the leader and his nomenclatura cronies were allowed to drive here. This entire eight-block section was off-limits. O'Rourke leaned forward. You mean you could get arrested just by driving here? Yeah. Lucian dimmed his headlights and came around the block again. You could disappear just for driving here. Did that change when Ceausescu died? asked Kate. Yeah, sort of. Lucian stopped and backed into an alley that was all but hidden by low trees, most still heavy with their sodden leaves, and bushes that had not been trimmed in decades. Branches scraped against the side of the Dacia until only the windshield looked out at the walls and gate and entrance drive of Radu Fortuna's mansion. The Polizzi and Securitate still patrol here, though. It wouldn't be a great idea to get stopped, since I'm certainly on their detention list and you don't have any papers at all. He backed the Dacia deeper until they were peering through scattered branches at the street. The rain stopped after a while, but the dripping from the branches onto the roof and hood of the car was almost as loud. The interior of the Dacia grew cold. Windows fogged, and Lucian had to use a handkerchief to wipe the windshield clean. Sometime around midnight a police car cruised slowly down the street. It did not stop or throw a searchlight in their direction. When it was gone, Lucian reached under the seat and brought out a large thermos of tea. "'Sorry, there's just one cup,' he said, handing the lid to Kate. "'You and I will have to share the flask, Father O'Rourke.' Kate huddled over the hot cup, trying to stop shaking. Since O'Rourke's revelations about Lucian a few hours ago, the center of things seemed to have fled. She did not know who or what to believe now. Lucian seemed to be saying that O'Rourke was also part of some plot involving the Strigoi. She did not have the energy to question either of them. Joshua, she thought. With her eyes shut tightly, she could see his face, smell the soft baby scent of him, feel the silky touch of his thin hair against her cheek. She opened her eyes. Lucian, tell us an hour leader joke. The medical student handed the thermos to O'Rourke. Did you hear about the time that Bridget Bardot visited our workers' paradise? Kate shook her head. It was very cold. She could see floodlights in the compound across the street glinting on coiled razor wire atop the wall. It had started to rain again. Our leader had a private audience with Bardot and was smitten at first sight, said Lucian. You've seen photos of the late Mrs. Ceausescu. You can understand why. Anyway, he begins babbling in an attempt to impress the French actress. I am in charge here, he says. Anything Mademoiselle wishes is my command. All right, says Bardot. Open the borders. Well, for a moment, Ceausescu is, how do you say it, nonplussed. But then he regains his composure and leers his monster's smile at her. Ah, he says in a conspirator's whisper, I know what you want. He winks at her. You want to be alone with me. Lucian took the thermos back from O'Rourke and sipped tea. The priest cleared his throat in the back seat. Kate wondered if his leg hurt him on cold, wet nights like this. She had never heard O'Rourke complain, even when the limp was very visible. I was in Czechoslovakia when Chernobyl happened years ago, said O'Rourke. Were there jokes here about that? Lucian shrugged. Sure, we joke about everything that scares the shit out of us or makes us want to cry. Don't you? Kate nodded. Like the definition of NASA after the Challenger disaster in that same year of 86? she said. Oops, need another seven astronauts. No one laughed. They were not talking to amuse one another. In Czechoslovakia, said O'Rourke, the gag was that the new national anthem for the USSR after Chernobyl was Peknam Spadla, Peknam Spadla. Our oven has collapsed, our oven has collapsed. After a moment of silence, the priest said, It's a folk song. Here, after Chernobyl, said Lucian. We asked each other what the three shortest things in the world were. What were they? said Kate, finishing the last of her tea. 
the Romanian Constitution, the menu in a Polish restaurant, and the lifespan of a Chernobyl fireman. They sat in the darkness without speaking for several minutes. Rain beat a tattoo on the roof. What do you think will happen to Gorbachev and the USSR? O'Rourke asked Lucian. The medical student chuckled softly. They are both extinct, but neither knows it yet. When Gorbachev came back from the attempted coup in August and announced that he still had faith in the Marxist system, he was announcing his own obsolescence. And the nation? said Kate. Lucian shook his head. There is no nation there, only an empire that can no longer cow its subjugated parts into submission. The Soviet Union is already on the scrap heap of history, just as socialist Romania is. Neither organism has had the decency to realize that it is dead, a Nosferatu. He tapped fingers on the plastic steering wheel. But Russia has Yeltsin, and he is an ambitious man, a very ambitious man. I see a glint in his eye that reminds me of our former leader here. Yeltsin will use Russian sovereignty to break up the USSR by next spring. So soon, said Kate. Sooner, perhaps. I would not be surprised if the CCCP is officially buried by the new year. But what if Gorbachev... began O'Rourke. Lucian held his hand up for silence, then leaned forward and cleaned the windshield of condensation. The electric gates of Radu Fortuna's compound were opening. Kate sunk lower in her seat, knowing as she did so that it was silly to try to hide. A black Mercedes slipped through the gates, turned left onto the street, and accelerated away. The headlights had passed over their Dacia without pausing. "'Is that him?' whispered Kate. Lucian shrugged, started the Dacia after three grinding attempts, and pulled out just as the Mercedes turned out of sight. The Dacia rattled and squeaked as Lucian accelerated down the street at forty or fifty miles per hour, his headlights still off. They slid onto Strada Galati and saw the taillights of the Mercedes three blocks ahead. Lucian hunched over the wheel and floored the accelerator. The Dacia complained more loudly, but roared and rattled down the empty street. Follow that car, whispered Kate. They kept the Mercedes in sight while driving north on Strada Galati, found a bit of midnight traffic, mostly trucks, to blend with going west on Boulevard du Ilia Pintilia, but almost lost the Mercedes when it disappeared around the traffic circle at Piazza Victoriae. Lucian guessed correctly that the sedan had turned north onto Shosawa Kisilev, and after a moment of sickening tension, the Mercedes was visible again, splashing through an intersection two blocks ahead. Lucian whipped the Dacia up to almost ninety kilometers per hour until the Mercedes was less than a block ahead, then he slowed to keep pace. It helped that the few other cars and trucks on the main boulevard were also ignoring all posted speed limits. They stayed right again onto the bucharest Ploiesti Road and passed out of the tree-lined sections of the city, past huge buildings and monuments dark and silent in the night. Then they were in the countryside, with fields falling away on either side. The Mercedes passed the turnoff to Otopeni Airport without slowing, but Lucian brought the Dacia down to sixty kilometers per hour as they all caught sight of the usual military and police vehicles along the road to the International Airport. Beyond Otopeni, he accelerated again, keeping only one truck between the Mercedes and Dacia. We don't even know if this is Radu Fortuna, said O'Rourke from the back seat. Why did you know his name? asked Kate. Why did you laugh? The priest explained about his first trip to Romania two years earlier with the billionaire Werner Deacon Trent's assessment team. Lucian almost drove off the road. Werner Deacon Trent was here? His voice was shaky. He may still be here, said O'Rourke. His foundation and corporation announced his illness weeks after the rest of us returned. To this day, no one knows where he is or in what condition. He's sort of the Howard Hughes of the nineties. Lucian shook his head. The single windshield wiper whipped back and forth in front of him. Werner Deacon Trent is no Howard Hughes, he said tightly. And how does Comrade Radu Fortuna figure in with Mr. Trent? O'Rourke explained about the opinionated ONT guy during that bizarre tour. Lucian smiled with humor. I suspect that Trent and Fortuna were having some fun with you. Kate looked away from the rain-swept windshield and dark fields. You're saying that Werner Deacon Trent may be Strigoi? Lucian was silent for a long interval. 
The Order has believed that Trent may have been one of the original family members, he said finally. Perhaps the legendary father. Father? said Kate. But at that moment the Mercedes ahead of them turned off the highway onto a secondary road. Shit, said Lucian. He had followed the truck past the road, and now he had to slow, find a place wide enough to turn around, and make a U-turn. The Mercedes was the dimmest of taillight glows by the time the Dacia was bouncing down the narrow, potholed lane after it. They passed village homes and low, systematized apartments on their left, all dark. Kate glanced at the odometer again. They had come about thirty-five kilometers from Bucharest. I think I know where they're going, said Lucian. Kate saw the sign as they entered the second small village, Shnagov. I've read about this place, she said. The Mercedes turned right at a fork in the road in the center of the village and sped up again. Lucian doused the headlights and followed it as best he could. The bumpy road was almost invisible in the dark and rain. We'll lose them, said O'Rourke as the taillights disappeared around a bend. Lucian shook his head. A mile or so farther on and they could see the Mercedes brake lights flare, and then the headlights became visible to their left as the black sedan turned down an even narrower lane. Lucian let the Dacia slowly approach the turnoff. Hurry, said Kate as the Mercedes dwindled down the long lane. Can't, said Lucian. It's a private road. See the checkpoint? Kate saw it then as the Mercedes stopped, a gate with several vehicles parked near it. Flashlights flared briefly as someone checked the identities of the Mercedes driver and occupants. Kate could make out the lights of a huge home a quarter of a mile or so beyond the checkpoint. God damn it, breathed Kate. Is there another way to that house? Lucian drummed his fingers on the wheel. I don't think the house is the destination, he said as if musing to himself. Headlights suddenly became visible far behind them. Damn, hang on. With the headlights still off, he flogged the Dacia down the highway, squealing around turns and bouncing over sudden dips. The last lights fell away behind them and a forest closed in on either side. I want to go back, said Kate, her heart pounding with frustration and anger. If there's a chance that Joshua is at that house, I want to go back even if I have to cross the fields on foot. Lucian did not slow. That compound was on the lake, he said. I know another way. There was no other traffic as they drove another mile or two alongside a railroad track, the road deteriorating the farther they got from the village, until finally, just as the lane crossed the tracks, Lucian turned left onto an even narrower road. Gravel and puddles made noise beneath the wheels. He turned on the parking lights as the Dacia crept forward under a dripping arch of bare branches. Sort of a national forest area, he said, frowning as he concentrated on missing potholes the size of small lakes. Finally he cursed and turned on the headlights. They passed under a sagging wooden arch with faded letters, and the lane dwindled to little more than a wide path through the thick forest. Just as Kate was ready to ask if Lucian knew where he was, the lane opened up onto an asphalt surface again, and they drove past a dark and silent stucco building on their left. Restaurant and guest house, said Lucian, not even glancing toward it. It's been shut since Ceausescu died. Several smaller lanes led to their right and left, but Lucian kept the Dacia on the widest of them. Kate could see overturned picnic tables and weed-cluttered grassy areas now. The area looked like an American state park that had been abandoned for decades. Suddenly Lucian slowed, stopped, backed the Dacia, and turned left down an asphalt lane no wider than a footpath. The lane ended a hundred yards downhill, and gravel hissed under the wheels. Kate could see a faint gleam of water between the trees ahead. Lucian parked the car. We need to hurry! He reached into the glove compartment and pulled out a flashlight and something heavier. Kate blinked when she realized that the second object was a pistol of some sort, a semi-automatic from the shape of it. Lucian tucked the pistol away in his jacket and tried the flashlight. The beam was strong. Let's go, he said. They went another hundred feet downhill through wet grass, and suddenly there was a low wire fence in front of them. There was a gate to their left, but it was locked. Lucian clambered over the gate, and Kate followed. O'Rourke's artificial leg obviously gave him some problem, but he made no noise as he used his upper body strength to pull himself up and over. 
the three crouched on what appeared to be a small grassy peninsula with a dock, a shack, and heaps of what Kate realized were rowboats stacked upside down. The rain had stopped, but the forest dripped behind them. Cuckoos and bullfrogs were making noise from the swampy inlet to their left. Lucian leaned close to whisper. I don't think they still keep a guard in the shack, but let's be as quiet as we can. He motioned to O'Rourke and the two men lifted the top rowboat, righted it, and carried it to the gravel loading area near the dock. Lucian gestured for silence again and disappeared in the shadows near the shack, returning with two heavy oars. Kate clambered aboard first and settled into the bow while Lucian locked the oars in and O'Rourke pushed them off and lifted himself into the stern. They floated past the dock and Lucian rowed almost silently until they were far out past the dock and the darkened shack. Kate's eyes had adjusted to the dark now and she realized that they were in a wide lagoon. A large dark building, obviously the restaurant guest house they had driven by, terminated one end of the lagoon a few hundred yards to their left and Kate could see weed-littered steps coming down to the water there. Ahead of them, a dark line of trees was the source of more swamp sounds. Kate realized how loud the cacophony was now, and Lucian's stronger strokes with the oars were muted by the bullfrog and cuckoo noises from three sides. Lucian aimed the rowboat between two tree-lined points out into what Kate realized was the actual lake. It seemed very wide in the darkness. The opposite shore, if it was the opposite shore, the smallest of tree lines across the horizon. They had passed out of the entrance to the lagoon, only a hundred and fifty feet or so across there, and into the choppy waves, strong currents, and cold winds of the main lake, when Kate looked down, lifted wet feet, and said, We're shipping water. La Naiba, said Lucian. Sorry, can you two bail? With what? said O'Rourke. All we have is our hands. The priest leaned over the side a minute. It doesn't look too deep here. I think I see weeds or something in the water. Kate heard Lucian chuckle. The lagoon was a few meters deep, he said. Out here it's a bit deeper. Lake Schnagoff is said to be the deepest lake in all of Europe. As far as I know, they've never plumbed its depths. There was silence for a minute except for frog and cuckoo sounds. O'Rourke said, Shall we make for the shore? No, said Kate. We'll bail with our hands if we have to. Lucian rode. The lagoon entrance receded and then was lost to sight as they pulled to their left, deeper into the dark expanse of lake. Kate could see the bright lights of a large building a mile or two across the water. Is that the place where Radu Fortuna's Mercedes was headed? She whispered to Lucian. The young man grunted. We're not headed there, though, he whispered. We're going to the island. He nodded toward a dark hump which Kate only now realized was not part of the North Shore. It was still half a mile or more away. But if Fortuna is at the house on shore, she began, then stopped as sounds of a large boat's engine coughing to life crossed the water to them. She turned around and watched from the bow as a ship's running lights came on below the brightly lit estate. Suddenly there were more lights, and three small speedboats roared away from the distant dock and pounded out into the lake. Shit, whispered Lucian and shipped his oars. The three of them crouched expectantly and watched as the speedboats growled their way toward them. Searchlights stabbed out and across the water. Down, whispered Lucian, and they all crouched in three inches of water, only the tops of their heads above the gunnels. The speedboats crossed and crisscrossed the half mile of water between the estate and the opposite side of the island, then swept around to the other side, their searchlights probing both the shore and the expanse of lake beyond. One of the boats roared out toward the lagoon they had just rowed from, its searchlight on and the smacking of its hull sharp and clear across the dark water. The boat swerved and seemed headed straight toward them. Kate crouched and found that she was whispering to herself, citing a litany to the darkness, the clouds above, and the low profile of their rowboat. The speedboat roared closer. "'If they shoot, go into the water,' whispered Lucian. He racked the slide on the automatic pistol. Kate wondered if O'Rourke could swim well with his artificial leg. Well, she was a good swimmer. Three times a week she swam laps at the Boulder Rec Center, and if need be, she'd drag both men back to shore. Joshua, she thought, adding his name to her whispered litany. The speedboat arced to its right and passed them sixty yards to their left. 
The waves were higher now as a wind came up, and their little rowboat could not have been more than the briefest of silhouettes against an equally dark shoreline. Kate, O'Rourke, and Lucian crouched in the lapping water as the speedboat roared into the lagoon, stabbed searchlights along the shore there, visible as a glow through autumn bare trees, and then pounded its way back out and around the perimeter of the lake, occasionally checking out something along the shore with its light. Once there was the rattle of small arms fire, sharp and metallic and clear across the water, and then the boat completed its circuit and roared back toward the island. The large boat, some sort of cruiser forty or fifty feet long by the looks of it, was chugging its way toward the island now, all three speedboats as escort. Kate moved back to the bow of the rowboat, feeling the water lapping above her ankles. She was soaked and cold. Above them, the clouds made gaps through which she could see the stars. A cold wind blew at them from the north. Lucian began rowing again. When he paused to gasp for breath, O'Rourke said, Let me take a turn, and moved to the center seat. Kate was shivering now, wishing that she had volunteered first, but she wanted to stay in the bow and watch the island. The large boat had tied up at a dock on the left point of the island while two of the speedboats also put in. The third one continued to orbit. Kate heard shouts and then saw flashlights gleam on the dock. They were doused and suddenly torches flared to life. Dark figures beneath the line of torches were clearly visible as they filed from the dock up under the trees onto the island proper. We need to time this right, said Lucian, stopping O'Rourke's rowing and pointing to a place several hundred meters east of the dock. We can put in there, but we have to make a dash for it when the patrol boat is on the far side of the island. He removed his watch and stared at the radium dial as the boat continued its counterclockwise patrol. Three minutes, ten seconds, said Lucian as the speedboat growled its way around the southwest point again. Are you fresh enough to row that fast? he asked O'Rourke. The priest nodded. When the speedboat disappeared around the east point again, he put his back into it. The rowboat's progress seemed slow, the current pushing them west stronger than ever. Kate could hear O'Rourke's grunts and wheezing breath. Two minutes, whispered Lucian, studying his watch. Kate could just hear the speedboat's engine on the other side of the small island, could see dark shapes on the dock. What if they see us? What if the boat speeds up? O'Rourke rowed steadily, the clumsy oars biting deep. The island seemed no closer than it had before. One minute, whispered Lucian. Kate could hear the speedboat now, purring its way around the northwest corner of the island. They were closer, the island seemed taller, the dark trees distinct, but O'Rourke seemed to be putting most of his energy into not letting the current sweep them west into the dock. The oars sounded very loud as they bit at the water. If the patrol boat came around now, they would be directly in its path. Thirty seconds, hissed Lucian. O'Rourke put his head down and pulled. The heavy rowboat, all the heavier with its passengers and increasing load of water, plowed through rough waves. The current here was very strong. There was enough starlight now for Kate to see the sweat on the priest's neck. Fifteen seconds, said Lucian. They were ten meters from shore. There, whispered Lucian, pointing to what may have been an inlet under the trees. The patrol boat roared around the point a hundred and fifty meters to their left. Its searchlight was on, probing toward the shore. When it passed the dock, Kate caught a glimpse of men with automatic weapons squinting into the searchlight. The beam swept off the shore, ahead of the boat, straight toward them. Chapter 27 O'Rourke grunted as they glided under branches that grasped at Kate like bony hands. Then the bow was scraping rock with a noise that Kate was sure could be heard all the way across the island. Lucian ducked forward, O'Rourke tried to mute his gasps, and Kate grabbed onto roots and kept them from sliding back out into the current as the speedboat pounded its way past not ten yards from them. Her heartbeat drowned even O'Rourke's panting until the patrol boat passed around the east point again. There was a soggy rope in the space under the bow. Water lapped halfway up Kate's calves. Lucian went over the side, scrambled up the bank, tied the bowline around a stump, and motioned them up. Kate could hear O'Rourke sliding on dead leaves behind her as he grabbed for roots and rocks. Fifteen feet up the bank and they were in a line of trees bounding a wide, grassy area. There was a snick 
near Kate's ear, and she could just make out a knife in Lucian's hand as he gouged bark from an evergreen tree. Marking where the boat is, she thought. She was glad that someone was thinking. They huddled at the edge of the tree line. The chapel, whispered Lucian, and Kate squinted west. Three spires rose above bare limbs. A line of torches flickered as more dark shapes followed an unseen path from the dock to the half-hidden church. Kate could hear voices now, male voices chanting something which was not quite Gregorian. The wind rose around them, rustling pine branches and setting Kate to shivering. Lucian leaned closer. Kate thought she could see the pistol in his hand again. It's the beginning of the investiture ceremony, came his whisper. I should have known it would be at the chapel at Shnagov Monastery. The chanting seemed louder now. It's the chapel where Vlad Dracula's headless body was buried in 1476, whispered Lucian. They excavated his tomb in 1932, but the grave was empty, empty except for chewed animal bones. Lucian turned and moved toward the chapel and torches in a silent, crouching run. Kate hesitated only a second, touching O'Rourke's shoulder to make sure the priest was there, and then she followed. The chapel was lit by torchlight, with more torches lining the walkway from the dock. A second large boat had arrived and a steady stream of dark-robed figures filed from the tiny pier to the church. Lucian led the way along the edge of a grassy area the size of a football field. Once he paused for breath and whispered to Kate and O'Rourke. This was all inner courtyard and fortifications in Vlad Zepish's day. Kate felt bricks or stones underfoot set flush with the sod. They almost walked into the guard. Lucian was leading the way under dripping trees. Kate had one hand on the back of his shirt and her other hand on O'Rourke's shoulder in the darkness, when suddenly a match flared twenty feet in front of them. Kate had the briefest of glimpses of a man's face in the match glow, a face under a black ski mask hood. Tom. Julia. Lucian froze in place while Kate and O'Rourke stopped in mid-step. Kate breathed through her mouth and watched the ember glow of the cigarette. After a long minute her heartbeat slowed. Evidently the shuffle of feet and low chanting from the line of cowled figures on the other side of the chapel had masked any noise. This way whispered Lucian, and led them to the right, past an ancient well with its steep-roofed shelter, between what felt like rose bushes, and into a row of low trees. Kate could see another sentry near the corner of the chapel fifteen yards away. Torchlight made little impression on his black hood, black sweater, and the matte black of the automatic weapon cradled in his arm. They continued right, away from the chapel, crossed a low wire fence, and then Lucian led them to their left through an orchard. Dark buildings, two peasant-style farmhouses and a low brick barn, loomed to their right. The current monastery, whispered Lucian. They will not show a light or come out when the Strigoi are here. They circled the chapel, keeping the torches in sight, moving around to the southwest end of the island. Stay here while I look around. Lucian moved away through the thick brush. Kate heard O'Rourke shift his bad leg as they crouched there. She just caught the small intake of pained breath. She touched the priest's shoulder. Lucian suddenly was a presence next to her. We can get closer on this side. His whisper was the softest breath in the silence. Kate realized that the chanting had ceased. Torches illuminated the open doors of Shnagov Chapel. The crosses carved there similar to the double cruciform of Lucian's Order of the Dragon Pendant. Near the chapel was a whitewashed cottage, and, ten yards closer to where the three of them hid in a vineyard, an ancient square tower. Lucian slid out of the vineyard and moved across the open space to the tower. Kate heard the soft rasp of a knife on hinges, and the old door became a black portal. Lucian gestured them closer. Kate hugged her knees. I don't know if I can do this, she whispered to the priest. The idea of crossing the open space so near the Strigoi guards terrified her. O'Rourke leaned so close she could feel the scratch of his beard against her cheek. We'll go together, he whispered and took her hand. They moved in a crouch, trying to set their feet only on grass. When they reached the open door, Kate hesitated two beats before stepping into the darkness. O'Rourke closed the door behind them. Lucian was crouched on the lowest step of a steep stairway. There's a window, 
he whispered, his voice almost inaudible. But there are guards just below it. They moved up the stairs slowly, testing for any creaks. The steps were centuries old, but massive and sound. There were no creaks. The tower window was only ten feet above the ground, and it looked out over rows of what appeared to be more rose bushes and another low vineyard. Half a dozen black-garbed sentries stood in the rose garden and along the trellised vines nearer the path, their presence made visible in silhouette against the torch-lit chapel. More torches were visible through the open doors, the male voices audible. "'What are they saying?' whispered Kate. Lucian shook his head. "'It's not Romanian.' O'Rourke leaned closer to the half-open window. Birds rustled above them in the raftered recesses of the tower. It's Latin, he whispered. Kate recognized the cadence of the Latin syllables, but could not make out words. She strained to see through the chapel doors, strained to see the form of an infant in the arms of one of the black forms, but there were only the vague shapes, the occasional Latin syllable, and the frustration at not being able to see better. She clutched Lucian's jacket and pulled him closer until she could whisper directly in his ear. Did you remember binoculars along with your pistol and knife? The young man shook his head. Suddenly, with the abruptness of a church service ending, the chanting and moaning of ritual voices ceased. There was a moment of silence within the chapel and a general stirring among the guards, and then the cloaked figures came out onto the paved area between the church and the whitewashed cottage. Hoods came off, cloaks were removed, Cigarettes were lighted, voices were raised in a more conversational tone, and the effect was startling in its resemblance to the scene outside any American church after a Sunday morning service. Men stood in clumps of three or five. Kate heard no women's voices, so she assumed they were all men, smoking and talking softly. Kate leaned so far out in trying to see and hear that O'Rourke had to pull her back before one of the guards in the rose garden below looked up. The voices were maddeningly indistinct, but she had made out German, Italian, and English amongst the murmur of Romanian. "'Can you understand?' she hissed at Lucian. He shushed her and listened. It was hard to tell the actual size of the gathering, since the dark forms looked much alike as they moved in and out of torchlight, but Kate guessed that there had been almost a hundred people in the chapel or waiting outside along the walkway to the dock. "'There! That's Radu Fortuna!' whispered Lucian, and pointed at one of the men just emerging from the chapel door. Yes, whispered O'Rourke. Kate strained to see, but the torchlight was tricky, the men were moving, and she saw only distant faces in shadow before Lucian pulled her back. Did you hear? she whispered again. Did you understand? Shh! Lucian's finger touched her mouth. Guards were shouting to guards in Romanian. A deep voice barked commands from near the chapel doors. They saw me, was Kate's panic thought. A second later, they've found the boat. We'll never get off the island. Flashlights stabbed on, and one of the guards in the garden below switched on a handheld spotlight much brighter than the flashlight beams. Kate, Lucian, and O'Rourke all flinched back from the window, but in a moment it was apparent that the beams were aimed elsewhere. Kate edged up to the window and looked just as one of the men fired a short burst from his automatic weapon. She flinched away again, but not before seeing a large brown dog running between the trees in the orchard near the monastery huts. They all heard the howl and barking. More shouts in Romanian, some laughter. One by one, the flashlight beams switched off. It took half an hour for the men to file back to their boats and board, for the torches to be extinguished. The guards snuffed and retrieved the last ones along the walkway and then there came the sound of the patrol boats roaring away to escort the ferries. The chapel was dark. Kate sat on the narrow landing with the two men for the better part of an hour before anyone spoke or moved. She imagined the black-garbed guards still lying in ambush in the dark. Finally the resumption of insect sounds, the throb of frogs from the lake's edge, and the sight of the brown dog sniffing along the chapel stones unchallenged gave them courage to tiptoe downstairs, open the heavy door, and retraced their tracks back through the orchard and east. The stars had come out, and Kate caught a glimpse of the knife in Lucian's hand. "'For the dog if he barks,' whispered the medical student, but the dog did not approach them as they scurried around the edge of the old courtyards. The boat was where they had left it. The two men waded in and tipped the boat to let the half-foot of water out. 
Kate was last aboard, untying the line and slipping down rocks onto the bow. Lucian pushed off with one of the oars and edged out slowly from under the tree. The broad lake appeared empty. The great estate on the southwest shore was dark. They did not speak as Lucian rowed them across the lake and into the lagoon. They were silent as the three of them carried the rowboat back to its heap of rowboats, flipped it, and set it softly on the pile of rowboats. There was still no light or sound from the shack in the boatyard. The Dacia looked undisturbed, but Lucian had them wait in the darkness of the trees as he slipped out, approached the car warily, and checked its interior. The two joined him and the old vehicle started without protest. Lucian left the abandoned park area with the car lights out, picking his way along by starlight, finally turning the headlights on as they left the sleeping village of Shnagov. I didn't see Joshua, Kate said, her voice sounding strange and strained even to herself. I didn't see any children. No, said O'Rourke. The priest had slid into the front passenger seat. Kate rode in back. Did you hear any of what they said? She asked Lucian. He drove in silence for another minute. I think I heard someone say something about it being the first night. Good for the first night, I think. First night of what? Kate pressed her cheek against the cold window on her right to help her stay awake. The investiture ceremony, said Lucian. I should have known Shnagov Monastery would have been the site of the first night ceremony. Because it's important to the Strigoi, said O'Rourke. Lucian chewed his lip. His face was very pale in the dim light from the instrument lights. It was one of Vlad Sefish's fortresses. Legend had it that he was buried there. You said that the grave was empty, said Kate. Yes, but they found a headless corpse in another tomb in the chapel, set near the doorway rather than next to the altar where one would expect royalty to have been buried. He slowed the car at the intersection to the main highway and turned left toward Bucharest. Archaeologists think that it may have been a little joke the monks pulled, moving his corpse. O'Rourke scratched his beard. Or a deliberate act. They may have considered his burial so close to the altar a sacrilege. Lucian nodded. If it was Vlad Dracula, the order maintains that the prince had one of his servants decapitated and buried in royal robes, even wearing one of the rings of the dragon, in order to throw off his enemies. Kate was close to losing her temper. It doesn't really matter who was buried there five centuries ago, does it? What matters is what they were doing there tonight, and what it has to do with Joshua. They passed Otapin Airport and saw the reflected lights of Bucharest ahead. It was clouding up again. Only trucks were on the highway. If it is the investiture ceremony, said Lucian, as if thinking aloud, and if Joshua is the chosen one, then there will be several more nights of Strigoi ceremony before he receives the sacrament of human blood. He rubbed his cheek. Or so go the legends. Kate's voice was hard. And do your legends tell you where the ceremonies are held? Shnagov again? No, said Lucian. But I don't think there'll be anything else at the monastery. Perhaps places important to the Strigoi family, important to the legend of Vlad Zepish. I don't know. Kate lay back on the dusty cushions. This is nuts. She pounded her fists against the door. My baby has been kidnapped and I'm out playing Indiana Jones. Lucian made a noise. It wasn't as interesting as Indiana Jones, he said. I couldn't see anything clearly. If there was a human sacrifice, I missed it. He realized what he had said and bit his lip. No one stopped them as they took back streets to their abandoned tenement and basement apartment. Lucian parked in an alley a block from the building and they let themselves in with more exhaustion than precaution. No one was waiting in the cold darkness. What next? asked O'Rourke. Do we stake out Radu Fortuna's place again in the daylight? He glanced at his watch. It's almost daylight now. Lucian seemed to sag onto the cushions of the couch. I don't know. I can't think. Stay here tonight, said Kate. I think we should stay together. There are two mattresses on the little bed in there. We'll drag one out for you. Lucian could only nod. Let's sleep, she said. We're all stupid with fatigue. We'll talk about things later. She realized that she needed solitude as much as sleep, that the idea of being alone, even in the freezing, dank basement room, 
was an almost physical necessity for her now. They dragged out Lucian's mattress, there was a small domestic moment of finding an extra blanket, and then Kate was alone, the door locked. She slipped out of her grimy clothes, pulled flannel pajamas from her one bag, and crawled under the covers. She was shaking, more from the after-effects of the long night than from the cold, but sleep settled on her like vertigo. Suddenly she slammed awake and ran to the door, unlocking it with clumsy fingers. Lucian's flashlight beam caught her in the eyes, and she waved it away, seeing the two men's startled faces even as she began to explain. I've been thinking all along that I'm going after Joshua as much for medical reasons as for personal ones. Do you understand? We had extracted and cloned the retrovirus at CDC. I told you that. Chandra was beginning to understand the mechanism, I think, but more importantly, her team was doing trials on the virus's effect on cultured samples. Cancer, HIV. Newman, said O'Rourke, can we talk about this later? No, said Kate. Listen, it's important. I mean, the retrovirus has incredible immunological and oncological implications. But I've been fixated on finding Joshua, in retrieving the sample of Joshua's blood. Lucian was nodding. I see. But you realize that any of the Strigoi would do. Those men we saw tonight? No! Kate lowered her voice. The body, the thing you have in the vat at the medical school. His blood has the pure J-virus. I was so stupid, so obsessed with Joshua. Lucian was staring, rubbing his eyes. I had no idea you could apply the Strigoi virus for immunoreconstruction. He stood up, naked, and began struggling into his jeans. Kate set her hands on his shoulders and pushed him back onto the mattress, noting idly that his body was muscled in the way she liked men's bodies, a swimmer's or runner's physique. Later today, she said, we'll get redundant samples, assay them to make sure that there is no contamination, and then get them to CDC Boulder. I'll include instructions so Ken Mauberly will know exactly what to do with the new team. How? began the priest. Your job will be to get the sample and my note to the U.S. Embassy she said. One of your Franciscan priest buddies, in Mufti, perhaps. I'm sure the Strigoi are watching for us to appear at the embassy. Yes, said Lucian, that is certain. But all we have to do is get the sample in, continued Kate. She pointed at O'Rourke. You invoke Senator Harlan's name in a note, or do whatever political magic you can, and the sample will be in a diplomatic pouch headed stateside by tonight. The priest rubbed his beard. It might work. It will work, said Kate. She was so tired that she sagged against the door frame. I didn't need Joshua's blood after all. But that doesn't make any difference in your going after him, does it, Kate? said O'Rourke. She blinked at him. No, no difference at all. O'Rourke pulled his blanket up. Then we might as well get a couple of hours sleep before we cure AIDS and cancer. It promises to be another long day. Chapter 28 It was all on fire. Lucian stopped the Dacia half a block from the medical school, and he and Kate watched as the ancient fire trucks drove up over the curb or blocked the street, while firemen ran hose to a single hydrant and shouted at each other through the fence surrounding the university. Smoke climbed in thick columns through the brisk morning air. Kate could see flames in the shattered medical school windows, the orange glow mirroring the reflected sunrise in the office building windows on the west side of the street. Stay here, said Lucian, and walked toward the barricade of fire trucks and official vehicles. Despite the early hour, a small crowd had gathered. Kate stepped out of the Dacia and leaned dejectedly against the car door. She had wakened after only two hours sleep to find Lucian still asleep in the outer room and O'Rourke gone. There had been no note. She and Lucian had shared a cold breakfast, waited another twenty minutes for the priest, and then left a note saying only, gone to get the sample. Kate had thrown her single large carry-on bag in the back of the Dacia, leaving only her toothbrush at the basement apartment. Another fire truck roared by as Lucian walked back to the car. The fire started in the basement, he said. The morgue and medical labs are gone. He settled behind the wheel, and Kate dropped into the passenger seat. The column of smoke was thicker now. Could it have been an accident? she asked. Lucian tapped the wheel. We have to assume it's not. 
The Strigoi must have traced me to the school and found their man. I doubt if they went to the trouble of removing him before they set the fire. Kate shuddered at the thought of the thing in the tank writhing while flames filled the basement. What do we do? she said. Lucian started the Dacia and drove back to the area of narrow streets west of Chichmiju Gardens. He had pulled to a stop opposite their building when Kate said, Keep moving. Lucian put the Dacia in gear and drove slowly down the street. What? he said without turning his head. The shade was down in my basement window when we left, she said. It's up now. Perhaps Father O'Rourke, began Lucian, and then said, Shit! He was looking at the rearview mirror. There's a car following us. It was parked in the alley near the corner. Kate resisted the urge to look back. It's a black Mercedes, whispered Lucian. The Securitate like to use them. They can't be very inconspicuous tailing people in a Mercedes, said Kate, keeping her voice light. Her heart was pounding and she felt a little sick. The Securitate don't need to be inconspicuous, said Lucian. He had turned right onto Strada Stirbe Voda and now had to wait as a streetcar lumbered out of a narrow side street and took on passengers. Traffic coming the other way on the narrow brick street kept him from passing. Damn, he whispered. There is another one. Now Kate did turn and look. There were two Mercedes sedans behind the horse and wagon immediately behind them. The streetcar finally moved on and Lucian kept the Dacia close behind it, waiting for an opportunity to pass. I think there's one ahead of us, he said, his voice absolutely flat. Yes, a black Mercedes in front of the trolley. Four men in it, just like the cars behind us. Kate tried to quell a rising panic in her breast. Isn't it good that it's Securitate, she said, not Strigoi? Lucian chewed his lip. These Securitate probably are Strigoi, or they work for them. He glanced at side streets but did not turn. The wagon had turned off behind them and the Mercedes were close enough now that Kate could see the cigarettes of the men in the front seat. How did they find us? whispered Kate. She was clutching her travel bag, thinking of the vials of serum in it to have come so far for nothing. Lucian's voice was hard with tension. Your priest, maybe? Perhaps he ratted on us when we were close to sending the blood sample to the embassy. Maybe he's been Securitate all along. No, said Kate, but her mind whirled with dark possibilities. Where are you, O'Rourke? Can we get away? she said. Lucian had chewed his lip until it was bloody. They've probably got the city sealed he said, glancing in his mirror. Suddenly the streetcar rumbled into a side street and their Dacia was part of a convoy of black sedans. There were now two in front as well as the two immediately behind them. They'll stop us in a minute, said Lucian. Somewhere they can shoot if they have to. Not that they wouldn't shoot in a crowd. He quit chewing his lip and stared at nothing for a moment. A crowd, he whispered. There was an anti-government rally this morning. He grinned almost demonically. Hang on, Kate. They were just coming up to Calia Victoria when Lucian spun the wheel hard right and accelerated into the wide Piazza Gheorghedej opposite the bullet-riddled art museum and the hall of the Palace of the Socialist Republic of Romania. Striped barricades blocked off the major part of the plaza, but Lucian accelerated again and smashed through the wooden barriers. Kate looked behind them in time to see all four Mercedes swing right bounce across curbs and come rushing after them. Pedestrians on Calia Victoria leaped aside. Kate turned to see the rally ahead of them, perhaps three hundred people with as many police surrounding them. Trucks full of miners in overalls glowered at both police and protesters. Various flags and posters flew above the peaceful congregation, but the assemblage parted with shouts and screams as Lucian drove straight into the fringes of the crowd, steering wildly to avoid hitting people. Police whistles shrilled as Lucian drove the Dacia in a half-circle, wheeling deeper into the confused mass of protesters and grey-coated police. Out! he shouted, opening his own door while the car was still moving. He had grabbed a heavy textbook from the seat and now dropped it onto the accelerator before rolling out the door. Kate clutched her purse and bag and jumped out the passenger side, hitting the bricks hard and losing her footing. She rolled and tumbled into the backs of people's legs, and at least one man and a woman went down with her. 
More people screamed as the Dacia cut its slow path through the crowd and the Mercedes screeched to a halt just beyond the fringes of the mob. Getting shakily to her feet, Kate threw the strap of her duffel bag over her shoulder, checked to make sure she had her purse, and looked down at herself. Her coat was dusty and one knee was bleeding beneath her black polyester pants, but her clothes were not torn. Lucian had bought her local clothes upon arrival so that she could go out without attracting undue attention. Lucian. She moved with the crowd now, craning to see him, but the crowd was ebbing back and forth like a single panicked organism. The Dacia had gone up over the curb and rolled to a stop near the bullet-scarred Athene Palace Hotel, and the Mercedes were moving through the plaza now like black sharks cruising among swimmers. But the source of the screams was behind her, and Kate wheeled to see the gray overalled miners leaping down from their trucks and wading into the protesters with clubs and metal pipes. Kate saw flags dip and fall as the people dropped them and fled, then watched as a woman carrying a small child was clubbed by two miners. She could not see Lucian anywhere. Police were blowing whistles, soldiers had appeared from nowhere and were leaping from trucks, but they ignored the miners and the miners ignored them as the brutality and panic spread across the plaza. Kate ran wildly with two women in black and a professional-looking man with gray hair. Two young men with long hair joined them in their mad dash for the shelter of Collier Victoria and the hotels there, but shots suddenly rang out and one of the young men fell as if tripped by a wire. Kate paused, started back for him, thinking of the few medical supplies in her bag, but then glanced back at the rushing police and miners crossing the plaza toward her and looked at the bloody mass that had been the back of the college student's head. She turned and ran with the screaming crowd again. There were more police cars coming down Collier Victoria, their sirens dopplering up and down the scale, lights flashing. Kate turned down Stierbe Voda and ran back the way she and Lucian had driven. Some of the people along the street here were pressing toward the plaza, but others were fleeing as they saw the miners out of control. Kate glanced back and saw one of the big men in gray overalls charging down the street toward an older woman trying to move quickly just behind Kate. The woman still clutched a placard to her chest that read Freedom in both English and Romanian. Kate knew that the miners were often securitate agents whom the new government used to terrorize the opposition, just as Ceausescu had and many of the miners were actually miners, brutal thugs who still towed the communist and neo-fascist party lines and were brought into the city as shock troops. They obviously enjoyed their work. The miner rushing behind Kate grasped the older woman by the collar, threw her up against an iron fence, and began beating her with a thick wooden dowel. The woman screamed. Kate paused, knew that it was insanity to intervene, and then crouched between two parked cars to fumble in her big bag, Frightened pedestrians rushed past on the sidewalk and street, but no one stopped to help the woman being beaten. She had slumped against the fence now, but the miner had set his legs wide and was methodically clubbing her to the pavement. Kate removed two disposable syringes of Demerol from her med kit, tossed away the wrappings, walked straight to the miner and plunged both needles into the back of the man's broad neck. She stepped back as the miner cursed, staggered back from the bleeding woman, and turned a shocked and infuriated face in Kate's direction. He spat and shouted something at her, raising the club. Kate was wearing thick-soled peasant shoes that Lucian had bought her. They were as heavy as combat boots. Kate balanced on her left leg and kicked the miner in the balls with the same full follow-through that Tom had taught her in their touch football games in Boulder. She imagined a kick that would have to clear the crossbar from thirty yards out and put that much energy into it. The big miner made no noise at all as he went down and curled up on the pavement. He did not get up. There were more screams and police whistles from up the street toward the plaza. More miners were chasing down fleeing protesters, and one of the black Mercedes was trying to force its way through stalled traffic on Stierbe Voda. Kate knelt by the bleeding woman and helped lift her to her feet. It looked as if the woman's nose was broken and there were teeth missing between pulped lips. Suddenly, a man crossed the street and put his arm around the woman, speaking to her in encouraging tones. He was obviously a spouse or relative. Where were you when we needed you? Kate thought at the man and then left them, retrieving her bag and heading down the street in a fast walk. When she glanced behind her, she saw the Mercedes only half a block away, police flashers behind it. 
Suddenly, to her left, there was an opening in the iron fence, and she pushed in through curious onlookers, went down stone steps, and realized where she was. Chishmiju Gardens. The same entrance O'Rourke had brought her to that May day so many eternities ago. Kate moved deeper into the gardens, taking the narrower sidewalks and less traveled lanes. From the streets beyond there came the sound of sirens, receding screams, and at least one more shot. Kate realized that her leg was bleeding more seriously than she had thought. She found a stone bench set behind a hedge and away from the walks, and used the last of her Kleenex to clean the wound as well as possible. Her skin was gashed from her knee to just above her ankle. Kate used a cotton handkerchief and a Tampax from her duffel bag as an improvised field dressing. The bleeding contained for the moment, she sat there, aching and disoriented. A cold wind came up and sent leaves spiraling down around her. The flower beds were unkempt, the flowers lifeless after heavy frosts. Heavy footfalls echoed from the main sidewalk just beyond a thick hedge. Kate began to weep then, unable to hold the burning down in her throat any longer. She lowered her face into her hands and just wept. Kate did not know how long she sat there crying. It might have been a few minutes or half an hour, but she was suddenly aware that it was raining. Hurried footsteps sounded again on the unseen sidewalk as searchers or park-goers ran for cover. Kate simply sat there and lifted her face to the cold rain. Leaves dropped around her like wet paper as the rain turned to sleet. She lowered her face and let the icy pellets pound her head and shoulders. Kate realized that she was laughing softly. As the sudden icy rain let up, she raised her face again to the gray sky and said softly, Do your worst, you bitch. Misfortune had always been a female entity to Kate, but then so had the idea of God. The sleet stopped at the same time as Kate's laughter. She shivered, her cheap coat was soaked through, but ignored the cold as she focused the problem-solving part of her mind on the situation. The tears had helped, emptying her, calming her, and she approached the situation as if it were a difficult piece of hematological diagnosis. She was an illegal alien in a hostile country where almost unimaginable resources were arrayed against her, and the chances of finding Joshua had dwindled almost to zero. Even if she found the child, she had been able to put together no plan except to run with him for the border or the American embassy. Meanwhile, she was separated from both of her friends in the country, an American priest and a Romanian medical student, and sure of neither as a true friend. What if O'Rourke did tip the Securitate and the Strigoi? What if Lucian were the Strigoi equivalent of a double agent, setting her up to be used and then discarded? Kate shook her head. She did not have enough data to assess either man's loyalty, although O'Rourke's disappearance just before the fire that destroyed their J-virus source seemed incriminating. It was all a moot point unless she could join forces with one or both of them again. Do I really want to see them again? Yes, she realized. Not just because she was cold, wet, scared, and unable to speak Romanian, but because she had complex feelings for each of them. Deal with that later. What's the next step? It seemed that if the Strigoi were actually on their tail to the point of staking out the apartment and burning the medical school lab, then there was no way that she could follow Radu Fortuna again. Security would be heightened. Whatever part of the Strigoi investiture ceremony that was going on tonight would go on without her. Where to find Lucian or O'Rourke? All of the places she could think of to re-establish contact with Lucian would also be obvious to the Strigoi. The medical school, District Hospital 1, his or his parents' old apartments. Kate shook her head. O'Rourke, we never talked about a meeting place other than the basement apartment, but where? Not the Franciscan Center here in Bucharest. O'Rourke said that it is watched by the government as a matter of course. He always calls his contacts there and arranges a meeting through some kind of code. Where, then? Kate sat in silence for another twenty seconds, then rose and walked briskly toward the far end of the park, avoiding groups of people, shielding her face when she passed others hurrying for cover. O'Rourke was sitting on the park bench near the lagoon where they had sat and talked in May. He was alone, his heavy wool coat collar turned up, 
but he glanced up when she stopped near the children's playground and his smile was visible from thirty feet away. I was up before dawn and off to meet the head of the Franciscan monastery in Bucharest, said O'Rourke. I said I'd meet you at the medical school at nine. Didn't you see my note? No, said Kate. There was no note. They were crossing the bridge over the narrow channel between park lagoons. I left one, said O'Rourke. Maybe Lucian picked it up and didn't tell you about it. Why would he do that? The priest made a gesture with his hands. I don't know. But then there's a lot we don't know about Lucian, isn't there? And about you, thought Kate, but said nothing. Anyway, I made the arrangement with Father Stoicescu to deliver the J-Virus sample to the American Embassy later this morning. But when I got to the medical school, there were the police and firemen. I called Stoicescu and canceled the meeting, then went back to the apartment, but the police were there. I could see men going into the building, and there were expensive automobiles up and down the street. The Securitate drive Mercedes, said Kate, and explained about the insanity of the last hours. O'Rourke shook his head. I couldn't think of what to do except come to the park and hope you would think of it as a rendezvous point. I almost didn't, said Kate. They had reached one of the west entrances to the park. Kate hesitated and pulled back into the trees. It's not safe out there. The priest glanced toward the street. I know. If the Securitate know where we were staying, then the Strigoi must know that we're in the country, and why. How? said Kate. Her hands folded into fists. O'Rourke shrugged. Possibly Lucian. Maybe the gypsies talked. Maybe some other loose end. Your phone calls to the Franciscans? said Kate. I doubt that. We speak in Latin, never use real names, and arrange the meetings through an old code we developed when I was working with the orphanages here. He scratched his beard. But it's always possible. And really doesn't matter now, said Kate. I just don't see what we can do next. If Lucian was captured... Did you see him captured? No, but... If he was arrested by the police or Securitate, there's nothing we can do, said O'Rourke. And if he escaped, which is likely, then he has an infinitely better chance than we do in Bucharest. It's his city. And there's his alleged Order of the Dragon. Don't make fun of it, said Kate. I'm not. Footsteps were approaching behind a hedge, and O'Rourke pulled Kate farther back among the dripping trees. Two men in workers' clothes walked past quickly without glancing beyond the hedge. I'm not making fun of it, but I don't think it's a very efficient organization. It couldn't even tell Lucian where the next night of the investiture ceremony is going to be held. Kate held back her anger. Well, we didn't do any better. I did, said O'Rourke. Come on. He took Kate's arm and led her out through the gate and along the street to a parked motorcycle covered with a plastic tarp. The motorcycle had a sidecar and looked ancient to Kate, like something out of an old World War II movie. O'Rourke tugged off the plastic, folded it, and tucked it under the low seat of the sidecar. Get in. Kate had never ridden in a sidecar, had only ridden on a motorcycle a few times with Tom, and found that it was a trick to fold oneself into the small space. The windscreen was chipped and discolored with age, the leather seat cracked and taped in a hundred places. When she had finally folded her legs well enough to fit in the egg-shaped pod, O'Rourke handed her a blanket and pair of goggles. Put these on. Kate adjusted the goggles, imagining how she looked with her soaked peasant coat and scarf and these absurd things. Even the goggles were semi-opaque with age. Where did you get all this? she asked. The priest was adjusting his own goggles and a leather flying helmet that made Kate want to giggle. Father Stoicescu had offered this the other day, he said. One of the visiting fathers had purchased this while he was here and left it in a garage near the university. I didn't see a need for it until today. He turned a key, fiddled with a fuel valve on the side of the ancient machine, and leaped up to come down on a pedal. Nothing happened. Are you sure you know how to drive this thing? Kate felt exposed and ridiculous sitting along the curb in the sidecar. She expected the Securitate Mercedes to arrive any second. I used to have one before I went to Nam, muttered O'Rourke, fiddling with another lever on the side. He stood again, rose, dropped his weight on the pedal. Again, nothing. Shit on a stick, grumbled the priest. 
Kate raised an eyebrow but decided to say nothing. O'Rourke tried again and was rewarded with a few pops from the cylinder, a backfire, and silence. Damn cheap gas, he said and fiddled with something above the engine. Did you say that you knew where the ceremony was tonight? Kate said softly. It had begun to rain again and there were no pedestrians or traffic at the moment, but she still felt the urge to whisper. O'Rourke paused in his fiddling to lean over and pull a map out of an elastic compartment on the inside of the sidecar. Look, he said. Kate noticed it was a Cummerley and Fry road map, scale one to one million, and then she unfolded it, realized that half of it was of Bulgaria, folded it to have central Romania revealed, and saw the red pencil around several cities. Brashov, Tirgovishta, Sigishwara, and Sibiu, she said. They're all circled. Which one is it, and why? O'Rourke tried the pedal again, and the machine roared to life. He revved the throttle a few times until it was running smoothly, then throttled back and leaned her way. His finger stabbed down on Tirgovishta, a city about fifty miles northwest of Bucharest. These are all cities of special importance to the Strigoi family, he said. I think they'll be the sites for the next four nights of the ceremony. How do you know? O'Rourke glanced over his shoulder and pulled out into the street with a roar and a cloud of exhaust fumes. Kate hung onto the edge of the sidecar with her free hand. She found the sensation of riding in the low pod singularly unpleasant. How do you know? She repeated in a shout. Let me explain later, he yelled back. He turned into traffic on Boulevard du Gheorghe Gheorghedej, then turned north again on Boulevard du Nikolai Balcescu through the center of town. Just tell me how you know that Tirgovishta is the place for tonight's ceremony, demanded Kate, leaning closer to him as they paused for a red light just past the Intercontinental Hotel. O'Rourke rubbed his cheek. Kate thought that he looked very little like a priest with his beard, helmet, and goggles. Father Stoicescu mentioned the Tirgovishta monastery I visited two days ago, he said. The light changed and they moved ahead with the thin traffic. It was still drizzling. There's no phone contact with them. So? Kate did not have to shout as long as they were moving this slowly. They were arrested, he said. Securitate just rounded them up. After all these centuries of being tolerated by the authorities, the monastery was suddenly cleaned out. One of the monks was out shopping for groceries in the marketplace, returned just in time to see his fellow monks loaded aboard police vans, and managed to get into Bucharest to inform the Franciscan headquarters here. I don't understand, shouted Kate. They had passed the Triumphal Arch in the north part of town and were headed past Harrisstrau Park on Chisawa Kiselev. To their right she could see only bare chestnut trees and brown grass. There were no black Mercedes behind them. The Franciscans know of the Strigoi, O'Rourke shouted back. The Tirgovishta Monastery has monitored the Strigoi family for centuries. If the Securitate is rounding up the priests, even for a short detention, it may be because there's something happening in Tirgovishta tonight that they don't want us to know about. Kate said nothing but felt little confidence in this analysis. What about Lucian? She shouted over the engine roar. She noticed that they had changed from the Kiselev row to the one labeled Kitilai. O'Rourke leaned her way without taking his eyes off the road and traffic ahead. If he's free and if his order of the dragon is real, or even if it's not, the best bet on our meeting up is being at the next site for the ceremony. Kate used her hand to rub her goggles free of a film of muddy water. She could imagine what her face looked like. Again, the logic left something to be desired, but she had no better suggestion. They had just passed the last row of Stalinist apartments and the ring roads at the edge of the city when the motorcycle engine pitch dropped and O'Rourke began to break. Kate saw the cars backed up ahead a moment after she saw the signs pointing straight ahead to Petesti and Tirgovishta. Accident, she said. Police flashers were visible a block ahead. O'Rourke stood on the pedals. Shit, he whispered to himself. Then, sorry. What is it? A roadblock. Police seemed to be inspecting papers. Kate looked behind her and saw the traffic backing up there as well. Three cars back, there was a black Mercedes with four dark figures in it. Chapter 29 
The police ahead, not content to wait until the traffic reached their roadblock, were moving down the line of cars, peering in windows and demanding papers. O'Rourke revved the motorcycle and began turning around on the narrow stretch of road. Kate tugged at his sleeve. I see the Mercedes, he said, the loose strap of his flying helmet flapping. We'll just have to risk it. Kate used both hands to clutch the rim of the sidecar, lowered her head so that little more than her scarf and goggles were visible, and peered to her left as they roared back the way they had come. The four men in the Mercedes did not glance up as they passed. Looking back, Kate could see the Mercedes sweep out of line and drive on the left side of the road to the barricades. The police saluted and let it through. Other cars and a few motorcycles were turning back from the roadblock. A work pulled over when they were in the fringe of the city again, parking near some workers' apartments. Kate studied the grim, Stalinist buildings, each with its complement of empty shops on the ground floor, while the priest studied the map. She shifted her legs in the tight pod and turned back to him. What next? Maybe take the main road to Bateshti, he said. Take East Seventy to this village, Bateshti, south of Gyeshti, and then follow 72 north to Tirgovishta. What if they have East 70 blocked? asked Kate. O'Rourke tucked the map back in its elastic slot. We'll deal with that when it happens. East 70 was blocked. The line ran back almost two miles. The priest understood enough Romanian to decipher the grumbles of truck drivers walking back to their rigs. The police were examining papers at the point the street left the city and became a four-lane highway to Pateshti. O'Rourke turned the motorcycle around and drove back into the city. It was already early afternoon and Kate's stomach was growling. She had eaten no real breakfast and she could remember only a few spoonfuls of soup the night before. There were bread shops along this main street of Boulevard Uapache, but they were empty and had been since 7 a.m. Aggressive streetcars, ignoring other traffic, made O'Rourke swerve across uneven brick and cracked asphalt and Kate thought that the sidecar was going to flip over more than once. She saw a trucker's restaurant open near the railroad tracks and pointed it out to the priest. Once in the parking lot, with the motorcycle engine quieted, O'Rourke took off his flying helmet and rubbed a sweaty forehead. Do we dare go in? asked Kate. If you're as hungry as I am, you'll dare, said O'Rourke. They left their goggles and his helmet in the sidecar and went inside. The space was cavernous, cold, and filled with smoke from a hundred cigarettes. Waiters hurried from table to table, carrying large bottles of beer. Each trucker had half a dozen empty beer bottles in front of him and seemed intent upon ordering half a dozen more. Why so many at once? whispered Kate as they found a table near the kitchen. O'Rourke smiled. Kate noticed for the first time that he had removed his Roman collar and was wearing just a dark shirt and pants under the heavy wool coat. They're afraid the place will run out of beer, he said, and they will before dinner time. He tried to wave down a waiter, but the men in dark vests and grimy white shirts ignored him. Finally, the priest stood and planted himself in front of one of the hurrying men. Dotsine supa, Varog, said O'Rourke. Kate's stomach rumbled at the thought of a large bowl of soup. The waiter shook his head. Nu. He snapped off an angry string of syllables, obviously expecting O'Rourke to move aside. He did not. Mitite? Brinza? Chirnazi? asked the priest. As nervous as Kate was, her mouth watered at the thought of sausage and cheese. Nu! the waiter glared at them. American? Kate stood and took a twenty-dollar bill from her purse. Ni putetsi servi ma rapid, varoj, ni grabim. The waiter reached for the bill. Kate folded it back between her fingers. When we get the food, she said. Mitite, brinza, salam, pastrama. The waiter glared again but disappeared into the kitchen. O'Rourke and Kate stood until he returned. Truck drivers stared at them. Nothing like being inconspicuous, whispered the priest. Kate sighed. Would you rather we start? The waiter returned with a less surly manner in a greasy white bag. Kate looked in, saw the wrapped sausages, stuffed eggs, and slices of salami. 
He reached for the twenty dollars again, but Kate held up one finger. Batura, she said. Something to drink? The waiter looked pained. Nishte apa, said Kate. Apa minerala. The waiter nodded tiredly and looked at O'Rourke. Beer, said the priest. The waiter returned a minute later with two large bottles of mineral water and three bottles of beer. He obviously wanted the transaction to be over. O'Rourke took the bottles. The waiter took the twenty-dollar bill. The truckers resumed their conversations. Outside it was drizzling again. Kate stuffed the food and bottles under the cowl of the sidecar. O'Rourke was out on the street and headed east in a minute. I don't know what to do except head back into town, he shouted. Kate was watching the trolley and train tracks that ran parallel to the road here. There were graveled ruts running alongside them. The tracks run west here, she shouted and pointed. O'Rourke understood immediately. He wheeled the motorcycle in front of an oncoming streetcar, bounced across a curb, pounded across a littered field, and swerved onto the graveled track. In a minute they were echoing between the backs of Stalinist department buildings. The priest tried to avoid the broken bottles and jagged bits of metal along the track. Near the edge of town the graveled path turned to mud and then died out altogether. Hang on, shouted O'Rourke, and jerked the motorcycle up onto a crossing, then down onto the railroad ties. Kate's sidecar hung over the rail. They bounced along for three or four miles, Kate sure every inch of the way that her fillings were going to vibrate out. She could not imagine how O'Rourke could see. Her own vision was a vibrating triple image dulled by the goggles and drizzle. What if a train comes? she shouted as they passed the last of the outlying peasant homes. Only a few old men in their gardens had looked up. We die! O'Rourke shouted back. Five miles out of the city and at least three miles beyond the roadblock, they stopped at a junction with a muddy dirt road that led north and south. Ahead of them, around a thick copse of trees, a train's whistle seemed very loud. Guess we get off here, said O'Rourke, and swung north on the road. The track was muddy, and Kate had to get out and push twice before they reached a junction with Highway East 70, running northwest like an abandoned and unpatched interstate. It seemed like a century since O'Rourke had driven her to Peteshti along this road to see the baby buying in action last May. There were no police cars on the westbound lane. They saw no black Mercedes when they switched to a narrow and bumpy Highway 72 beyond the large village of Gayeshti. The sign said, Kirga Vishta, 30 kilometers. No longer speaking above the engine roar, Kate's head throbbing from the beating along the railroad tracks, they drove north toward the mountains and the gathering dark. They stopped to eat along the Dimbovitsa River, less than ten kilometers from Tirgavishta. Highway 72 was narrow, winding, and unencumbered by villages larger than a few modest homes tucked next to the road. O'Rourke parked the motorcycle deep under the trees near the slow-moving river. The cheese was sharp, the sausage old, and the ua umplutsi, the stuffed eggs, stuffed with something neither of them recognized. The meal was one of the most delicious Kate could ever remember, and she drank straight from the mineral water bottle to wash it down. The rain had stopped, and although the sun showed no sign of coming out, it seemed warmer than it had been in days. Kate found bits of her clothing that were actually dry. Your Romanian seems to have worked back at the restaurant, said O'Rourke. He seemed to be savoring the beer. Kate licked her fingers. Basic survival tactics last spring. Not all my meals were at the hospital restaurant. She paused before attacking her last bit of stuffed egg. I hope those truckers were at the end of their haul rather than the beginning. O'Rourke nodded. The beer, you mean? Yes. Well, driving sober is a rarity in this country. He glanced at his own almost empty bottle. I guess I'll stop with one. Kate took off her scarf. You said shit twice today, and now you're swilling beer. Hardly the behavior of a proper priest. Instead of laughing, O'Rourke looked out at the river. His eyes were a lustrous gray, and in that second Kate caught a glimpse of the handsome boy in the tired and bearded face of the man. It's been a long time, he said, since I was a proper priest. Kate hesitated, embarrassed. If the Romanian trip hadn't come up two years ago, 
putting me in touch with the orphan problem here, he went on. I would have resigned then. He took another drink. That sounds funny, Kate said. The word resigned, I mean. One doesn't think of priests resigning. O'Rourke nodded slightly, but kept his eyes on the river. Why would you leave the priesthood? Kate said very softly. There was no traffic on the road, and the river made little noise. O'Rourke spread his fingers, and Kate realized how large and strong his hands looked. The usual reason, he said. Inability to suspend one's disbelief. He lifted a stick and drew geometric shapes in the soft loam. But you said once that you believed, began Kate. In evil, finished the priest. But that hardly qualifies me to be a priest, to administer sacraments, to act as a sort of half-assed intermediary between people who believe much more than I and God, if there is a God. He tossed the stick into the river and both of them watched it whirl out of sight in the steady current. Kate licked her lips. O'Rourke, why are you here? Why did you come with me? He looked at her then and his gray eyes seemed very clear and very honest. You asked me to, he said. Chigavista was a town of about 50,000 people set in the valley of another river, the Yalamitsa, and beyond it Kate could see the foothills of the Carpathians rising into cloud. At first glance, Tirgavishta was as polluted and industrial as the oil town Pateshti, but then they rumbled through the busy outskirts and found themselves in the old center of the pre-medieval city. That's the old palace, said O'Rourke, taking his right hand off the throttle to point at ruins beyond a six-foot wall. It was founded by Mircha, the old, back in the late 1300s, but Vlad the Impaler burned it down in a battle with the Turks in 1462, just before he lost power, I think. Kate wiped mud from her goggles. That's the Chindia Tower, said O'Rourke, pointing to a circular stone tower visible above the compound wall. Old Vlad built it as a watchtower and as an observation post to watch the tortures he held in the courtyard below. The new building just outside the wall there is the museum. O'Rourke pulled the motorcycle into a side street, but signs on the door proclaimed the museum closed. Too bad, said the priest. I know the assistant curator there. He's an officious little prick, quite loyal to Ceausescu, but he knows an awful lot about Trigovista's history. Kate shifted her weight in the sidecar. Her feet were almost asleep. Two shits and a little prick, she said. Your debits are adding up, father. And have been for years, sister. He gunned the throttle and moved slowly down the side street. My guess was that this is where they'd hold tonight's part of the ceremony, but I don't see any preparations. All of the gates to the palace historical compound had been chained and padlocked with signs saying closed in English and French. It's not dark yet, said Kate. Vampires don't come out until it's dark. She closed her eyes. She felt very sleepy and very discouraged. But when she closed her eyes, she saw a perfect image of Joshua laughing at one of his monthly birthday parties, his small hands clenching and unclenching in delight, his dark eyes luminous in candlelight. Kate snapped her eyes open. Now what? she said. O'Rourke stopped the motorcycle. I think we need to find a place to hide the bike and ourselves, he said and then we wait until the vampires come out. And if they don't, said Kate, if this isn't the site, then we're well and royally screwed. Kate patted his arm. Two shits, a little prick, and now a royally screwed, she said. You'd better get to confession soon, O'Rourke. The priest pulled off his leather helmet and vigorously rubbed his scalp. His hair stood in matted clumps. He was grinning through his beard. I agree he said, and since all of the priests in Tirgovishcha have been rounded up by the Securitate, you may just have to hear my confession. Kate made a face. The motorcycle moved on through quiet side streets. The barn was all by itself in an empty field less than half a mile from the palace grounds. It obviously had not been used in years except to store the remains of a tractor with iron wheels and no engine, although the hay in the loft was relatively new. There was no farmhouse around. Across half a mile of field, the towers of a petrochemical plant were visible through a renewed drizzle. Systematization, said O'Rourke, 
looking both ways before pushing the motorcycle off the narrow lane and down the path to the barn. Ceausescu probably bulldozed the farmhouse. The hay is recent, said Kate. O'Rourke nodded to two scrawny cows far across the field, their ribs visible even at that distance. With all the chemical dumping, their milk probably glows a nice toxic green, he said. Nice thought, said Kate, following him into the barn and pulling the sagging doors as closed as they would go. She was shivering visibly now. Her head felt warm and she was dizzy. O'Rourke set his hand against her forehead. My God, Newman, you're burning up. She clutched her bag closer. I've got antibiotics, aspirin. What you need is to get warm, he said, clambering up a rotted wooden ladder to the loft. It's okay, he called down. The straw was not actually fresh, but it was relatively clean. O'Rourke made a nest in it and set the sidecar blanket down. Take off the raincoat and your outer layers, he said. He was pulling his own sodden coat off. Kate hesitated only a second. Then she shucked off her wet coat and scarf, found her cheap sweater and polyester pants soaked through, and tugged them off. Even her underwear was damp, but she left on her bra and white cotton pants. Her legs and arms were a mass of goosebumps, and she knew that her nipples were visible through her unstructured bra. Kate dropped into the straw and pulled half of the blanket up and around her. The wool was scratchy and smelled of gasoline. I have a change of clothes in the bag, she said through chattering teeth. You wouldn't have some for me in there, would you? asked O'Rourke. He was much wetter than she had been. He squeezed his black shirt and water ran out. The skin of his chest and upper arms was very white, and Kate could see his fingers shaking with the cold. His black trousers were visibly soaked, but he hesitated a moment after unbuttoning them. Close your eyes, he said. Don't be silly, snapped Kate clenching jaw muscles to keep her teeth from chattering. I'm a doctor, remember? Do you want a lecture on hypothermia? No, said O'Rourke and unzipped his pants. He put both their sets of clothes on a wooden railing where the weak sunlight could reach them through the single filthy window in the loft. He doesn't wear underwear, was Kate's single thought. Only then did she notice the plastic of the prosthesis beginning just below his left knee and realized that his request might have come from something other than simple modesty. Kate's eyes left the prosthetic leg and looked at the man. Father Michael O'Rourke was not as lean as Lucian, muscles not quite as well defined, but when he turned to spread the clothes on the railing, Kate found herself admiring his small rear end in a way that was far from medical. When he turned around, she followed the line of dark hair from where it covered his chest down to the thick patch of pubic hair. His penis and scrotum were contracted from the cold. Kate turned away and fumbled in her bag for clothes. Don't get the other clothes wet, said O'Rourke, slipping onto the blanket and pulling up the loose end. He was facing her, their knees not quite touching, and there was just enough extra blanket to cover him. Get warm first, then put them on. In other circumstances, with any other man, she would have known that was a line. Now, with Michael O'Rourke, she wasn't sure. Just a sweater, she said, pulling out a navy cotton sweater and tugging it on while undoing the clasp of her wet bra and slipping it off as subtly as she could before putting her arms through the arms of the sweater. She was not unaware that the motion made her breasts seem larger. The rest is mostly jeans and skirts that will look out of place here, she whispered, tugging the blanket tight again. I'll have to wear the damn polyester stuff Lucian bought me if we're going back out on the street. She pulled a dry pair of underpants from the bag and slipped them under the corner of the blanket. How to do this without being so obvious? She gave up being subtle, hunkered down in the blanket, slipped off the wet panties, and pulled on the dry ones. O'Rourke clasped his bare arms outside the blanket, and Kate realized that he was also trying to keep from shivering. He was not succeeding. She wondered if any of the shivers were from nervousness. They were huddled in their little depression in the straw like two Indians crouched face to face. Come here, whispered Kate and lay back in the straw, pulling the blanket so that O'Rourke was obliged to come with it. There was an awkward moment of rearranging the blanket and then they were lying next to each other, not quite touching but sharing warmth under the wool. Kate tried to think of a joke to break the tension palpable between them, then decided not to. 
O'Rourke was looking at her with those clear gray eyes, and she was not quite sure if there was a question there or not. Turn around, she whispered. With each of them in a fetal position, there was just enough blanket to cover them securely. Without hesitating, Kate slipped against him spoon fashion, feeling her breasts compress under the cotton sweater, feeling the backs of his thighs still moist with rain against the front of hers. Her hands touched his cold shoulders, slipped down his arms. She could feel the muscles tense and quivering with cold, and realized that O'Rourke had been soaked and freezing during most of the long drive to Tirgavishta. She snuggled closer and slid her bandaged left arm around his body, her hand flat against his chest. I don't think, began O'Rourke. Shh, whispered Kate, molding her legs and hips to his. It's all right. We'll just get warm and rest a bit until it gets dark. She felt his chest expand as if he were going to say something else, but he stayed silent. A moment later she felt him relax. Kate felt her own excitement, felt the warmth and moisture between her thighs and the slight sense of heaviness in her breasts that always signified arousal in her, but she also felt a great sense of calm descend on her for the first time since the fire. She set her face close to the back of his neck, feeling the soft tickling where his uncut hair curled slightly there and breathing in the clean male scent of him. He had stopped shivering. Kate was very aware of her nipples separated from his skin by only the light cotton, was conscious of the warmth of the cheeks of his behind against her thighs, and sensed the curve of his back solid against the cusp of her belly. But she let the urgency such proximity produced just slide away for now, become a pleasant background sensation as she relaxed into the warmth of the moment, and slept. It was dark when she woke, and for a second there was a surge of panic that they had overslept and missed the ceremony, but then Kate saw the dim remnants of twilight through the dusty panes and knew that the sun had just set. They had hours left until midnight. O'Rourke was asleep. Kate had not even the briefest confusion about where she was or whom she was with, but he had turned in his sleep so that they lay facing each other. Kate's bandaged left arm was still encircling him, but O'Rourke had huddled closer under the small blanket, his hands clasped together in front of him, so that they lay in the warm valley between her breasts. There was no chance that he was feigning sleep. O'Rourke was snoring ever so softly, his mouth open slightly in that vulnerable unselfconsciousness Kate had seen so often when she checked on Joshua in the night. Kate studied O'Rourke's face in the bit of light available. His lips were full and soft, his eyelashes long, she could imagine how cute he had been as a boy, and there were traces of red and premature gray in his brown beard. His relaxed face made her realize how much subtle strain there usually was in his otherwise open and friendly countenance, as if Mike O'Rourke carried a heavy weight which he relinquished only in sleep. Kate glanced down but could not see the artificial leg in the gap where the small blanket had parted above them. She did see the long curve of his naked thigh where his leg lay next to hers. Without thinking about it, because thinking would change her mind, Kate leaned closer, kissed O'Rourke's cheek, and, when his eyes opened and lips closed in surprise, kissed him softly but firmly on the mouth. He did not pull away. Kate pulled back a second to let her eyes focus on his, saw something more important than surprise there, and brought her face closer to kiss him again. This time her lips parted only seconds before his did. She used her bandaged left arm to pull him tighter against her, feeling his hands still folded between her breasts and the slow but steady rise of his penis against her thigh. They gasped for breath and then kissed again, and this time something infinitely more complex than their mutual urgency and excitement was communicated in the kiss. It was a slow and simultaneous opening of sensation, a resonance as real as the pounding of their hearts. Kate pulled back, her senses literally swimming in a vertigo of feeling. I'm sorry, I... Hush, whispered O'Rourke, lifting his hands to the back of her head, fingers sliding into and under her hair, pulling her close again for another kiss. Kate thought that the moist perfection of that kiss would never end. When it did, her voice was shaky. I mean, it's all right if we do. I mean, I have an IUD, but really, I understand if you... Hush, he whispered again and lifted her sweater over her head. Her nipples responded to the cold air at the same instant her eyes were covered. Then she could see again and he was pulling the blanket back in place. 
shh,' he said, touching her lips with one finger while his other hand found her underpants and tugged them down and off. "'If you don't want to, it's all,' she began, voice thick. "'Shut up,' whispered O'Rourke. "'Please.' He kissed her again, then slipped his left arm behind her, fingers strong on her back, and rolled half on top of her, his left arm taking the weight. "'Please,' she echoed and said no more as she lifted her face and kissed him, one hand splayed on the back of his head, the other sliding down his back to the base of his spine. There were scar ridges there, most small, but at least one long and ridged. She felt the briefest touch of the prosthesis as he lifted and then lowered himself between her legs, but then she was aware only of the warmth of the rest of his body, of his kisses, and of his erection, warm and insistent against the curve of her belly. Kate moaned and moved her right hand down, under his thighs, cuffed him, slid up him, and guided him to her. She was very wet as she raised her knees and cradled him. O'Rourke was in no hurry. He kissed her deeply, raised his face to look at her with what seemed infinite tenderness, then kissed her again so slowly and so passionately that Kate thought she might have lost consciousness for a second or two. Her hips moved and he entered her then, with no clumsiness, no rough male desperation, but with the same moist, slow firmness that she felt in his kiss. Kate stopped breathing for an instant as he paused and seemed ready to withdraw, but he returned with infinite slowness. Then he was moving deep within her, still slowly, so slowly that she could feel the perfect contact as he moved across the most sensitive interior part of her and then almost withdrew and moved again. The next few minutes were like memories of a future in which their lovemaking had grown better and better, more intimate with each act of love. Nothing seemed forced or awkward. They moved together for several urgent moments, Kate's senses lifted to a point of excitement where she could hardly breathe, and then O'Rourke shifted his weight slightly and his right hand was between them, part of the moisture and contact, and each time he drew back a bit, the slow movement then making Kate feel as if she were folding around him and in on herself, his moist fingers stroked her gently downward. She felt the sensation of being rubbed against both his fingers and the shaft of his penis, and then his hand would rise slowly against her even as he slid deeper. In moments Kate found herself excited beyond anything she had experienced before, her hips moving more rapidly, demandingly, then slowing as the cadence of their movement slowed, their tempo increasing again in a perfect unison of lubricated friction. Kate was no novice at making love. She had been passionate with Tom and with a few lovers in the years before and after Tom, but nothing had prepared her for the intimacy and excitement she felt now. Just when it felt like neither she nor O'Rourke could last another instant that each would have to shudder to orgasm in the same movement, then their rhythm would change as if choreographed through long experience and they would begin rising through another circle of sensation. They rolled together now, the blanket falling away unheeded, ending with Kate on top and O'Rourke's broad hand on her chest so that his fingers touched both breasts. He was looking at her, his face lost in that sensuous zone between pain and pleasure. She saw that he had bitten his lip and she lowered her face to kiss away the drop of blood there. He tried to slow her movements now with his hand firm on her hip, but Kate sensed that there could be no more slowing, no more waiting. Throwing her face back, she set both hands on his chest and moved with a rocking, downward-shifting motion that brought them to the edge and beyond. For a throbbing second, Kate did not know whose impending orgasm she was feeling more strongly, hers or O'Rourke's. Then O'Rourke's eyes closed, Kate's closed a second later. She came with a flood of warmth that echoed through her in widening ripples, and an instant after that she felt O'Rourke pulsing inside her as he groaned. A moment later, Kate lay full length on him while O'Rourke hugged her close and pulled the blanket above them. He remained in her, still hard, holding her with strong hands as she half dozed with her cheek against his chest. It grew full dark. The cold was a palpable thing in the barn now. Somewhere far across the field, a goat bleated. Does this ruin everything? Kate whispered at last, coming out of a half dream. It doesn't ruin anything whispered O'Rourke. His hands rubbed her back. But your vows... I'd already decided to leave the priesthood, Kate. My trip to Chicago was to resign in person. 
He turned his face to one side and freed his hand long enough to brush away a bit of straw that clung to his beard. He returned the hand to her back. I've honored the vow of celibacy for eighteen years without believing in the reason for it. Eighteen years, whispered Kate. She touched his chest with her fingertips. When she lifted her face from his chest to whisper something, he kissed her. Did you feel, she began, as if we had been lovers for years, he finished, as if we were remembering times we had made love in the future? Yes, I did. Do. Kate shook her head. She did not believe in the supernatural, had never believed in miracles, but this physical telepathy made her shiver. O'Rourke pulled the blanket tighter and kissed her ear. We'd better get dressed and find out if the ceremony is happening tonight, he whispered. It rushed in, then, the alien place, the cold, the dark, the nightmare of Joshua in the hands of cruel strangers. Hold me just another minute, she whispered back, lowering her cheek to his chest again. He held her. Chapter 30 The Strigoi security forces began arriving sometime after 10.30, their dark vans, Mercedes, and military vehicles rumbling down the empty side streets of Tirgovishta and taking up positions around the museum and old palace grounds. There had already been guards at the three gates, as well as razor wire atop the walls. Now the black-garbed figures with automatic weapons guarded the approaches, commandeered rooftops across nearby streets, and lit the torches within the compound around the Chindia Tower. There were few homes around the palace grounds, most of the buildings there were small businesses or related to the factories which surrounded the old section, but those few homes and shops were dark and empty. The people of Tirgovishta, as if forewarned, had cleared the area before nightfall. Kate and O'Rourke watched through the shattered wall on the third floor of a half-raised building half a block from the compound. They had seen the guards, checked the walls, and retreated before the rest of the security forces had arrived. Kate had been in favor of trying to get over the wall while there was still time, but O'Rourke had led her to a covered cistern behind the abandoned building. This is a forgotten way into the compound. This dry cistern opens into a sewer that was part of the original complex. We can enter this way. One of the young priests crawled the entire way in as a lark. But it will be better if we try after dark. How do you know this way in? Kate had whispered. He had told her then, his earlier trip to Tirgovishta had been as much to reconnoiter the palace compound and meet with the Franciscan monks here as to check on the orphanage. The monks had shown him the area, produced old maps and architectural drawings done during the restoration of the palace compound fifty years earlier, and led him to this cistern. Kate had pulled away from him then. You knew the ceremony was going to be here, she said. You knew all about this stuff. O'Rourke shook his head. Not all about it. We guessed that this would be the site for the second night of the investiture ceremony. The palace grounds were closed to the public yesterday, and there's been tight security. Who's we? asked Kate. The other Franciscans. I swear, Kate, I never heard of any of this until I came to Romania two years ago. Why didn't you tell me? O'Rourke started to speak, then stopped. He touched her cheek. I'm sorry. I should have. When you left the country with Joshua... I thought it was over with. Kate had balled her fists. But you knew the danger. You knew they'd come after me. No. He took a step toward her and then stopped when she backed away. No. I didn't know the child had anything to do with the Strigoi. You have to believe me on that, Kate. She stared at him. You said that Lucian knew. He and the Order of the Dragon, or whatever it's called. O'Rourke shook his head. Some of the monks who were arrested here today belong to the Order of the Dragon. It's a real organization, secret all these centuries, but I had no idea Lucian had any contact with it. I'm still not convinced. It's one of the reasons I called Father Stoicescu early this morning. And what did he say? O'Rourke opened his hands. He's not in the Order. The priest that was a member was picked up here in Tirgovishta. I don't know if Lucian is lying. Why should he be? He's helped me, hasn't he? O'Rourke said nothing. All right, Kate had said. I'll trust you for now. She closed her eyes. Her body could still feel the sensation of him inside her. My God, what have I done? 
Let's get into the compound. Later, O'Rourke said, and she could see him shiver. Their clothes were not quite dry, and the night wind was cold. When the VIPs began arriving. The VIPs began arriving an hour before midnight. The line of Mercedes glided between the barricades and guards and disappeared inside the main gate. Kate could see torchlight reflected on the top third of Chindia Tower, visible above the compound walls. It's time, she whispered. O'Rourke nodded tersely and led her down the shattered stairway to the cistern in the dark courtyard. Even in the dim light, she could see how pale he was. What's wrong? she asked. O'Rourke bit his lip. Tunnel, he said. Kate produced a single flashlight she had packed in her bag. We have this. It's not the darkness, he said and clenched his jaws. Kate saw that his teeth were chattering and that there was a film of sweat on his forehead and upper lip. You're ill, whispered Kate. No. O'Rourke turned away from the cistern and leaned against a wall. The tunnel. He clenched his teeth. Kate understood. You said that during the war, Vietnam, you were a tunnel rat. It's where... O'Rourke wiped the sweat from his face. I was checking out a tunnel complex that the platoon had found near a village. His voice quavered, then steadied. Tunnels branching from tunnels. Bazella and his boys had dropped in concussion and fragmentation grenades, but there were so many turns, so many ups and downs. Anyway, it had been an NVA headquarters, infirmary, barracks, the whole bit. But the NVA, the North Vietnamese regulars, had cleared out, except for one rotting corpse wedged in the tunnel a few meters from its exit point on the river bank. I figured I could squeeze by. O'Rourke stopped and stared at nothing. The body was booby-trapped, whispered Kate. Her fingers held the memory of the scars on his back and upper legs. O'Rourke nodded. They'd hollowed out the guy's stomach and rigged him with C4 and a simple tripwire to the detonator. When I touched his leg, he blew mine off. He tried to laugh, but the sound was sad and hollow. Kate moved closer and set her face against his neck. It's not full-blown claustrophobia, he whispered. I mean... You've seen me on planes and trains. As long as I can see a way out... He broke off. I'm sorry. No, whispered Kate. It's good. I think it's better that you wait here. It makes more sense. If I get in trouble, someone has to be out here to go for help. This time O'Rourke did laugh. Go for help to whom? Where? We're all there is, Kate. She managed a smile. I know but I keep waiting for the cavalry to come over the hill. Give me a minute, said O'Rourke. He took several deep breaths, swung his arms around a few times, and leaned out over the dry cistern. It was only eight or nine feet to the bottom, and there were gaps and footholds in the loose stone. Hold the light steady. Good, there. That's where Father Danielescu said the entrance was. Kate saw only stone and desiccated creepers. Hold it steady until I find a way into the old sewer line, said O'Rourke. Then hand down the light and join me. He swung out over the wall and felt his way to the bottom. Once a stone tumbled to the littered floor of the cistern, but O'Rourke stepped down easily. Kate held the light on the wall while he felt the stones, removed a penknife, and pried at one until it came loose. The others came out more easily. Light, he said, standing and holding his hands high. Kate dropped the flashlight to him. He held the beam on footholds while she descended. They crouched and peered into the hole. Ugh, said Kate, clenching her fists. Rat's eyes had gleamed back, and now she could hear the screeching of the things as they fled the light. The flashlight beam gleamed on their oily black backs. The sewer line, if that is what it was, was only three feet across, and it narrowed only a few yards in where the rat's eyes had burned back at them. How can we go into that? whispered Kate. O'Rourke leaned close. The good news is that I bet there's not a single North Vietnamese in there. I'll go first. He found a sturdy stick on the floor of the cistern and held it in his right hand, the flashlight in his left. His body blocked the light when he forced his shoulders through the entrance. Kate closed her eyes and thought of Joshua. It's wide enough, came O'Rourke's taut whisper. Father Danielescu said that it went all the way through, and I think he's right. Come on, 
I'll hold the light. Kate tried to estimate the distance they would have to crawl. A football field's length? Two-thirds that distance? It was endless. The ancient tunnel could collapse and no one would ever know they were there. The rats would eat their eyes. This was insane. Coming, she whispered and crawled into the hole. Except for the terror of the fire and the death of Tom and Julie, the hundred yards of tunnel was the most terrible and horrifying experience of Kate's life. She could hear O'Rourke's panting, could see the tremor of incipient panic in his body silhouetted against the flashlight glow ahead, but the rest was sharp rock and mud and the scurry of rats and darkness made all the worse by the heightening sense of claustrophobia as the narrow passage grew narrower, each tight section tighter. Occasionally O'Rourke would stop and she would grasp his leg, or, if the tunnel was wide enough there, force a hand forward to hold his hand, but they spoke little and their panting took on a more desperate rhythm the deeper they crawled into the darkness. What about bad air? she whispered after they forced a particularly narrow point where the old rock-lined sewer had collapsed. They had squeezed between mud and roots, and Kate could not imagine making it backward through that bottleneck. The thought took her breath away and left her panting in short, sharp gasps. Rats live here, gasped O'Rourke. Kate could hear them scurrying ahead of him and down side passages that were no wider across than her thighs. If they can breathe, I guess we can. Was your priest friend sure that this was passable? O'Rourke paused in his crawling. Well, I didn't actually speak to that young priest. But you know that he did make it all the way into the compound? demanded Kate. Her chest felt constricted as if someone were pulling a metal band tight there. Yes! said O'Rourke, and began crawling forward again, muttering something Kate did not catch. What was that? I said that the priest crawled in here when he was a boy, said O'Rourke, pushing fallen rocks out of the way. The flashlight created a corona around his beard and hair. When he was a boy? Kate grabbed O'Rourke's boot. How small a boy, goddammit! The priest paused to gasp for breath again. I don't know. Not too small, I think. I hope. He began moving forward again, his shoulders scraping rock on both sides. A few minutes later, Kate was pushing a root out of her way, wondering at the strange, bifurcated shape of the thing, when she rested on her elbows and said, O'Rourke, Mike, shine the light back here, would you? She was holding a human forearm, the space between the radius and ulna packed solid with dirt. She dropped it quickly, wiggling to one side to crawl past it. This is good, whispered O'Rourke. We must be in the cemetery within the compound, right behind the church. Kate nodded and brushed her hair out of her eyes. She had handled cadavers as a medical student, had helped with autopsies as a doctor, and held no undue fear of the dead. She just preferred to know ahead of time when she was going to handle a corpse. It was at this moment that the flashlight went out. Kate froze and felt O'Rourke's body freeze into immobility for several seconds. Shit, he whispered and banged the flashlight with the heel of his hand. Not even a glimmer. Kate grasped O'Rourke's right ankle while he fiddled with the batteries and tapped the flashlight again. Nothing. She could feel the tension coursing in him like an electric current. His skin became clammy and his muscles grew as rigid as marble. It was as if both legs were now prostheses. O'Rourke, she whispered. Mike? Silence. She felt him shift positions, lying on his back now, and from the slight rustlings and shifts in his body, she could imagine his hands lifted, his fingers tapping against the rough roof of the tunnel as if it were a coffin. His breathing was shallow and far too rapid. Mike, she whispered again, reaching higher to touch his arm. She could feel the vibration building deep within him, like the first tremors of tectonic plates slipping after years of mounting pressure. O'Rourke, she snapped, talk to me. He made a noise that was somewhere between a clearing of his throat and a gasp. Talk to me, she whispered again, her voice less sharp. It's all right. We can get there without the light. We just keep crawling, right? She squeezed his arm. It was like touching a granite statue that was vibrating slightly. He made another noise, then whispered something unintelligible. What? Kate was stroking the back of his clenched fist. His voice was tense, 
taut with control. Too many tunnels under the compound. Only this one opens into the church. Kate squeezed his hand. So? We stay in this one. No problem. He was shaking as if from fever. No. We could crawl right under the grate and into one of the other sewers. Won't we see light? whispered Kate. She could hear rats scrabbling behind her. Without the flashlight to keep them away, they could crawl over her legs, her face. I don't know. His whisper trailed off and the shaking grew worse. Kate squeezed his leg above the knee. Mike, was tonight the first time you've made love since you became a priest? What? The syllable was exhaled. Kate forced her voice to be conversational, almost whimsical. I just wondered if this was something priests do regularly. Violate their vows, I mean. You must have plenty of opportunities, what with all the lonely young wives in a parish, or the lonely young volunteers and Peace Corps girls in third world countries. God damn it, breathed O'Rourke. He jerked his leg away from her touch. She could hear his arm rise as if he were clenching his fist. No, he said, his voice growing firmer. It's not a habit of mine. I haven't been with anyone since... since before I got blown apart in Nam. I wasn't a good priest, Kate, but I was an earnest one. I know that, she whispered, her voice soft. She found his hand, pulled it down, scrunched forward in the darkness, and kissed it. His breathing was rapid but more regular now. She could feel the tremors passing out of his body like slow aftershocks. Kate rubbed her cheek against his open palm. I'm sorry, he whispered. I see what you were doing. Thank you. Kate kissed his fingers. Mike, we're almost there. Let's keep moving. Something brushed her legs and she heard a rat scurry back down the tunnel. She hoped it was only a rat. The raw earth here smelled of decay. O'Rourke tried the flashlight again, gave up on it, tucked it in his belt, rolled over on his stomach, and kept inching forward. Kate followed, keeping her head up and eyes open for any slight gleam of light despite the grit that kept falling into her hair and eyes. They saw it some time later. It may only have been minutes, but neither of their watch faces was luminous, and their sense of time was out of kilter. The gleam would have been so faint as to be invisible in a normally dark room, but to their eyes, adapted to absolute darkness, it was like a beacon. They clawed the last ten yards and stared up at the grate in the roof of the tunnel. The sewer was wider here, and Kate could almost crawl abreast of O'Rourke. They lay on their backs and reached up to the outlined metal grid. An iron grill, whispered O'Rourke. They must have put it here since Father Chirica crawled in this way years ago, probably to keep the rats out. He threaded fingers through the heavy grill and pulled. Kate could hear his teeth gnash and could smell the sweat from him. The grill did not budge. O'Rourke pulled his hands away with a groan. Kate felt the panic threatening to carry her away then, pure fear rising like nausea in her throat. She honestly did not believe that they could make the trip backward through the long tunnel. Is there another entrance? she whispered. No, only the one opening into the cellar of this church. It was part of Vlad Jefish's palace once. There were underground cells and passages. O'Rourke snarled and attacked the grill again with his hands. Flakes of rust fell like snow, but the metal did not budge. Here, whispered Kate and grabbed at the grill. Let's push instead of pull. They set the heels of their hands against the grill and pushed until their arms were numb. They lay there panting, with scrabbling coming closer in the tunnel. It must be set in cement, whispered O'Rourke feeling around the edge of it, and it would be barely wide enough for our shoulders, mine at least. Kate tried to slow her panting. It doesn't matter, she said. We're going out through it. She raised her face to the grill. The room above was dank, smelling of wet stone, but the air was infinitely sweeter up there. The metal's old and rusted, she whispered. The bars aren't very thick. Iron doesn't have to be thick. O'Rourke's voice was flat. She could see the palest glow where his face was. Iron rusts like a sumbitch, hissed Kate. Come on, set your legs up, like this, with your knees against it. Yeah, wedge your body like mine so all your weight's on your back. Okay, on the count of three, we push until it breaks or we do. 
O'Rourke grunted his way into position. Just a second, he whispered. There was an almost inaudible muttering. What? said Kate. Her back was already hurting. Praying, said O'Rourke. All right, I'm ready. One, two, three. Kate strained and arched until she felt muscles tearing, and even when she could strain no more, she continued straining. She felt rust falling into her eyes and mouth, felt the rough rocks of the tunnel floor cutting through her coat and blouse into her back, felt her neck twist as if a hot wire were being pulled through the nerves, and still she strained. Next to her, Mike O'Rourke was straining even harder. The grill did not break. It ripped out of the encircling stone and cheap cement like a cork coming out of a champagne bottle. Kate went up and out first, lying on the cool stones and breathing in cool air for a full fifteen seconds before lowering her arm to help O'Rourke up. He had to take off his jacket and rip his shirt, but he squeezed through the irregular hole into blackness. They hugged there on the floor of the crypt of the chapel, their exultation slowly changing to anxiety as they waited for black-clad guards to come in to check on the terrible noise of their entry. Although distant sounds of the investiture ceremony were audible to them, no footsteps or alarms sounded. After a moment they rose, held each other steady, and went upstairs and through an unlocked door into the chapel proper. Torchlight bled colors through a few stained-glass windows. Kate looked at O'Rourke, saw his streaked and lacerated face, his torn and smeared clothes, and had to smile. She must look even worse. The chapel was small and almost circular, empty in the way only archaeological sites can be empty, but there was a door with a single clear pane which looked out on Chindia Tower less than fifty yards away. The grass lanes and palace ruins between them and the tower were filled with torches, human figures, the same black guards they had seen at Schnagov Island, and even a parked helicopter and two long Mercedes limousines. Kate saw none of this. She had eyes only for the clump of red-cowled figures walking slowly past the chapel toward the base of the tower. One of them carried a bundle which might have been mistaken for a package wrapped in red silk. But Kate made no mistake. She had seen the flash of pink cheek and dark eyes by torchlight as the men carried the bundle past the chapel, past chanting clumps of other cowled figures. O'Rourke held her back, restrained her from ripping open the door and running into the crowded torchlight. It's my baby, gasped Kate, finally falling back against the priests, but never removing her eyes from the door of the tower where the men and bundle had disappeared. It's Joshua. Dreams of Blood and Iron I am beginning to believe that I cannot die. It has been almost two years since I have partaken of the sacrament, but still death does not come. I could refuse food or water, but such an act would be pure folly. My body would cannibalize itself over a period of months rather than die willingly. Even I, who have known more pain in my single lifetime than most generations of families have known cumulatively, even I could not face that torture. So I lie here in the day, listening to the voices of my family, much as I lay here during my early childhood. At night I rise and move around my room, stalk the corridors of this old house, and peer from the windows I peered from as a toddler. My muscles have not, will not, atrophy completely. I am beginning to believe that God's great punishment to me is this denial of death. Centuries ago, when I was young, the possibility of eternal damnation woke me with a cold sweat in the weak, dark hours of the morning. Now the thought of eternal punishment is the simple fact of being condemned to live forever. But in the day I doze, and while I lie there, not truly awake and not fully asleep, neither dead nor moving among the living, I dream my memories. My enemies fell upon me. Joined by my treacherous brother Radu, Sultan Mehmet II and his legions of Azabs, Janissaries, Romelian Sipais, and slant-eyed Anatolians crossed the Danube and sought to dethrone me. Mehmet's army was much stronger than my own. I did not confuse honor with idiocy. Upon my order, our forces withdrew to the north and left desolation in our wake. The cities, towns, and villages of my kingdom were put to the torch. Granaries were emptied or destroyed. Livestock which could not be driven north with the army was butchered where it stood. Upon my order, 
Wells were poisoned and dams were built to create marshes where Mehmet's cannon must pass. Those are the historical facts of that retreat, what modern strategists would call a strategic withdrawal, but it conveys nothing of the reality. I lie here with evening painting the dark wood of the beams above me a dull blood color, and I remember the roads swollen with weeping refugees from our own cities and villages, oxen carts and plow horses and entire clans on foot carrying their meager belongings, while behind us the flames lighted the horizon while the skies darkened with the smoke of our self-immolation. I lay here this winter just past and eavesdropped on the family housekeepers talking on the stairs and landing. My hearing is still that good when I wish it to be. And they whisper to each other about Saddam Hussein's war with the Americans and about the oil fires he lit in his wrath blackening the desert skies. They mutter about the fighting in Yugoslavia to the west and shake their kerchiefed heads about how terrible modern war is. Saddam Hussein is a child compared to Hitler, and Hitler was an infant compared to me. I once followed Hitler's retreating army into his heartland and was amazed at the artifacts and infrastructure he left intact. Saddam set fire to the desert. In my day, I took some of the lushest land in Europe and turned it into a desert. This age knows nothing of war. We retreated into the heart of the heart of my kingdom, because all Transylvanians then learned at their mother's breast that the salvation of our people and nation would always be the deepest folds in the highest mountains, the darkest forest in the most remote regions where wolves howl and the black bear roams. I have read Stoker. I read his silly novel when it was first published in 1897 and saw the first stage production in London. Thirty-three years later I watched that bumbling Hungarian ham his way through one of the most inept motion pictures I have ever had the misfortune to attend. Yes, I have read and seen Stoker's abominable, awkwardly written melodrama, that compendium of confusions which did nothing but blacken and trivialize the noble name of Dracula. It is garbage and nonsense, of course, but I confess there is one brief, almost certainly accidental passage of poetry amidst all the puerile scrawlings. Stoker's idiot, opera-cloaked vampire pauses when he hears a wolf howling in the forest. Listen to them, he stage whispers, the children of the night, what beautiful music they make. In this accidental bit of poetry, Something of the Transylvanian and Romanian soul is revealed. It is the wolf's howl, solitary, terrifying, echoing in empty places, which is the music of the Romanian soul. In the forest darkness we find our salvation and rebirth. In the mountain fastness we set our backs to the stone and turn to face our enemies. It has always been so. It will always be so. I have bred and led a race of children of the night. In that summer of 1462, thousands of my soldiers and many more thousands of my boyars and peasants fled north from the sultan's hired hordes. It was the hottest summer in living memory. Where we passed, nothing remained. My spies reported that Mehmet's janissaries grumbled that there was nothing to loot in the charred cinders of our cities, nothing to eat in the ashes of our farms. I ordered pits to be dug along the only possible line of advance, sharpened stakes to be planted, and then had them covered over with care. I remember pausing with our rear guard one June evening and listening to the screams of the sultan's camels as they tumbled into our pits. It was sweet music. I led raids against the mass of Turkish swine, using paths and passes known only to a few of my people, surprising them from the rear, cutting out their stragglers and wagon trains of sick and wounded the way a wolf pack cuts out and pulls down the weakest of the herd, then impaling them where the others would find the bodies. I sent my agents among the desolate leper colonies and into the plague-ridden shadows of my still-standing cities, bringing Turkish clothes for the sick and dying to wear, as we sent them into the sultan's camps to mingle with the Janissaries and Anatolians and Sipais and Azabs, to drink from their cups and to eat from their common bowls. I ordered living victims of syphilis, the Black Death, tuberculosis, and the pox to join the Turks, and I rewarded them generously when they returned with the turbans of the men they infected unto death. But they came on, my enemies, dying of thirst and hunger and illness, afraid to sleep in their own camps at night, terrified of the forest dark and the wolf's howl, 
but they came on. We left a single path of forage and unpoisoned springs for them to follow, a trail as clear as a line of gunpowder leading to a powder keg. They turned west to Bucharest and found that town empty of life and sustenance. They swept north to Shnagov, where hundreds of my boyars and troops waited on my fortified island there. Mehmet and Radu could not reduce Shnagov. The lake was too deep for men in armor to cross without fear of drowning. My walls were too high to scale once the lake was crossed. My instruments of war rained down too terrible a punishment on them. Mehmet followed me north again, leaving Shnagov in his rear and condemning more of his men to night harassment and morning impalement. Then, on the night of June 17th in the year of our Lord 1462, I attacked Mehmet's army not with a raiding force, but with thirteen thousand of my bravest boyars and their hand-picked troops. We scattered the guards, split the garrison, skewered those who tried to stand, and drove through the mass of their camp like a hot sword through soft flesh. We had brought torches and flares soaked in gunpowder, and these we lighted to find the Sultan's red tent. I fully planned to kill the dog myself and drink his blood before the sun rose again. We gained the red tent and slaughtered all those inside, but it was the wrong red tent. It gave me little solace to know that we had beheaded Mehmet's two viziers, Isaac and Mahmud. By the time I regrouped my men, the Sultan's cavalry was pouring in from three sides. Even then I could have carried home the attack, for Mehmet had lost nerve and fled the camp. His unmounted men were fleeing and milling in demoralized confusion. But one of my commanders, a boyar named Gales, failed to attack from the west with the second wave as I had ordered. Because of Gale's cowardice, Mehmet escaped, and my force had to fight its way out of the tightening ring of Ottoman cavalry. It was there, in the camp of Mehmet, that I took two arrows through the chest. I snapped them off and held them up by the light of torches and flares, rallying my men. The secret healing force which had set me apart from mere men since birth was stronger in me then, and I had partaken of the sacrament an hour before leading the raid. I heard the cry, Lord Dracula cannot die, and then my surviving boyars came to my side. We formed a wedge of shields and blades, and we fought our way out of that madness. The Sultan returned to his army. Some say that he had to be dragged back to the camp by his generals and my brother Radu. I did not drink his warm blood that night. In my anger I ordered the coward, Commander Gales, to my command tent an hour before dawn. My guards disarmed him, stripped him, shackled his arms behind his back, and hung him from the iron gimbal ring which I always had brought on our campaigns. Then, still covered with the soot and blood of battle, my chest in great pain, I went to work. My only tools were an awl, a corkscrew gimlet, and my father's razor of the finest honed steel in all of Europe. They were enough. I drank from his living body until the sun rose, then slept, arose, gave orders for the march back to Tirgovishta, and returned to dine and drink from him until sunset that day. It has been written that the Turks forty leagues away heard the coward's screams that day. In Tirgovishta we prepared for a year or more of siege. The city was closed, the newly rebuilt walls and towers manned, the cannons primed, cattle and chickens driven into the fort, and underground streams were diverted into the city through the secret sewers I had ordered built. Sultan Mehmet's rabble and the hungry Radu came on. They stopped twenty-seven leagues from our walls. Mehmet and his men had passed through a hundred forests to reach the foothills of the Carpathians and the doors of Tirgovishta, but on this morning they encountered a new forest, a forest they paused at before passing through. In my previous winter of campaigning against the Turks I had killed thousands of my foes, I was eager to keep a precise count of the Ottoman dead, so I had ordered my boyar commanders to cut off the heads of the fallen and carry them home for easy counting. By February the troops were grumbling. Too many heads, too many heavy, leaking bags. At the end of the campaign I had the heads counted, took careful inventory, and then sliced the noses and ears off to send to my friend and sometimes ally, King Matthias Corvinus of Hungary. He never responded to my letter and gift but I know that he must have been impressed. Of course we took thousands of Turkish prisoners during the campaign. 
By the week in June, when Mehmed approached the walls of my capital, our cells and stockades held more than 23,000 prisoners. Now, as Mehmet's huge but exhausted and starved army angrily started their morning march a mere twenty-seven leagues from almost certain victory at Tirgovishta, they stopped at the forest I had ordered raised. A forest of some twenty-three thousand impaled Turks, some still writhing in the morning light. Taller stakes held the bodies of the Sultan's favorite commanders, friends he had assumed he could ransom, friends such as Hamza Pasha and the legendary Greek Thomas Catavolinos. The Sultan's own toady and chronicler, Lyonicus Calcondiles, has written of this morning, So overwhelmed by disbelief in what he saw, the Emperor said that he could not take the land away from a man who does such marvelous things and can exploit his rule and his subjects in this way, and that surely a man who had accomplished this is worthy of greater things. So said Calcondiles. But Calcondiles certainly lied through his rotting teeth. Were we to have been there that morning, and I was, watching from horseback from less than half a league away, you would have seen a demoralized army turning and shoving their way from the stench of death rising from my new forest, and we would have seen their shaken sultan near to pissing his ballooned silk pants, and we would have seen him ordering his men into camp within sight of my forest, as if they could not leave or tear their eyes away, and before dark that night they had dug a trench deeper than the Danube around their cowering army, and had lit a thousand fires to hold me at bay. I think that I could have walked into their camp and said, Boo! that night, and watched the army flee in terror. Sultan Mehmet and his band turned away from Tirgavishta the next morning, and began their long march back to Breila, their fleet, and their accursed homeland. My spies reported then that his army marched into Adrianople at night, so that the populace would not see their shame, and that by the time the Sultan returned to Constantinople his once proud legions of Anatolians, Romelians, Azabs, and Janissaries were so much dragged-out dog-meat. But the Sultan ordered great rejoicing throughout the land for his brilliant victory over Dracula. So much for Islamic victories, I think while I listened to the visiting family and to busy chambermaids talking of war in desert places. Chapter 31 Kate would have rushed out into the torch-lit palace grounds after Joshua if O'Rourke had not restrained her. There were at least a hundred cowed strigoi visible in the courtyards between her and Chindia Tower, where the baby had been carried, but Kate would have attempted to cross that space if O'Rourke had not at first held her back and then just held her. We can't do anything now, he whispered. There were guards within ten yards of the chapel door. We'll watch where they take him. Kate had grasped his torn shirt in her two fists. Can we follow them? O'Rourke was silent, and she knew the answer herself. It would take too long to crawl back out through the tunnel. They would not know which Mercedes the child had arrived in, and the guards would be checking for anyone following their Strigoi masters. Kate pounded her fist against O'Rourke's chest. This is so maddening. She took deep breaths to avoid tears, then watched the tower, hoping for some sign of her son. Chindia Watchtower was an eighty- or ninety-foot stone tower, four-sided at the bottom but soon becoming a cylinder with crenellated battlements at the top. Illuminated by torchlight, the tower looked to Kate like a rook that had escaped its chessboard. There were two arched windows on the side she could see, each window taller than a man, and a single stone and iron balcony outside the first window about forty feet up. She noticed a crack running from the broad base to just below the battlements, with clumsy iron rods holding stone and brick together like giant staples. O'Rourke noticed her gaze. That's from the earthquake a few years ago, he whispered. The tower's been closed to tourists ever since. Ceausescu authorized the funds to fix it, but it was never done. Kate nodded absently. She knew that O'Rourke was trying to distract her from thinking about the terrible danger that Joshua was in. What if they make him drink human blood tonight? Perhaps they already had. She had not seen the baby at Shnagov, but there was much she had not seen there. Slowly the crowds of red-cowled figures moved away from the chapel and the palace ruins and gathered at the base of Chindia Tower. There was music, as if a band were playing, and then Kate saw the portable tape unit amplifiers, and speakers not far from the grounded helicopter and parked limousines. 
The music was vague, soulless, some Eastern European state anthem, perhaps. But then the tempo changed, chords rose in triumph, and Kate realized that the speakers were blaring the theme from Rocky. She shook her head. If this was all a nightmare, it had just gone from the surreal to the ridiculous. Red-cowled figures stepped through the door onto the platform above the crowd. A great cheer went up from the men below. Then Kate gasped as she saw one of the men. Was it Radu Fortuna? She could not tell for sure, hold a silk-wrapped bundle out over the railing as if offering it to the crowd below. The bundle stirred, and Kate gripped O'Rourke's arm, sure that Joshua was going to be dropped. The figures on the balcony seemed to listen to the cheering for a minute, and then they stepped back through the arched doorway. Kate thought of some mad parody of a pope's appearance. The music ended and the crowd below mingled, broke into clumps, and moved away from the tower. Kate saw cigarettes being lit and cowls being taken off. None of the faces looked familiar, although none were close enough to see too clearly. The feeling in the courtyard was like some rotary meeting after business was finished. But no one left yet. It was twenty or thirty minutes later when the group of men came out of the tower. Kate strained but could not make out the baby for a minute. Did they leave him in there? Is someone or something in there with him? Her heart pounded. Then she saw the fifth man in the procession carrying something awkwardly and could make out the red bundle and the red-clad arms. Those in the courtyards made way, allowing a corridor through the crowd, and Kate's view was blocked again. She had never felt so futile and frustrated. Now the guards in black were making a cordon around the red and white striped helicopter. A starter coughed, the rotors began to turn slowly, and the mob moved back instinctively, making a wider circle around the machine. Kate saw the doors close on several of the VIPs in red, and then the engine sound filled the palace grounds, rotors blurred, the helicopter shuddered, seemed to lean forward on its skids, and then rose, dipped to the left, and climbed quickly above the bare trees to the north, navigation lights flashing. The crowd watched the lights until they disappeared in cloud, and then the men began filing back to their limousines, chauffeurs holding doors open and guards slouching at attention. "'Was that some sort of government helicopter?' whispered Kate. She wondered if it was headed back to Bucharest. It had been flying northwest, away from the capital, when it disappeared in the low clouds. "'It's a jet ranger, American-made,' whispered O'Rourke. "'I don't know what kind of choppers the government uses, but I doubt if they'd be American. My guess is that it's privately owned.' Kate nodded. She was not surprised that O'Rourke could identify the machine. Males seemed so proud of their ability to give the proper name to the proper piece of machinery, especially aircraft and war machines. Kate wished she had a dollar for every time she would be watching some silly war movie with Tom on cable, and he would say something like, Look at that! It's supposed to be an old Sherman tank, but they're using an M60. Or, Do they really expect us to think that F-5 is a MiG-29? It was all nonsense to Kate. She thought that boys learned all of that trivia because they loved to build models and never really grew out of the pride of naming exotic machinery. Still, wanting to keep talking while the courtyards emptied and the last guards moved farther from their chapel, her chest aching from the sense of loss and futility, Kate whispered idly, How do you know it was a whatchamacallit, a jet ranger? O'Rourke surprised her. I've flown one. She glanced at him in the dim light. His hair and beard were caked with rock dust and rust. She imagined her own hair. Flown one? He turned and grinned, bobbing his head in a boyish way. When I was in Vietnam, I was the only grunt I knew who actually enjoyed riding in slicks. Slicks? Kate ran her fingers through her hair, brushing out things she did not want to think about. Helicopters. Hueys. O'Rourke looked back at the cars driving out through the guarded main gate. Anyway, I knew a warrant officer there who flew slicks into the Aishau Valley and still enjoyed the flying. He gave me a few checkout rides there, and later, after I'd gotten the new leg, it turned out that he was opening a flying service in California near where I was spending time in a VA hospital. O'Rourke rubbed his beard as if embarrassed by telling such a long story. Anyway, he gave me lessons. Did you get a license? asked Kate. She was watching the exodus, wondering how they might find out where the next night's ceremony was. 
The town, the love-making, the tunnel, the torches, and the music were all unreal. Joshua was real. She forced herself to focus. No, he said, testing the door. It was locked, but only with a padlock and rusty hasp on the outside that could be kicked open. I didn't think there was a big market for one-legged chopper pilots, so I went into the seminary instead. Suddenly he pulled her low and dragged her back into the smaller room, keeping her head low. Shh, he whispered. A minute later the padlock was tried and opened, flashlight beams swept the main chapel area, and then Kate heard the sound of the door being shut and locked again. They waited five minutes before either spoke again. Final check, I'd guess, whispered O'Rourke. They crept back to the door. The courtyard was empty and dark. The main and secondary gates closed. Chindia Tower was only a dark silhouette against low clouds lit by fires and lights from the chemical plants to the northeast. They waited another twenty minutes, Kate rubbing her face to fight off the numbness of exhaustion, and then O'Rourke kicked the door open, the hasp tearing out of rotten wood. The museum people may be upset at what we're doing to their chapel, whispered Kate. It was a weak joke, but she felt weak at the relief of knowing they didn't have to go back out through the tunnel. They moved slowly, keeping low behind tumbled stone walls and bloomless rose bushes, but there were no guards inside the palace grounds and no traffic on the streets beyond. It was as if they dreamt the entire ceremony. The walls were still topped by razor wire and broken glass, but O'Rourke found a low pedestrian gate in the back of the compound that was climbable. Kate tore her slacks again as she went over the top. The streets of Tirgovishto were still silent and empty after the evening's invasion of Strigoi VIPs, but Kate and O'Rourke kept to the shadows and alleys. Even the city's dogs were not barking tonight. The motorcycle was still in the barn. While O'Rourke fiddled with the bulky machine, Kate climbed the ladder to retrieve her travel bag and the blanket from the loft. The reflected lights from the petrochemical plant came through the dusty window and illuminated the nest in the straw where she and O'Rourke had made love only hours before. Did that really happen? Kate sighed tiredly, folded the blanket, and went back down the ladder. O'Rourke had the doors open and was pushing the clumsy machine outside. I'd give a thousand dollars for a bath tonight, she said, still brushing muck from her hair and clothes. Five hundred just for an indoor toilet. Get your checkbook out, said O'Rourke, and gunned the engine to life. The Franciscan monastery was in a section of Tirgovishta so old that the streets were not wide enough for more than one Dacia-sized car at a time. There were no Dacias or any other type of automobiles on the streets. The motorcycle exhaust sounded obscenely loud to Kate as it echoed back off the ancient stone and wood buildings. The motorcycle's weak headlight revealed that every house here seemed to have some personal touch which belied the poverty and socialist drabness that had been imposed from above for so long. Bits of brightly covered trim, splendidly arched windows on an ancient home little more than a hovel, intricate stonework on the bottom third of an old house, skillfully executed ironwork on a gate connected to a sagging fence, even the glimpse of elaborate linen curtains in a window of what could have passed for a farm shed in the States. The monastery was a long, low, one-story building set back from the street in a section where empty lots alternated with dark and frequently windowless buildings. O'Rourke cruised past once, turned around, inspected the building on another pass, and then turned down an alley and went slowly past the rear of the structure. It was dark and had an abandoned feel to it. There was a padlock on the gate, but the fence was low enough to climb. Kate caught a glimpse of elaborate gardens and trellises in the dark backyard. Wait here a minute, O'Rourke said softly, parking the motorcycle in a copse of trees near where the alley met a larger street. If the Strigoi are hunting for us, they may have left someone behind. Kate touched his arm, feeling the electricity of the renewed contact despite her fatigue and depression. It's not worth risking, she whispered. O'Rourke grinned. A bath, he said. Indoor plumbing. Maybe fresh clothes. Kate started climbing out of the sidecar. I'm going with you. O'Rourke shook his head. Compromise. Get on the bike. If I come out in a hurry, gun the thing and pick me up on the run. Do you know how to start it and drive it? Kate frowned but nodded. 
She'd watched him enough during the trip to know that she could get it moving. For some reason, she thought of her Miata back home, destroyed in the fire. She had loved that machine, loved the sense of freedom and exhilaration it imparted when she drove it hard on winding mountain roads, the clean Colorado sunlight on her face, the wind in her hair. Kate? said O'Rourke, squeezing her shoulder. You with me? Yeah. She rubbed her cheeks and eyes with the heels of her hands. Exhaustion lay on her like a physical weight. O'Rourke slipped down the alley, his black clothes making him almost invisible, and Kate sat there dully, listening to the cold wind stir brittle leaves. There were no insect sounds, no birds, and no sound of traffic from the main road a hundred feet farther down the alley. She tried to remember the sense of excitement and humanity she had sensed in her walks through Bucharest in May, the young couples kissing in dark doorways, the laughter, the grandparents watching their children in the park at Chishmiju Gardens. It was all from another world. It's empty, said O'Rourke from behind her, and she jumped three inches. She'd been half dozing again. They left the motorcycle in among the trees, climbed the low fence, and entered the monastery through a side window that was unlocked. There's been a Franciscan presence in Tirgovishta since the thirteenth century, O'Rourke said softly as he lit a candle. The light, began Kate. We'll stay in the inner rooms and halls. The shutters are closed. I don't think the police will be back. The nine residents here were brought to Bucharest for questioning and probably will be released there tomorrow. Today, really. Now that the Strigoi have had their little ceremony. Kate followed him down the corridor, glancing in rooms as she passed them. The candle stretched their shadows along rough walls to the ten-foot ceiling. Kate had never been in a monastery and was not quite sure what to expect. Gothic trappings, perhaps. Dungeon-like cells, wooden bowls and utensils, perhaps a few well-used catanine tales for self-flagellation. Get a grip, Kate, she thought. She wanted to go to sleep again. The house was larger and cleaner than most homes she had seen in Romania, less cluttered, but it might have been the residence of a large farm family. The rooms were simple, but contained comfortable-looking beds and dressers. Only the simple crucifixes on the walls of each bedroom suggested a monastery. The kitchen was more modern than most Romanian kitchens. No wooden bowls here, but lots of plastic plates and tumblers that reminded Kate of summer camp. The dining room had a battered and unadorned but undeniably elegant twenty-foot table that would have sold for several thousand dollars in an American antique store. One of the rooms on the other side of the dining room had been turned into a modest chapel with a small altar and individual kneelers for twenty or so people. Kate's impression, even by candlelight, was of simplicity, cleanliness, and community. "'Have you spent time here?' whispered Kate. It was hard not to whisper in the silence. Occasionally. It was a good jumping-off place when I was working with children in the mountain cities. Father Danielescu and the others here are good people. O'Rourke opened another door. Ah, said Kate. The bath was large and deep and had tiled ledges on three sides. It was immaculately clean. Kate ran her hand along the tile and enamel of the tub itself, then frowned. Where are the taps? How do you get water in this thing? O'Rourke set the candle on the ledge and walked over to the corner, where there was a counter with a farmhouse-style pump over a huge galvanized tin tub, sitting above what appeared to be a small propane stove with a single burner. It takes a while, said O'Rourke, but it's the hottest water in Tirgovishta. He began pumping. For fifteen minutes they were busy filling, heating, carrying, and dumping, but eventually the tub was filled. They paused then. Kate showed more embarrassment than O'Rourke. Is he still a priest? Am I ruining something important? Was that just an aberration in the loft? A sin to be confessed? To hell with it, she thought, and began unbuttoning her filthy blouse. I'll go check the doors and shutters, said O'Rourke, pausing in the doorway. You go ahead and take your time. I'll bathe next. Kate stood in her underwear and stared him in the eye. Don't be silly. That would be a waste of time and hot water. Besides, I'll have my eyes closed when you get in. The tub's big enough. We won't even know the other is there. She removed her bra and white cotton pants. O'Rourke nodded and went down the dark hall. Kate felt like crying when she lowered herself into the steaming water. 
It seemed there was no heating in the monastery other than fireplaces in the central rooms. The air temperature in the house equaled the late autumn chill outside, and the bath literally steamed, raising a delicious fog that rolled over the edge of the tub, slid along the tiled ledges, and crept along the floor. The water was hot. A lump of soap shaped like a small meteorite sat on the ledge. She lathered herself and let the soap create bubbles as she lay neck deep in the hot water, laid her head back, and closed her eyes. She heard O'Rourke come in, squinted at him as he set down towels and a pile of folded clothes, and then closed her eyes while he stepped out of his own clothes and into the tub. He sat on the ledge for a minute, she heard the soft sound of plastic on the floor, and she realized he was taking off his prosthesis. Kate opened her eyes and looked at him. "'Now you've really seen me naked,' he said with no sign of embarrassment. He raised his good leg and his shortened left leg and gingerly settled in the steaming bath. "'There is a heaven,' he whispered. The water rose higher around Kate's chin, and she felt his thigh brush hers. There was room in this antediluvian hot tub for the two of them to sit side by side in opposite directions without crowding. "'I feel like we should be doing something,' whispered Kate. "'Going after Joshua.' O'Rourke handed her a sponge, and she squeezed water onto her face. Something. We don't know where they went, he said softly. Kate nodded, letting her arms and hands float. The heat made her breasts ache and reminded her of all the bruises she'd received and muscles she'd strained in the long nightmare crawl through the palace tunnel. You had cities circled, places you thought the ceremony might be held. Lucian thought that there would be four nights of ceremony. Did your priest friends know where the next two nights will be held? No. O'Rourke lathered his arms and shoulders. There are dozens of cities and sites that were important to the historical Vlad Sepish and that might be part of any ritual centered on him. Brashov, Sibiu, Rimne Velcha, Rishnov Citadel, Braun, Timishwara, Sigishwara, even Bucharest itself. But you had several circled on the map, said Kate. She had to sit up and sponge her chest and neck or fall asleep. My guess was Sigishwara, Brashov, Sibiu, and the so-called Castle Dracula, he said. They're extremely important places in the actual history of Lad Shepish, but I don't know which places or which night. Kate brushed soap out of her eyes. There is a Castle Dracula? I thought the Romanian Office of National Tourism just invented that. They take tourists to phony sites like Braun Castle that had nothing to do with Vlad Shepish, said O'Rourke. Or they drive the few Dracula tourists way up to Borgo Pass and other places that Bram Stoker wrote about, but that have no historical significance. But there is a Castle Dracula, or at least the ruins of it, on the Argesh River, less than a hundred miles from here. He described it then, the heap of rocks high on a crag overlooking the remote Argesh Valley. You've been there? said Kate. No. The road is impassable much of the year, and the passable parts have been closed off most of this last year. There's a hydroelectric plant up there beyond the castle in the Fugarash Mountains, above the city of Kirtia de Argish, and the military is very vigilant about guarding that area. Also, Ceausescu had the site closed because there was some serious restoration going on at the ruins. They probably abandoned the project when Ceausescu died. Kate suddenly felt very awake unless the restoration was a Strigoi project. O'Rourke sat up so quickly that water sloshed. For the ceremony? Yes, but which night? And can we get there? We can get close, said O'Rourke. He reached to the towels on the ledge, dried his hands, and unfolded the map he had carried in from the motorcycle. Either by heading south and by picking up Highway 7 to Peteshti, then up 7C to Kirtia de Argish, or the very long way northeast of Brashov, then way north to Sigishwara, then southwest to Sibiu, and all the way down the Alt River Valley to Highway 73C. That would be, I don't know, 250 to 300 miles on some iffy roads. Kate shook her head. Why would we go that way? O'Rourke set the map down and began soaping his beard thoughtfully. The jet ranger left flying to the northwest, if that was its actual route, it might be headed toward any of a million places, but... He paused to dip his face in the water and came up spluttering. Sigishwara is that way, about a hundred and fifty miles from here. 
Kate remembered the reading she had done about Vlad Shepish. He was born there. She frowned. If Lucian's right, and there are four nights to the investiture ceremony, and the ceremony celebrates Vlad Shepish's career, wouldn't they have started at Sigishwara? O'Rourke lifted his hands above the soapy water. What if they were working backward in time? Shnagov is where Vlad was supposed to have been buried. Tirgovishta is where he ruled. And Sigishwara is where he was born, finished Kate. Fine, but what about the fourth and final night? Your castle Dracula doesn't seem to fit the itinerary. Unless it was where the next prince is to be initiated, whispered O'Rourke. His eyes were focused on something distant. Kate slumped back in the cooling water. We're guessing. We don't know Diddley. I wish Lucian were here. O'Rourke raised an eyebrow. Not this minute, said Kate, flustered. But he seemed to know... If he was telling the truth. O'Rourke shifted his shortened leg. Turn around and slide back this way. Kate hesitated a second. I'll scrub your back and shampoo your hair, he said, holding up a small vial of shampoo. It's not scented and perfumed American shampoo, but it's probably better for your hair than whatever we picked up crawling through the palace graveyard. Kate turned around and sat in the middle of the tub while O'Rourke first lathered her back and then massaged her scalp with strong fingers. The shampooing went on and on, and if she believed in magic she would have asked for three wishes just to keep the sensation going on forever. And never face tomorrow. Turn around, she said, sliding forward and turning. I'll do you. After the shampoos, after the ritual lathering and rinsing of their bodies, they kissed and even held each other, nude in the still steaming water, but there was no surge of passion, and not just because each was bruised and exhausted. It was as if they were friends as well as lovers, two friends who had known each forever. I'm tired, thought Kate. I'm sentimentalizing this. No, you're not, said another part of her mind. Wherever the site is for tomorrow night's ceremony, said O'Rourke, breaking the spell, we can't do much tonight. The mountain roads are dangerous at night, and police often stop private vehicles. We'd be better off blending in with traffic in the daytime. We'll flip a coin in the morning to see which way we go. It will be hard getting out of here, said Kate. The candle was burning low. The air was very cold. Once more unto the breach, dear. Holy shit, it's cold, said O'Rourke who had pulled himself up onto the tiled ledge and swung sideways. His body steamed in the cold air. He began toweling himself rapidly. Kate stepped out and did the same. It was like going from a sauna to the freezing outdoors. She huddled under the thin blanket. Tell me we're going to sleep here together for a few hours, she said, teeth chattering. Together. The beds are very much single, said O'Rourke. He balanced on one leg while he attached the prosthesis. Kate frowned. You don't sleep with that on, do you? I mean, other than in haylofts. O'Rourke finished attaching it and stood. Kate noticed that the modern prosthetic looked very lifelike. No, he said, but some consider it undignified to hop to one's bed. Single bed? said Kate, shaking now as her body cooled. Good blankets, said O'Rourke. He smiled gently and I took the liberty of carrying one single bed in and setting it next to the other in the nearest bedroom. Kate lifted her bag and a stack of clean clothes with one arm and slipped the other around the priest. Ex-priest, she thought, or soon to be ex-priest. Not to be unromantic about this, she said, but let's get under those good blankets before we freeze our asses off. O'Rourke carried the dying candle with him as they found their way to the room. Chapter 32 The day was like a return to early autumn. The blue skies emphasized each remaining leaf in the forests along Highway 71 to Preshoff. Kate thought that highway was a generous term for the narrow strip of patched and potted asphalt that ran north and east from Tirgovishta, wound its tortured way through passes in the Carpathian Mountains, and then dropped dramatically again before connecting with Highway 1 south of Preshoff. Rejuvenated by last night's bath, several hours' sleep, and the clean new clothes that O'Rourke had found, at least one of the monks at Tirgovishta Monastery had been small enough that Kate could wear his dark sweater over her last clean black skirt and look moderately presentable, she was tempted to take off her scarf, tilt her head back, 
and enjoy the sunlight as she bounced along in the sidecar. It was not possible. The sense of urgency to find Joshua was too great, the terror at making the wrong decision too deep. They had not flipped a coin to decide the direction. After looking at the map in the morning light, both of them had lifted their heads and said, See Gishwara. On Kate's part it was nothing but intuition. Something about traveling in Transylvania makes one superstitious, she thought. If we're wrong about where the ceremony is tonight, we have a final crack at tomorrow night, said O'Rourke. Yes, said Kate, if Lucian was telling the truth. Our information is shaky, based on hearsay and generally half-assed. If this plan was a medical diagnosis, I'd sue the physician for malpractice. There were few cars this morning, but traffic was heavy, heavy semis belching pollution behind them in blue and brown clouds, tractors that looked like they came out of a Henry Ford turn-of-the-century museum, their iron wheels chewing up more of the well-chewed asphalt road, rubber-wheeled horse carts, wooden-wheeled horse carts, painted-wheeled pony carts, the occasional gypsy wagon, herds of sheep standing stupidly in the road looking lost while their herders lagged behind with the same expression, cattle being flicked along by children no more than eight or nine years old who did not even look up at the heavy trucks as they roared past or at the motorcycle as it weaved to avoid hitting cows, bicycles wobbling their way to what appeared to be nowhere in particular, the occasional German car breezing past at 180 kilometers per hour with a blast of its arrogant German horn, the driver not even glancing at the motorcycle and its occupants, a few Dacias limping along or sitting broken down in the middle of the road, army vehicles evidently trying to race the German cars as they roared and smoked their way down the center of the highway, and pedestrians. There were many pedestrians, gypsies with their swarthy skins and loose clothes, old men with white stubbled cheeks and soft hats that had lost all form, flocks of schoolgirls near the two tiny villages and one small town they had passed through, Puchowasa, Fieni, and Matoeni. The girls much mended but stiffly starched blue skirts and white blouses seeming very bright in the sunlight, the unschooled children tending cattle, both boys and bovine wearing expressions of infinite boredom, old peasant women waddling down the side of the road. There was no shoulder to the highway, only a three-foot ditch filled with foul-smelling water most of the way, and older peasant women being led by tiny children, much as the cows were being led, and the occasional officer de polizai standing outside his village police headquarters. The police did not even look up as the motorcycle rumbled through Fieni, a thoroughly soot-soaked industrial town. O'Rourke was careful to obey the speed limits. "'We'll need gas and brush off,' he shouted. Kate nodded and kept her eyes on the weaving bicycle just visible beyond the horse cart that had pulled out in front of them. This was no time to close her eyes and enjoy the sunlight. Once past the mountain village of Maroeni, the traffic mysteriously dwindled to nothing, the winding road was empty, the air grew cooler, and few of the trees had retained their leaves. Kate asked if she could drive the motorcycle for a while. You've done it before? Tom used to let me drive his Yamaha 360, Kate said confidently. Once, a little distance, slowly. She was good with machines, though, and had been watching O'Rourke closely. O'Rourke pulled onto the gravel shoulder where the road began its switchback, parked, and stepped off. He left the engine idling. Watch the clutch, he said. It's a mess. No second gear to speak of. He limped around to the sidecar while Kate stood stretching. He's hurting, she thought. Driving that thing with a clutch pedal and everything has been an ordeal. She mounted the bank, waited while O'Rourke settled in, grinned at him, and started off with a little too much throttle. The ancient motorcycle and sidecar tried to do a wheelie. O'Rourke let out a single, very strange sound. Kate compensated a bit too fast by squeezing the brake handle hard enough to send O'Rourke's head into the plastic wind visor and almost toss her off the saddle. She decided to go straight to third gear, missed it a couple of times, got them going again vigorously in first gear, looked up just in time to avoid driving off the cliff edge, took most of the width of the asphalt to recover, then got the machine on the right side, going the right speed with the right smoothness. Almost. I've got it now, she said ticking up through gears with her foot and leaning forward into the wind. O'Rourke nodded and rubbed his head. 
The highway crossed a high pass above Sinaya, and by the time Kate reached the summit she had worked things out between her and the machine. Stop here, yelled O'Rourke, pointing to a narrow gravel shoulder on the other side of the road. Kate nodded, swerved, realized that she hadn't really practiced with the brake yet. Where was it? But found it and applied it hard enough that their skid did not take them over the edge. Quite. The bike had spun around during their deceleration phase, and when the dust and flying gravel dissipated, they were facing back downhill and O'Rourke and the sidecar were hanging out over treetops and rocks. He took his goggles off slowly and rubbed grit out of his eyes. I just wanted to admire the view, he said softly over the idling engine. Kate had to admit that the view was worth stopping for. To the north and west, the Bucheji range of the Carpathians blended into the snow-peaked Fugarash range, which curved south just where the horizon became murky. The highest foothills below the snowfields were spotted with sturdy juniper and dwarf firs. The middle regions glowed green with pine and fir. The lower hills were mottled white with birch, and the valleys miles below were dappled with the dying leaf colors of oak, elder, elm, and sumac. Clouds were boiling in from the north and the west, but the sun was still bright enough to send their shadows sliding down limestone ridges to the tree-filled valleys below. Except for a glimpse of the briefest stretch of road behind them, there was no sight of man. None. Not smokestack or rooftop or smog or aircraft or microwave antenna for as far as Kate could see to the west and south. In a country contemptuous of all environmental standards, this was the first time she had seen the real beauty of the earth. It's beautiful, she said, hating herself for mouthing the cliché but not knowing what else to say. What's that bright green plant up high, near the juniper trees below the snow? I think it's called Zimbru, said O'Rourke. He leaned over the edge of the sidecar and looked down. Say, could you engage the brake, let the clutch out just a little, and ease us a bit forward, toward the road? Kate did so. She liked the percolating of the oversized engine and the feel of the motorcycle between her legs. Sunlight glinted off the tarnished chrome of the handlebars. Thanks, said O'Rourke and cleared his throat. He turned and pointed to the southwest. The Argesh River and Vlad's Castle is out that way. How far? For a bird, maybe a hundred clicks. Sixty, maybe seventy miles. By road, he chewed his lip. Probably about eight hours of driving. Kate glanced at him. We're not wrong, Mike. It's Sigishwara tonight. He looked at her and then nodded. What do you say we find a better place to park up on the summit, get the bike away from the road, and eat lunch? There had been bread and cheese at the monastery, and enough bottles of wine to make all of Transylvania drunk. O'Rourke had explained that the monks still grew vineyards and bottled wine for the local region. It was a way to help pay expenses. Kate had loaded three bottles under the seat of the sidecar and left fifty American dollars in a kitchen drawer. The cheese was good, the bread was stale but delicious, and the wine was excellent. They had no glasses, but Kate did not mind swigging directly from the bottle. She drank only a bit. She was, after all, driving. The last of the sunlight before the clouds won the aerial battle warmed her skin and brought back sensuous thoughts of the previous day and night. Do you have a plan? said O'Rourke, leaning back against a tree and chewing on a tough strand of crust. Hmm? What? Kate felt like someone had thrown cold water on her. A plan, said O'Rourke. For when we catch up to the Strigoi. Kate set her chin. Get Joshua back, she said tightly. Then get out of the country. O'Rourke chewed slowly, swallowed, and nodded. I won't even ask about part two, he said. But how do we achieve part one? If the baby is really their new prince or whatever, I don't think they'll want to give him up. I know that, said Kate. The clouds now obscured the sun. A cold wind blew down from the snowfields above them. So? O'Rourke opened his hands. I think we can negotiate, said Kate. O'Rourke frowned slightly. With what? She nodded toward her travel bag. I've brought samples of the hemoglobin substitute I was giving Joshua. It should allow the Strigoi to break their addiction to whole human blood and still allow the J-virus to work on their immune systems. Yes, said O'Rourke, but why would they want to go on methadone when they enjoy heroin? 
Kate looked out at the now shadowed valley. I don't know. Do you have any better suggestions? These are the people who killed Tom and your friend Julie, said O'Rourke, his voice very low. I know that! Kate did not mean for her voice to be so sharp. He nodded. I know you know that. What I mean is, did you come just to get Joshua, or is revenge on your agenda? Kate turned her face back to him. I don't know. I don't think so. The medical research, the breakthrough potential of this retrovirus. She looked down and touched her breast where it ached. I just want Joshua back. O'Rourke slid closer and put his arm around her. We're a strange choice for the dynamic duo, he whispered. She looked up, not understanding. Caped crime fighters, superheroes, Batman and Robin? What do you mean? The ache in her chest subsided slightly. You said that you shot that intruder the first time he entered your home in Colorado, said O'Rourke, the Strigoi, but you didn't kill him. I tried to, said Kate. His body rejuvenated because of... I know, I know. The pressure of O'Rourke's arm was reassuring, not condescending. What I mean is that you haven't killed anyone yet, but you might have to if we keep going on this quest. Will you do it? Yes, Kate said flatly. If Joshua's life and liberty depend on it. Or yours, she added silently, looking at his eyes. O'Rourke finished his bread and drank some wine. For a giddy moment Kate wondered how many times this man, this lover of hers, had said Mass, had prepared the Eucharist for communion. She shook her head. I won't kill anyone, he said softly. Not even to save the person most dear to me in the world. Not even if your life depended on it, Kate. Kate saw the sadness in him. But I've killed people, Kate. Even in Vietnam, where none of the usual reasons made sense anymore, there was always a good reason to kill, to stay alive, to keep your buddies alive, because you were attacked, because you were scared. He looked down at his hands. None of the reasons are good enough, Kate. Not any more. Not for me. For the first time since she had met the priest, ex-priest, she did not know what to say. He tried to smile. You've gone on this mission with the worst choice for a partner that you could have made, Kate, at least if killing people is going to be called for. He took a breath. And I think it is. Kate's gaze was very steady. Are you sure these... these Strigoi are people? His head moved almost imperceptibly back and forth. No, but I wasn't sure that the shadows in Vietnam were human either. They were gooks. But that was different. Maybe, said O'Rourke and began cleaning up their modest picnic site. But even if the Strigoi have become so alien from human emotions that they're another species, which I won't believe until I see more evidence, it's not enough. Not for me. Kate stood and brushed off her skirt. She pulled a jacket on over her sweater. The wind was colder now, the sky grayer. The brief return to autumn was over and winter was blowing down from the Carpathians. But you'll help me find Joshua, she said. Oh, yes. And you'll help me get him out of this country. Yes, he said. He did not have to remind her of the police, the military, the border guards, the informants, the air force, the securitate, all obeying the orders of those who took orders from the Strigoi. That's all I ask, Kate said honestly. She touched his arm. We'd better get moving if we have another hundred miles or so before we get to Sigishwara. The main highway is faster, said O'Rourke. He hesitated. Did you want to continue driving for a while? Kate paused for only a second. Yes, she said. Yes, I do. The road down from the pass was a series of hair-raising switchbacks, but Kate had got the hang of handling the bike now and used the compression of the lower gears to keep the brakes from overheating. O'Rourke had double-checked the gas tank and thought they would have enough to get to brush off, but the uncertainty made Kate nervous. There was no traffic at all on this steep stretch of the highway, and Kate saw only a handful of cottages set far back in the pine trees. Then they were in the outskirts of Sinaya, and the homes grew more frequent and larger, obviously, country houses for the privileged nomenclatura, those party apparatchiks and smiled-upon bureaucrats who earned extra perks from the state. 
Sinaya itself looked like a typical Eastern European resort town. Large old hotels and estates, which had been fine places a century earlier and which had received little maintenance since, signs to winter sports facilities where a ski lift would involve ropes and the occasional tea bar, and a newer, larger section of town featuring Stalinist departments and heavy industry pouring pollution into the mountain valley. But the scenery above the town could not be compromised by socialist ugliness. On either side of Sinaya and the busy Highway 1 that ran through it, the Bucheji Mountains rose in almost absurd relief, leaping skyward to bare peaks whose summits reached 7,000 feet. Kate's home, her ex-home, in the foothills above Boulder had been at 7,000 feet, and the peaks of the Rockies to the west had risen to almost 14,000 feet, but these Bucheji Mountains were much more dramatic, rising vertically as they did from the Prakava River Valley that was not far above sea level. The result, Kate thought, glancing up at the scenery while winding the motorcycle through truck traffic exiting from what looked like a steel mill, was a mountain scene that looked the way the 19th century painter Bierstadt only wanted the Rockies to look, vertical, craggy, the summits lost in clouds and mist. Kate had been to the Swiss Alps before, and the scenery here rivaled anything she had seen there. It was just the gray people shuffling along the highway, the empty shops, the decaying estates, the disintegrating apartment buildings, and the filthy industry pouring black smoke at the mountains that reminded her she was in an environment that no self-respecting Swiss would tolerate for an hour. There was no gas station in Sinaya, and Kate pressed on toward Brashov, thirty miles to the north. The road continued to follow the river, with cliffs and breathtaking views on either side. Kate was not looking at the view. When the truck traffic thinned out, she throttled back so that she could be heard. O'Rourke, she shouted. When he looked up from whatever thoughts he was lost in, she went on. Why don't you trust Lucian? He leaned closer as they rumbled past a closed-down Byzantine Orthodox church and followed the highway around a long bend in the river. At first it was just instinct. Something, something not right. And then, said Kate, clouds continued to pour between the mountains to the west, but occasional shafts of sunlight would illuminate the valley and the narrow river. And then I checked on something when I went back to the U.S. Before I went to Colorado and before I saw you in the hospital there. Do you remember telling me that Lucian said he'd learned his idiomatic English during a couple of visits to the States? when he'd gone with his parents? Kate nodded and maneuvered to miss a gypsy wagon and a small herd of sheep. She swerved back to the right lane just as a logging truck roared by in the opposite direction. It was half a mile before they escaped its blue exhaust fumes. So, she said. So I called my friend's office in Washington, Senator Harlan from Illinois, and Jim promised to check on it for me. Just look at the visa records and so forth but he didn't get back to me before you and I left for Romania. Kate didn't understand. So you didn't learn anything? I told him to contact the embassy in Bucharest when he did get the records and have them leave word with the Franciscan headquarters there, O'Rourke shouted over the engine. They'd gotten the message when I spoke to Father Stoicescu the other morning. The morning after Lucian showed us the bodies of his parents and the thing in the tank at the medical school. Kate glanced at him but said nothing. The valley was widening ahead. Visa records show that Lucian visited the United States four times in the last fifteen years. The first time he was only ten. The last time was in late autumn of 1989, just two years ago. O'Rourke paused a minute. He didn't go with his parents any of those times. Each time he came alone and was sponsored by the World Market and Development Research Foundation. Kate shook her head. The vibration and engine roar were giving her a headache. I never heard of it. I have, said O'Rourke. They called my superior in the Chicago Archdiocese almost two years ago and asked if the church would suggest someone to go on a fact-finding trip to Romania that the Foundation was sponsoring. The Archbishop chose me. He leaned up out of the sidecar so that Kate could hear better. The Foundation was started by the billionaire Werner Deacon Trent, Lucian went to the States four times at the invitation of Trent's group, or perhaps at the old man's personal invitation. Kate found a wide enough spot in the shoulder to pull over and did so. The river rushed past to their right. You're saying that Lucian knows Trent? 
And that Trent is probably the leader of the Strigoi family? Maybe even a direct descendant of Vlad Shepish? O'Rourke did not blink. I'm just telling you what Senator Harlan's office found out. What does it prove? He shrugged. At the very least, it proves that Lucian was lying to you when he said he traveled to the States with his parents. At the worst, it says that Lucian is Strigoi, said Kate. But he showed us that blood test. O'Rourke made a face. I thought he went to rather great pains to disprove something we hadn't even suggested. Blood tests can be faked, Kate. You of all people should know that. Did you watch carefully when he did the test? Yes, but the slides or samples could have been switched when I was distracted. A heavy truck rumbled past. Kate waited for the roar to fade. If he's Strigoi, why did he shelter us and take us to Shnagov Island to see part of the ceremony and... She took a deep breath and let it out. It would be an easy way for the Strigoi to keep tabs on us, wouldn't it? O'Rourke said nothing. Kate shook her head. It still doesn't make sense. Why did Lucian run away when the Securitate or whoever it was were chasing us in Bucharest? And why would he allow us to be separated like we are if his role was to keep tabs on us? I don't think we have any real understanding of the power struggles going on here, said O'Rourke. We've got the government versus the protesters versus the miners versus the intellectuals, and the Strigoi seem to be pulling most of the strings on each side. Maybe they're fighting among themselves. I don't know. Kate angrily stepped off the bike and looked out at the river. She had liked Lucian, still liked him. How could her instincts have been so wrong? It doesn't matter, she said aloud. Lucian doesn't know where we are, and we don't know where he is. We won't see him again. If his job was to keep track of us, they probably fired him. Or worse. O'Rourke had uncoiled himself from the sidecar and was checking the gas tank. There was a fuel gauge on the narrow console between the handlebars, but it had no needle and the glass was broken. We need gas, he said. Do you want to drive us into Brashov? No, said Kate. They got no gas in Brashov. Foreigners in Romania could not, at least theoretically, buy gas at the regular pumps using Romanian lay. Laws still required tourists to use their own hard currency to purchase petrol vouchers at hotels, the few car rental agencies, and Office of National Tourism outlets, each voucher good for two liters, and to exchange these for gas at special calm tourist pumps set aside at the few and far between gas stations. That was the theory. In practice, O'Rourke explained, the calm tourist pumps usually sat idle while the gas station manager waved tourists to the front of the inevitable line at the regular pumps. This involved hateful stares from the people in the long lines while the time-consuming voucher paperwork was done, as well as bakshish to the person whose job it was to pump the gas, never the manager of the station, and all too frequently a woman in six layers of coats and stained coveralls. Brzov itself was a once beautiful medieval city which had been covered with industry, Stalinist apartment tracks, half-finished Ceausescu started construction, abandoned systematization projects, and even more industry like barnacles on a sunken ship. It may have been possible to find some streets or vistas of former beauty, but Kate and O'Rourke certainly did not during their ride down the busy Kalia Bukarestilor and Kalia Fugarashului boulevards in search of the Sibiu Sigishwara Highway and the gas stations the map promised. One of the gas stations was closed and derelict, windows broken and pumps vandalized. The other, just past the turnoff from the boulevard to the Sibiu Sigishwara Highway, had a line that stretched more than a mile back into the city proper. Merd, whispered O'Rourke. Then, we can't wait. We'll have to try the calm tourist pump. A fat man in stained coveralls came out to squint at them. Kate decided to hunker down in the sidecar and be invisible while O'Rourke handled things. Few things were more conspicuous in Romania than a take-charge Western female. Da, said the manager, wiping his hands on a grease-black rag. Potza te agut. Ya, said O'Rourke, his demeanor suddenly self-assured and a bit arrogant. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Ah, vorbitzi Germana? New, said the man. Behind them a woman in several layers of jackets pumped gas into the first car in a line that stretched literally out of sight. Everyone was watching the exchange by the calm tourist pump. Scheiss, 
said O'Rourke, obviously disgusted. He turned to Kate. Er spricht kein Deutsch. He turned back to the manager and raised his voice. Ah, uh, de benzina, ah, uh, facet si plinu, varog. Kate knew enough Romanian to catch the filler up, please. The manager looked at her, then turned back to O'Rourke. Chetanta? Coupon pentru benzina? O'Rourke at first looked blank and then nodded and pulled an American twenty-dollar bill out of his pocket. The manager took it but did not look happy, nor did he unlock the heavy padlock on the gas pump. He held up one grease-black finger and said, Please you to stay here, and went back into the tiny station. Uh-oh, said Kate. O'Rourke said nothing. He got back on the bike, gunned the engine to life, and drove off slowly. Eyes watched from the cars in line as they headed back into town. Dumb, 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 O'Rourke was saying to himself. Aren't we going the wrong way? asked Kate. Yes. He drove back to the main boulevard, swung right at a traffic circle, and accelerated out into the truck traffic heading southwest. A road sign said, Rizhnov, 13 kilometers. Do we want to go to Rizhnov? called Kate over the roar and rattle. No. Do we have enough gas to get to Sigishwara? No. Kate asked no more questions. In the outskirts of Brashov, another highway branched northwest, and O'Rourke swung onto it. A kilometer marker said Fugarash. O'Rourke pulled over, and they studied the map. If we kept going on the Sibiu Sigishwara road, that fat toad could have sent the police right after us, he said. At least now they might look south before checking north. Damn. Don't blame yourself, said Kate. We had to get gas. O'Rourke shook his head angrily. Running out of gas is a way of life in this country. Dacias have little pumps built in under the hood so people can transfer a liter or two to someone who's broken down. Everyone carries liter jars in their trunks. I was an idiot. No, you weren't, said Kate. You were just thinking in American terms. Run low on gas, stop at a gas station. So was I. O'Rourke smoothed the map on the edge of her windscreen and pointed. I think we can get there this way. See, stay on Highway 1 here until this village. Here, Sherkaya, about fifteen clicks this side of Fugarash, and then take this smaller road up to Highway 13, then straight to Sigishwara. Kate studied the thin red line between the two highways. That road would be in poorer condition than the cow path we took over the mountains. Yeah, and less traveled, but there aren't any high passes that way. Worth a try? Do we have a choice? said Kate. Not really. Let's go for it, she said, hearing an echo of Lucian in the slang. Maybe we'll be lucky and find another gas station. They were not lucky. The motorcycle ran out of gas about six miles north of Sherkaya on the mud and gravel road that was a fat red artery on the map. There had been no traffic since they had left the main highway, and very few houses except for one huge collective farm but now they could see a single home a quarter of a mile or so ahead, set back only slightly from the road, behind a fence laced with dried wisteria vines. Kate got out and walked, while O'Rourke pushed the heavy bike and sidecar along the road for a distance. To heck with it, he said at last, rocking the bike to get it through muddy ruts. Let's hope they have a liter jar of benzina. An old woman stood outside the gate and watched them approach. Buna diminiazza said O'Rourke. Buon nazio, the old woman replied. Kate noticed that she had said good afternoon rather than morning. She glanced at her watch. It was almost 1 p.m. Vorbitsai Inglese? Germana? Francesa? Magyar? Roman? said O'Rourke, standing casually. The old woman continued to stare, occasionally working her toothless gums in what might have been a smile. No matter, he said, smiling boyishly. Imi putetsi spoon, varog, unde este ece mai apropiaba stazi de benzina? The old woman blinked at him and raised empty hands. She appeared nervous. Simtem doar turisci, said O'Rourke reassuringly. Noi collatorim prins Transylvania. He grinned and pointed to the motorcycle down the highway. De benzina. When the woman spoke, her voice was like old metal rasping on metal. 
Este incitant? O'Rourke blinked and turned to Kate. Are you thirsty? Kate did not have to think about it. Yes, she said. She smiled at the old woman. Da! Multumesque vorarci mult! They followed her through the muddy compound and into the home. The house was small, the porch where they sat much smaller, and the old woman's daughter or granddaughter who joined them was so tiny that she made Kate feel grossly oversized. The old woman stood in the doorway, speaking in her raspy, rapid-fire dialect, while the daughter or granddaughter ran back and forth, fluffing pillows on the narrow divan for them, waving them to their seats, then rushing in and out of the room, bringing glasses, a bottle of scotch, cups, saucers, and a carafe of coffee. The younger woman also spoke no German, French, English, Hungarian, or Gypsy dialect, so they all tried to communicate in Romanian, which led to much embarrassment and laughter, especially after the scotch glasses were refilled. They held more than the diminutive coffee cups. Through Pigeon Romanian, they ascertained that the old woman was named Anna, the younger one Marina, that they had no benzina here, on the farm, but that Marina's husband would be home soon and would be happy to give them two liters of petrol, which should be enough to get the motorcycle to Fugarash or Sigishwara or Brashov or wherever they wanted to go. Marina poured more coffee and then more scotch. Anna stood in the door and beamed toothlessly. Marina asked in slow, careful Romanian whether they were staying in Bucharest, how did they like Romania, were they hungry, what were farms like in America, had they seen the tourist sites yet, and would they like some chocolate? Without waiting for an answer, she jumped up and ran into the other room. The radio, which had been playing softly, came on much louder. A moment later, Marina returned with small chocolate biscuits that Kate guessed had been saved for a special occasion. O'Rourke and Kate munched the biscuits, sipped the coffee, said, Esta forarte bien, to compliment the food and drink, and asked again when Marina's husband might be getting home. Would it be long? No, no, said Marina, smiling and nodding. Approximative zeke minute. O'Rourke smiled at her and said to Kate, Can we wait ten minutes? Suddenly Kate did not want to. She rose, bowing and thanking the two women. Anna stood smiling and blinking in the doorway as Kate moved toward it. They heard the helicopter first. O'Rourke grabbed her hand and they ran out into the small yard, just as the red and white machine roared in over the leafless trees and barn. When it passed, another, smaller chopper, black, looking all bubble and skids, buzzed in over the farmhouse like a furious hornet. Kate and O'Rourke looked once at Anna and Marina standing in the doorway, fingers to their mouths, and then the two Americans ran for the road. Police cars and military vehicles blocked the road a hundred yards away in each direction. Men in black cradled automatic weapons as they encircled the farmhouse. Even from a distance, Kate could hear radios squawking and men shouting. She and O'Rourke skidded to a halt on the gravel road, looking wildly around. The two helicopters returned, one hovering above them while the larger jet ranger circled, hovered, and settled onto its skids fifteen yards away. The blast from the rotors threw dust and gravel over O'Rourke and Kate. She pivoted, thought about running toward the barn, saw the black-clad figures already there, saw more of them moving through the yard and up the road. The black helicopter buzzed above them, darting back and forth. Marina turned the radio up so we wouldn't hear the phone call, said O'Rourke. Or the truck's coming. God damn her. He gripped Kate's hand. I'm sorry. The door of the jet ranger opened. Three men jumped out and walked quickly toward them. O'Rourke whispered the name of the short man, Radu Fortuna. The second man was the dark-eyed stranger Kate had seen twice before, once in her son's bedroom, once on the night they tried to kill her. The third man was Lucian. Radu Fortuna stopped three feet from them and smiled. He had a slight gap between his strong front teeth. I think you have created much mischief, yes? He smiled at O'Rourke, shook his head, and made a clucking sound. Well, the time for mischiefs is over. He nodded and the men in black jogged forward, pinning O'Rourke's arms, grabbing Kate's wrists. She wished Lucian would come closer so she could spit in his face. He looked at her with no expression and kept his distance. Radu Fortuna snapped something at one of the men, and he jogged back to the house and gave something to Anna and Marina. Fortuna smiled at Kate. 
In this country, madame, one out of every four peoples works for the secret police. Here we are all either the, how do you say it, the informed or the informed on. Radu Fortuna nodded. Kate and O'Rourke were suddenly grabbed and half dragged, half carried toward the waiting helicopter. Chapter 33 Romania from the air was beautiful. The helicopter stayed low, below a thousand feet, following the upper regions of the Alt River northeast and then swinging northwest up a broad valley. Kate saw a ribbon of highway below, sparsely traveled, and thought it must be the highway from Bashov to Sigishwara. The valley gave way to a high plateau which was still green in places, relatively free of trees except where thick copses grew on hilltops, and ridged with passes connecting the snow-clad Fugarash and Bucheji ranges in the south to the unnamed mountain wilderness stretching as far north as Kate could see. The helicopter wove its way up the ascending plateau, often flying past tumble-down castles, huge stone abbeys that looked as if no one had visited for centuries, and medieval keeps that sat atop hilltops and crags which dominated the valley below. There were few farms in the valley, and those few were collective monstrosities that seemed to be nothing more than a collection of long barns and stone buildings. Villages were small and scarce. The rest of the scenery was forest, mountain slopes, steep canyons boiling with low clouds, and ancient ruins. It was dramatic and beautiful. Kate Newman did not give a good goddamn about the scenery. She and O'Rourke sat on a padded bench in the rear of the jet ranger cabin, their wrists still tied uncomfortably behind them. No one had tightened their seat belts, and the updrafts, thermals, crosswinds, and other vagaries of small aircraft travel jostled them and left them lurching uncomfortably. Kate especially hated the nauseating feeling when the helicopter dropped suddenly and she lifted a bit off her seat. She had always hated roller coasters. They did not talk. The sound of the jet engine and rotors was simply too loud to carry on a conversation, even if anyone had wanted to. Radu Fortuna sat in the front right seat where a co-pilot would normally sit, Lucian was belted into a jump seat behind the pilot, facing backward, and the dark man whom Kate thought of only as the intruder sat between O'Rourke and her. The man was firmly strapped in. Lucian was looking out the window to his right with a calm, almost distracted expression. Kate tried not to look at him. Her mind was rushing, but it found no answers, no clever plans, and very few branches of hope to cling to. The helicopter banked left. Kate gasped as she slid helplessly against the Strigoi intruder. He smelled of musk and sweat. And then they were rushing down a narrower valley with higher peaks on either side. A thin ribbon of highway ran along another river below. The roar of the engine and rotors made Kate's headache almost intolerable. Her left arm, still bandaged and aching, throbbed in unison with her migraine. Radu Fortuna was wearing a communications headphone, and now he slid one of his earphones off, put his hand over the mic, twisted in his seat, and shouted, Sigishwara! Kate looked out and ahead with dull eyes. The town was like a fairy tale city, perched on a small mountain between taller ones, bound about with high stone walls and battlements, its steep hillsides pocked with crenellated towers, steep slate roofs, cobblestone streets, covered walkways, and tall, tan, and yellow homes that had been built almost a thousand years earlier. Then the chopper banked and Kate caught a glimpse of the socialist reality of New Sigishwara. Industry on the outskirts of town, a single highway lined with cheap cinder block structures, and a few nomenclatura estates sitting fat and arrogant on opposing hillsides. But unlike so much else in Romania, this intrusion of post-war ugliness made no real dent in the atmosphere of the medieval city proper. The highest hill was all old city, and the old city must appear much as it had when Vlad Sepish's father first rode into it and established his headquarters there in 1431. The helicopter banked again, and this time Kate saw the military vehicles along the roads, the police cars at the roadblocks, and the almost total absence of vehicles within the city. You see, it would not have been too easy for uninvited peoples to visit us tonight, shouted Radu Fortuna. Yes? Kate did not answer, and he put the earphones back on and said something to the pilot. They came in over the old city on the hill, and the towers, red tile roofs, narrow streets, tiny courtyards, and steep stairways became larger and more real. 
Kate saw that Sigishwara proper had been laid out within its protective walls, and although steps and a few winding roads connected it to the larger village below, both the wall and the old city remained intact. They flew over the wall, banked sharply around a tower with a large clock face, slowed with a suddenness that almost sent Kate lurching off the bench, and then settled with a jar, a slight rising again, and then a solid thump as the machine lost its ability to fly. The pilot threw switches while Lucian and Radu Fortuna were out of the machine and moving away in a crouching run. The second helicopter, the strange little bubble cockpitted black machine, buzzed angrily overhead and disappeared behind the tower. The Strigoi in the middle shoved Kate out and then O'Rourke. Kate almost tripped and landed face first on the sharp cobblestones, but the man's strong hand seized her roughly by the upper arm and pulled her upright. They had landed in a grassy area near the edge of the fortifications, a small square looking down on the old city walls, which offered a view of the new city below, a river, and the wooded hills across the valley. Behind them, ancient Sigishwara stacked its steep-roofed homes up the mountainside. Kate saw a church spire through the trees above them. She tried to see everything, to get her bearings now, in case she escaped and needed to know which way to run. She did not know which way to run. Lucian took a step in her direction as if he were going to say something. If he had come any closer, she would have kicked him, but he paused and then turned away, walking to a waiting car and talking to the swarthy man. Radu Fortuna came up to her, saw the direction and intensity of her gaze, and said, Oh, you think that your friend is a part of our family, eh? No, no, no. He shook his head and showed his broad grin. The young student works for money, just as so many do in our country. He has served his purpose. Fortuna snapped his fingers and the dark man handed Lucian a thick wad of Romanian bills. He sold Joshua and me out for lay, thought Kate. She felt physically ill. The waiting car was neither Dacia nor Mercedes, but some intermediate level of German car. Lucian took the money, got in the back seat, and did not look out again as the driver started the car and drove out of sight under the courtyard arch. Come, said Radu Fortuna. There were several of the security guards in black in the square now, and they took Kate and O'Rourke by the arm and led them after the briskly striding Fortuna. They came out of the square into a smaller open area, a sort of corner park, and then strode down the cobblestoned hill only a hundred feet or so to the massive clock tower Kate had seen from the air. The hands on the clock face sixty feet above them were frozen. Fortuna led them past the small main door that had a tiny sign which said, Museum, down some stone stairs, through a thick door which was opened as he approached, through a narrower second door, down another flight of worn stone steps, and into a cellar lit only by two naked twenty-watt bulbs. Yawn! snapped Fortuna. The intruder. He and his men killed Tom and Julie. He threw me off a cliff stepped forward and lifted a heavy wood and iron trap door set in the stone floor. The opening was a square into blackness. Radu Fortuna smiled and beckoned Kate forward. Come, come. You have traveled a long way in search of our hospitality. Now enjoy it. He nodded and the guards pushed her forward and lowered her into the darkness, her arms still tied behind her and protesting in pain. There was an almost vertical stairway of wooden steps, but her foot missed it and she dropped three or four feet to a stone floor. The impact knocked the wind out of her and she could do nothing but roll to one side as O'Rourke was tossed in after her. Radu Fortuna stood above them, his face and shoulders a silhouette in the open trap door. Our tower has a wonderful view, our modest museum a fascinating collection. But I think you will not perhaps have time to enjoy these things, yes? But do make the most of your final moments together. He stepped back, and the trap door slammed down with a noise that Kate would not have believed if she had not heard it. There came the sound of a bolt sliding and clicking above. The darkness was not quite absolute. There was the dimmest of dim glows, a light so faint as to be almost illusory, around the edge of the trap door. She fought her way to a sitting position and raised her face to the promise of light. There were voices and laughter above. Heavy boots trod on the trap door itself and then scuffed across stone. A laugh came from farther away, and for several minutes there was no sound at all, although Kate sensed someone up there, waiting, guarding. 
She twisted toward a slight stirring near her. Mike? Yeah. His voice sounded pained. He had hit harder than she had. Kate wondered if his artificial leg had been damaged. Are you all right, O'Rourke? Yeah. He took deep breaths in the darkness. How about you, Newman? She nodded, realized he could not see her, and said, Yes. Her nose was running, and she craned to wipe it on her shoulder. Her wrists were still tied very tightly behind her. She could barely feel her hands now. We fucked up, whispered the priest. Kate said nothing. She wiggled closer until she could feel his right arm tied back. She moved until they were back to back, her hands reaching for his wrists. She had some idea of untying his bonds while he did the same for her, but she found unrelenting plastic there, clipped together with a snap like a hospital bracelet. It's no use, he whispered. Cops use these plastic restraints in the States. You can't break them or untie them. You can't even cut them with scissors. They've got a special shears that cuts them off. Kate folded her fingers into fists. What are they going to do to us? She realized how stupid the question was, even as she had to say it. O'Rourke leaned closer. It was cold and damp in the pit, and his warmth was welcome. Well, didn't Lucian say that none of the Strigoi drank human blood until the last night of the ceremony? No, whispered Kate. He said that legends had it that the young prince who was being invested didn't drink blood until the fourth night. The last night. She laughed out loud, a strange and somewhat frightening sound in the darkness. Although I'd say that the veracity of some of the things Lucian told us might be a little suspect. Jesus. Her laughter died. On the other hand, O'Rourke whispered, his voice low and steady as if to calm her. It does seem he knows a bit more about the Strigoi than he let on. Maybe his information is accurate. Kate tried to laugh again, but her mouth was suddenly too dry, her throat too constricted. She forced saliva into her mouth and licked her lips. I'm sorry I got you into this, O'Rourke. Kate, you don't have to. No, listen. Please. I'm sorry I got you into this, but I swear I'll get us out of it. And Joshua. O'Rourke said nothing. Suddenly a scrambling was audible from several directions. Oh, shit, breathed Kate, her skin crawling. Rats! She and O'Rourke huddled closer, their backs together and knees drawn up. Clumsily, with almost no feeling in their fingers as circulation ceased, they reached behind and between themselves and held hands in the darkness. Time became unmeasurable, except for the growing pressure in Kate's bladder. She half dozed, felt O'Rourke sag against her in his own state of dull exhaustion, and awoke only when the pressure to urinate became more urgent. She closed her eyes and prayed to no one in particular that someone would come and let them out before she had to wet her skirt or crawl into a corner and try to pull her underwear down. The darkness was too deep to reveal any detail, but they had moved around enough to know that the pit was just that, a pit about ten feet by ten feet. There seemed to be no straw, no chains, no iron bracelets complete with dangling skeletons on the wall as far as they could tell from kicking out with their feet, only cold, wet stone and the occasional scurry of rats in the corners. I hope they're only rats. Finally she could stand it no longer and whispered to O'Rourke, Excuse me. She hobbled into the corner that seemed to have had the least sound of rodent toenails on stone, squatted, managed to get her skirt up and underpants down, and urinated. The sound of her water on the stone seemed very loud. There doesn't seem to be any toilet paper, she said aloud. O'Rourke chuckled in the dark. I'll call housekeeping. Kate managed to get everything rearranged and crawled back to the center of the pit on her knees, feeling damp, uncomfortable, a little embarrassed, and infinitely relieved. She leaned against O'Rourke and rested her head on his shoulder. Something will happen, she whispered. Yes. He kissed her on the cheek, and she felt the comfortable rasp of his beard. If she nestled just right, she could feel his heartbeat. Kate had dozed off when the trap door slammed up with a noise that made her heart freeze. She crashed out of a dream. God, this is real. 
The dim light from the twenty-watt bulb was as bright as sunlight in their pained and dark-adapted eyes. Kate squinted up through tears at the silhouette of the man named Jan. You are to say goodbye to the other, Jan said in heavily accented English. You see one the other no more. Two men came down and dragged O'Rourke up and out. Kate screamed and stood then, shouting at them, berating them, trying not to weep, but weeping anyway. Two men in black came down the steep stairs, and she kicked at them. One of them kicked her back, his heavy boots sending shock waves down her shin. They lifted her roughly by arms that had gone beyond pins and needles to stilettos of pain. Kate was almost sick then, almost threw up as they lifted her up and out of the pit. She did not know if the nausea was coming from the pain, terror, anger, or from pure relief at being taken out of the pit. Radu Fortuna was standing there. His dark eyes gleamed. He wants to see you first, woman. He raised a hairy hand and lifted the back of it toward her. No, do not speak. If you say anything to anger me, I will take a needle and deep-sea fishing line and sew your lips shut. You may speak only when he asks you a question. Do you understand? He had not lowered his large hand. Kate nodded. Good, said Radu Fortuna. He snapped his fingers. Jan, take her up to the house. Father wishes to meet the woman. Chapter 34 It was night outside, and the streets were absolutely empty. They took Kate to a tall old house on the corner not far from the clock tower. An elaborate sign hung over the single door in front. Kate glanced up and saw that it was a golden dragon curling almost in a circle, its talons extended and mouth gaping. Inside, the place looked like an abandoned restaurant or wine cellar. Cobwebs connected the dark bar counter to low beams. The man named Jan walked ahead of her up the stairway, while one of the nameless Strigoi in black followed, occasionally pushing her when she faltered on the steep steps. The wooden stairs were so old that they were worn down in the middle. The carpet on the third-floor landing had been walked on until any color or pattern in it was long since lost. On the third-floor landing, Jan removed a blunt shears from his pocket and clipped the plastic restraint free from her wrists. Kate raised her hands and tried to flex her fingers while hiding her agony from the two men. You speak not unless father asks question, said Jan, repeating Radu Fortuna's admonition. The intruder's eyes seemed black. You understand, yes? Kate nodded. Despite her best efforts, her eyes had filled with tears at the pain in her hands. Jan smiled and opened the door. It was not a large room, and it was lit by only two candles. There was a bed near the tiny windows against the east wall, and Kate could see a bundled figure in it. One of the shadows moved then, and Kate jumped as she saw two huge men in opposite corners. They were gigantic, at least six foot four or five, and massive, and their shaved heads gleamed in the weak light. Each wore black clothes and a long mustache. The closer of the two gestured for her to approach the bed. There was a single chair set near it. Kate went closer and stood behind the chair. She tried to see the man lying under the covers as if she were just a doctor assessing a patient for the first time. Only his head and shoulders and yellowed fingers were above the covers. He looked to be in his mid to late eighties. He was almost bald except for long strands of white hair which fanned out from above his ears and lay across the linen pillow. His face was heavily lined, liver-spotted, and gaunt to the point of emaciation, with sunken eyes and the sharp turtle's beak mouth of the very old or very sick. His nose, underlip, cheeks, and chin were protuberant, the jaw prognathous. Air rasped in and out of his open mouth with the terrible cadence of Chain Stokes breathing, and the breath was sour. Kate could smell it from three feet away, as was often the case with people who had been fasting so long that the body was metabolizing needed tissue. He still had his teeth. Kate stood there, unable to think diagnostically, barely able to think at all. She had seen a younger version of this face not long before, in Vienna's Kunsthistorisches Museum, in a portrait of Vlad Tepesh on loan from Castle Ambras's Monster Gallery. Then the terrible breathing stopped, 
and the old man opened his eyes like an owl awakening at the sound of prey. Kate stood very still and resisted the impulse to flee. Her fingers, still pulsing with the pain of renewed circulation, grew white again as she gripped the back of the chair, her fingernails gouging splinters. For several minutes the two looked at one another. Kate noticed his eyes, how large and dark and commanding they were. Then his fingers flexed above the blankets, and Kate noticed his nails were two inches long at least, and yellowed to the color of old parchment. The silence stretched. The old man said something in what sounded like Turkish or Persian. The words emerged softly, like the half-heard crawl of large insects in rotten wood. Kate did not understand and said nothing. The old man blinked slowly, licked his thin, cracked lips with a white tongue that seemed far too long, and whispered, Cum tinumesti. Kate understood this simple Romanian. I am Dr. Kate Newman, she said, amazed that her voice was as steady as it was. Who are you? He ignored the question. Dr. O. Newman, he whispered to himself, and Kate felt her flesh crawl at the sound of her name in his mouth. She wondered if the old man was rational, or if Alzheimer's had wreaked as much havoc on his mind as the years had to his body. He licked his lips again, and Kate thought of a lizard she had once seen sunning itself in the Tortugas. Are you the Dr. Newman, the hematologist from the Centers for Disease Control? He whispered in unaccented English. Kate blinked her surprise. Yes. The old man nodded. The turtle beak turned up in the smallest of smiles. I prided myself in knowing most of the major blood specialists in the country. He closed his eyes for a long moment, and Kate thought that perhaps he had gone back to sleep, but then his voice rattled again. Are you comfortable here, Dr. Newman? Kate had no idea what here meant, Romania, his house, the pit in the clock tower, but she knew her answer. No, she said flatly. My child, my friend, and I have been kidnapped. I've been assaulted by thugs, and they're keeping me against my will right now. If, when, the American Embassy hears about this, there will be a major international incident, unless, unless we are released immediately. The old man nodded, his eyes still closed. It was hard to tell if he had heard. Do you know me, Dr. Newman? Kate hesitated. You are Werner Deacon Trent. It was not quite a statement. I was Werner Deacon Trent. The old man coughed with the sound of stones rattling in something hollow. An indulgence, that name. After a while one feels that time and space are barriers to memory. Always a mistake. One of the bald men in the shadows approached, lifted the old man's head and shoulders with infinite tenderness, and helped him drink water from a small glass. Finished, the huge man returned to the shadows. One of the young Dobrins, whispered the old man. Their ancestors were very helpful when... But never mind. What do you think will happen to you, your child, and the priest you traveled with, Dr. Newman? Kate opened her mouth to speak, but a sudden terror gripped her bowels and throat. She had to sit down. I don't know. The old man's head nodded imperceptibly. I will tell you. Tomorrow night, Dr. Newman, your adopted son, my true son, will become the prince and heir apparent of a rather unique family. Tomorrow night the child will be given the name Vlad and will taste the sacrament, and then the family will disperse to a hundred-some cities and twenty-some nations, and the heir will grow to manhood here while his uncle, will manage the vast and varied affairs of the family while he waits for me to die. Is there anything else you would like to know, Dr. Newman? The old man's voice had grown progressively weaker, but his eyes were fierce. Why? she whispered. Why what, Dr. Newman? Kate leaned closer and also whispered. Why this insane ritual? 
Why the exercise in perversion? I know about your so-called sacrament. I know about your family disease. I can cure it, Mr. Trent. Cure it while offering you a substitute for the human blood you have had to steal. I can cure you while offering you a chance to help humanity rather than prey on it. The old man's head turned then, slowly, like a clockwork mannequin. His eyes did not blink. Tell me he whispered. Kate felt a surge of hope. She kept her voice calm and professional, even while the thrill in her grew. I have something to barter for our lives, all of our lives. She told him then, about the J retrovirus, about Chandra's studies, about the hope the applied retrovirus held out for curing AIDS and cancer, and finally, about the success of human hemoglobin substitute with Joshua. And it works she concluded. It provides the building materials necessary for the retrovirus to maintain its immunoreconstructive role without having to consume whole blood. With frequent doses, the hemoglobin substitute can be administered intravenously so that the hormonal and mood-altering effects of the blood absorption mutation organ can be moderated, if not bypassed altogether. She stopped, out of breath and terrified that she had gotten too technical and lost the old man. What I mean to say, she said, heart pounding, is that I brought some of this experimental blood substitute with me. Your men took my bag, but I have medical supplies in it, several vials of the artificial hemoglobin that I tested on Joshua. He blinked now, slowly, and when he looked at her again his eyes were tired. Somatogen. It was Kate's turn to blink. What? Somatogen said the old man, shifting slightly to find a more comfortable position. It is a biotech firm in your own city of Boulder, Colorado. You should know it. Yes. Kate's voice was weak. Oh, it is not one of my corporations. I do not even own a majority of its stock. But I, we, the more progressive members of the family, have been monitoring its research on artificial hemoglobin, you are probably aware of DNX Corporation and Alliance Pharmaceutical. They have announced their breakthroughs, although a bit prematurely, perhaps, but Somatogen will make its announcement at the 10th Annual Hambrecht and Kist Life Sciences Conference in San Francisco in January of the new year. Kate stared at the old man. He raised a white eyebrow. Do you think the family would be uninterested in such research? Do you think that all of us live in Eastern Europe and keep orphanages stocked for our needs? There came a rattling, rasping sound that might have been a cough or a laugh. No, Dr. Newman, I am aware of your miracle cure. I have tried the prototypes, and they work, after a fashion. Most of all, I am aware of the commercial applications for it. He smiled. Did you know, Dr. Newman, that the market for safe transfusions in the United States alone would be over two billion dollars a year, and that is now, while the AIDS epidemic is in its early stages? He coughed or laughed again. No, Dr. Newman, it is not the addiction of blood that is so hard to break. Kate sat back in her rough chair. Her body felt boneless, nerveless. What is it, then? The old man lifted a single finger with its long yellow nail. The addiction to power, Dr. Newman. The addiction to license. The addiction to the taste of violence without consequence. Did you bring a cure for that in your travel bag? Kate stared at him but no longer saw him. There was a long silence which she was only dimly aware of. If I stand up and run now I might make it to the door of the room— if I make it out the door, the others might not be waiting on the landing. If I make it out of the building— At that second she saw all of Romania as a giant black extension of the lightless pit she had spent the last six or seven hours in. A pit with sides too steep to climb. A pit with police and military and customs people and an air force, all following orders to find her and kill her. Beyond Romania she saw the reach of the Strigoi like a long black arm, as boneless as a tentacle, 
but with no end to its reach, and the hand on that arm had razor claws instead of fingernails. If I magically escaped with Joshua, how long would it be until I awoke in the night to find a stranger in black in my room, in my child's room? How many would they send after me? They would never stop. Never. What? Kate stopped and cleared her throat. What is going to happen to Father O'Rourke and me? The old man did not open his eyes again. His voice was vague, dreamy. Tomorrow night you will be taken to a sacred place, you and the priest. The family will be there. Young Vlad will be there. At the proper time, you and the priest will be impaled upon two stakes of gold. Then the new prince's uncle, Uncle Radu, our new leader in all things, will open your femoral artery. There was a ringing in Kate's ears, and her vision clouded with dark spots. You will feed your child first, whispered the old man, and then you will feed the family. For several minutes the old man did not appear to be breathing at all, but then the tortured rasping began again. He was asleep. Kate did not stir until the door opened. Radu Fortuna beckoned the Strigoi named Jan into the room. Her hands were bound in front of her, and she was taken immediately back to the pit in the basement of the clock tower. O'Rourke was not there. She did not see him again that night. Whatever ceremony the Strigoi held there in Sigishwara on that cold October midnight, they held it without Kate's presence or understanding. Late in the unrelieved darkness of the next morning, they came for her. Chapter 35 Kate had never been comfortable in the dark. As a child, she had used a nightlight until she was ten years old. Even as an adult, she preferred a tiny plug-in light in the bathroom or hallway, anything to lessen the darkness. The pit was absolute darkness. The single twenty-watt bulb in the basement above her must have been turned off since not even the faintest glow crept around the cracks in the trap door. Even though it was dark up there, she sensed that one of the Strigoi was up there. She could not hear him, but she felt a presence there. It was not reassuring. It seemed like hours passed, and Kate knew that sunrise must have come, but the darkness and stench and scrambling did not change. At other times she felt that time was not moving at all, that it had been only minutes since she had been returned to the pit. The next minute she would be sure that the next day had already come and gone, that Joshua had already been initiated into the clan of blood drinkers. No, it will be my blood he drinks first. I will be there. Kate dozed only once and awoke with a rat creeping across her skirt and bare legs. She did not scream, but her body rippled with revulsion in the seconds after she had flung the thing across the pit. It screamed as it hit the wall. By any sane measurement of mood, Kate knew, this should be the most despondent few hours of her life. Her realization that there could be no real escape for Joshua, O'Rourke, and her, that the Strigoi's reach was too long, their evil too powerful, should have sent her spiraling into hopelessness and despair. It did not. In those black hours in the pit, Kate found all of her external identity stripped away. Honored scholar, doctor, respected researcher, wife, former wife, lover, mother. What remained had nothing to do with identity, with who she was, but everything to do with what she was. Kate Newman was a woman who was not about to go gently into that good night. She was not about to surrender the man she loved. The realization that she loved Mike O'Rourke was like a light slowly growing brighter in the dark. Nor the child she had sworn to protect. It did not matter that the Strigoi's power was almost beyond imagining. It did not matter that she had no secret weapon left after the old man's dismissal of her miracle cure. It did not matter that no new plan had occurred to her yet there in the lightless pit. She would think of something. And if she did not think of something, she would act without thinking in the faith that the mere fact of acting would change the set of variables. So let the Strigoi do their worst. Fuck them. When they opened the trapdoor to take her away an eternity later, 
she was smiling. Kate had not wept in the pit, but the sunlight outside, as weak and watery as it was, made her eyes brim over. She could not wipe them away because her hands were still tied. The plastic binding was the same, but they had secured her arms in front of her after her interview with the old man the night before, and not so tightly as to cut off circulation this time. Jan and two smaller men, all of them wearing the kind of cheap baggy suits which seemed the hallmark of Eastern Europe, led her outside to a waiting Mercedes. A second black car sat farther down the hill. The wind was cold and from the north. Radu Fortuna was standing in the middle of the street with his arms folded, looking quite pleased with himself. Kate glanced at her watch. It was 1.40 p.m. The early afternoon offered the kind of ebbing light that warned of winter's approach. Am I really never going to see another season? Another sunrise? Are all of the experiences remaining to me to be suffered in the next twelve hours, and then nothing? Kate shook her head and pushed the thoughts away before they filled her chest with panic. She was pleased to feel that just underneath the fluttering surface of terror remained the iron core of resolve she had found in the darkness. I hope you slept. No, slept? Yes, slept well last night, beamed Radu Fortuna. Kate just stared at him. Suddenly her attention was drawn to four men walking up the cobblestone street from the direction of another stone tower beyond the grassy area. One of the men was Mike O'Rourke. Kate first saw that he was limping. Then, as the four men drew closer, she realized that he was being supported by two of the Strigoi guards. Even from thirty feet away she could see that his face was bruised, one eye was swollen shut, and his lips were puffy and discolored. O'Rourke saw her, smiled through his swollen lips, and raised his bound hands in a salute. The guards opened the rear door to a second Mercedes and began shoving the ex-priest into the car. O'Rourke's gaze never left her. Mike, she shouted, being restrained now by her own Strigoi thugs. I love you. O'Rourke was crammed in the back seat of the car, doors slammed, and the vehicle moved away, passing under the arched gateway of the old city and out of sight down the steep and narrow street. Kate did not know if O'Rourke had heard her. Radu Fortuna chuckled and nudged Jan. How very touching, laughed Fortuna. How deeply moving. Kate wheeled on him. Why did you beat him? Radu Fortuna said nothing, but Jan evidently felt he could add to the mirth of the moment. The idiot priest... He have not real leg. We do not know this. When men come last night to take him out of cell to see father, idiot priest hit Andre and Nikolai overhead with leg he take off. He try to leave. Nikolai unconscious. Andre and three others do not like and hit. Hit for a long time and... Shut up, Jan, snapped Radu Fortuna, no longer smiling. Jan shut up. So Mike also saw the old man. One of the Strigoi guards opened the back door of the idling Mercedes. Kate made a mental note that if she somehow got out of this alive, she would never buy one of these goddamn cars. Well, I wish you good trip, said Radu Fortuna, standing by the open door while one of the thugs shoved her inside. Where am I going? She was disappointed to see Jan going around the car to slide in the back seat with her. The Strigoi thug with a scar above his left eye slipped behind the wheel while the other thug stood just outside. Radu Fortuna opened his hands in a dismissive gesture. You wish to see ceremony, yes? You have, I think, come a long way for this privilege. Tonight you have privilege. He grinned at her and she saw a certain resemblance between Fortuna's gap-toothed smile and the incessant TV images of Saddam Hussein from the previous winter and spring. Both men's facial expressions did not involve their eyes. Radu Fortuna's eyes were as dead as black glass. Only the mouth muscles went through the motion of human emotions. Well, he continued, voice still brimming with humor, I think maybe we must say our goodbyes now. I will see you tonight, yes, but there will be many peoples there and you may be too busy for chit-chat. Bye-bye.
He slapped his palm on the roof of the car. The other Strigoi thug slid in next to her, so she was sandwiched between Jan and this one with his garlic breath. Radu Fortuna slammed the door, and the Mercedes glided away, drove under the arch of the wall, down the hill past homes that were old in the Middle Ages, and out of Sigishwara. They turned right onto a narrow highway. Kate looked past Jan and saw the white sign. Medyash, 36 kilometers. Sibiu, 91 kilometers. She closed her eyes and tried to remember the map she and O'Rourke had been referring to for several days. If the series of highways they had been on constituted a rough circle, ignoring the mountains and countless diversions, then she imagined traveling counterclockwise with Bucharest the starting point at the six o'clock position. Tirgavishta was not on the circumference of the circle, but just beneath the center where the hands were attached. Brashov would be at the three o'clock position, Sigishwara at the twelve, and Sibiu would be somewhere around the nine. Where was the castle on the Arjesh? Somewhere between the nine and Tirgavishta near the center. Would Sibiu be on the road to the Arjesh castle? It didn't seem likely. She and O'Rourke must have guessed wrong about Vlad Sepish's castle being important to the ceremony. Sibiu was their probable destination. How many miles until I reach the place where I will die? Less than sixty miles. Kate wiped her moist palms on her dark skirt. Suddenly her stomach growled. Jan glanced at her and did not hide his smirk. You do not like the breakfast? There had been no breakfast, no food the night before. Kate tried to remember the last thing she had eaten, and the memory of the chocolate biscuits she had shared with the women, Anna and Marina, made her dizzy with nausea. There were few other cars on the road today, and those few were almost driven off the road as the Strigoi driver honked at them and overtook them at what seemed breakneck speed for such a rough and winding road. The Mercedes slowed for nothing but animals, but even flocks of sheep were sent scurrying. Kate thought that the Transylvanian countryside that she was watching pass by so quickly must be beautiful in the summer. High green meadows, thick forests rising into areas unscarred by roads, crumbling abbeys on hilltops, the onion domes of Orthodox churches visible in tiny villages down along the river, and the colorfully dressed peasant farmers and gypsies working in fields. But even in October the weight of winter now lay on the land like a gray pall, the trees were black stripes against gray rock. The peasants walking with heads down along the highway or staring from muddy fields were gray faces in black wool, and the few villages seemed to be studies in gray stone and black wood. Both the driver and the young Strigoi to her right were smoking, and there seemed to be no ventilation in the car. She could smell the sweat and urine reek of the men, and the odor of garlic from the young one to her right seemed stronger every mile. There was no silence during the ride. The driver was talking with either Jan or the young man all the way, each of them speaking in such rapid-fire Romanian that she could not understand any of it. They all laughed a lot. Frequently she caught their glances toward her just before or after a laugh. Although the words were gibberish to her, she knew the tone and arrogance very well. It was the swaggering self-assurance of the not terribly intelligent male bully in a situation with the woman he knew he controlled. Kate had heard these same tones of conversation, seen the same leers and glances, and suffered the same laughter as a girl in the company of older boys, as a student with sexist teachers, as a young doctor with fellow interns out to prove something, and as a divorced woman on her own. She knew these sounds well. You know there will be big party tonight, said Jan, setting his huge hand on her knee. You are invite. You are a special guest. He translated for his cronies, and the smelly air was filled with their laughter. Jan's hand slid up the inside of her leg until Kate clamped her tied wrists against her thigh and stopped it. Jan said something, and the men laughed again. He removed his hand and lit a cigarette. If Kate had been sitting by one of the doors, she would have waited until the Mercedes slowed, which it did only occasionally, and then thrown herself from the car. The road here was cracked concrete or pitted asphalt, the shoulder alongside it almost non-existent, but jumping would be preferable to sitting here like a fat steer being driven to the slaughterhouse. 
but the men crowded her on either side, and she knew that she could not get the doors opened before they shoved her back in her center seat. They passed through the city of Medyash, much larger than Sigishwara. But Kate had little impression of it except for factories, more factories, littered rail yards, a terrible stench that may have come from one of the many petroleum or textile plants, and the glimpse of a single church spire, very tall, rising above the industrial towers like a black ghost from the past. Then they were in the country again and following Highway 14 towards Sibiu. She noticed a strange thing leaving Medyash. A factory shift must have let out, and there were scores, hundreds, of workers standing along the highway leaving the ugly town. Traffic was backed up along a section of the road that was unpaved, and these men, black with soot and grease, would step in front of the Dacias and other cars, wave their arms imperiously, palms down, as if they were ordering the automobiles to stop. Kate realized that it was a Romanian version of the upraised hitchhiker's thumb. The men did not try to wave down the Mercedes. Kate leaned forward and even raised her bound hand so that she could be seen, but the workers looked down and away from the black car. Some stepped back from the road almost fearfully. They left the town behind, and Kate settled back in her seat. She felt sick with hunger, thirst, and a level of fear she had never imagined. A few miles out of town, Jan set his thick fingers on her leg again. He said something to the young Strigoi to her right, and this time the laughter in the smoke-filled car was strained with a new tone. My friend, said Jan, leaning so close that Kate could see bits of food caught between his teeth, says he has never fucked an American woman. Kate said nothing. She imagined her body made of razors. Jan said something else and rubbed his hand up her leg again. When she tried to stop him, he slapped away her wrists. Jan said something to the garlic-smelling man. A moment later, this one set his left hand on her right thigh. Kate closed her eyes and tried to remember the self-defense classes she had taken at the Boulder Rec Center years before. All she could remember was the laconic comment Tom had made when she returned home from the exercises, feeling bruised but powerful. Cat, he had said, the bad news is what my daddy taught me. Namely, a good big guy can always beat the shit out of a good little guy. I'm afraid that even when you get good at all this kicking and gouging stuff, you'll always be a little guy. So carry mace. Learn to use the gun I keep in the closet. He had hugged her then. Or just stick close to me, kid. Kate opened her eyes. The driver was glancing back over his shoulder. His face was flushed. Jan pointed to a gravel road leading away from the highway to a small copse of white trees. The driver nodded and turned off the highway. A single Dacia passed them, and then the road was empty. The Mercedes suspension absorbed the ruts and bumps as they crawled their way a hundred yards to the grove of trees and an old house or barn that had once stood there. Nothing remained now but stones and the collapsed roof. Jan's fingers slid up her thighs to her crotch. He poked at her through the thin cotton of her underpants. When I count to three, I will claw his eyes. I will sink my nails in and pull his eyes from their sockets. Let it end here if it has to. She curled her fingers, feeling her unkempt nails and wishing they were longer. One. Two. As if reading her mind, Jan slapped her in the face. It had seemed a casual movement, almost languorous, but the force of the big man's hand knocked her back into the seat cushions and made her almost lose consciousness. She tasted blood in her mouth and nose. When she was fully aware of where she was and what was happening, she was stretched half across the seat. The garlic-smelling, pockmarked man had gotten out and gone around to stand behind Jan in the open door, and Jan was shoving up her skirt and pulling off her pants. Jan was half standing, half leaning in the car. His weight was on her lower legs, she had no leverage to kick, no chance to squirm away. The driver was turned fully in his seat now, his arms hanging over the leather seat back and his fingers flexing the way she had seen men's hands do at prize fights and football games. Jan snapped something at the other two and then smirked at her. I tell them we take the turns. Three times for the each of us. One time for each of your holes, yes? He reached into his coat pocket, 
removed a pair of shears, cut through the plastic that bound her wrists, and handed the shears to the driver. He said something, and Garlic Breath laughed eagerly. I tell him, translated Jan, if you struggle to cut your nose off. His wet lips curled up. But I say, he hold you down while he is to do it, so that I am not interrupted. Jan unbuttoned his pants and lowered them with a violent tug. He spit on one hand and rubbed his half-erect and uncircumcised penis vigorously, while his other hand spread her thighs apart. I am not here. This is not me. The Strigoi called Jan, leaned over and breathed in her face. I remember. You tried to kill me, bitch. Now I fuck you to death. His mouth opened wide and descended on hers. His tongue was like moist sandpaper against her closed lips. She could feel his wet member thrusting against her thighs and groin. Kate was concentrating so hard on not being there, on feeling and sensing nothing, that the sharp sound at first seemed remote, unrelated to anything. It came again, like the crack of a branch being snapped, and Kate opened her eyes. Jan pulled his mouth away. He was not quite inside her, but his face was sagging in the slack, alarmed vacuity that some men show at the second of orgasm. There was another crack, and the garlic-smelling strigoi behind Jan seemed to throw himself away from the open car door. The driver shouted something, the branch cracked again, glass shattered and sprayed, and the shears fell to the carpet near Kate's right shoulder. She reacted in less than a second, twisting, swinging her right arm over Jan's forearm, seizing the open shears and slashing up and to the left in a single movement that could not be blocked. She felt the blade slice through cheek muscle and rattle along teeth. Jan screamed and spit blood onto the black leather upholstery. All the while, his hips continued to move against her, his penis batting against her crotch. Kate shoved backward, lifted her knees, got her feet on Jan's shoulders, and shoved him out the door. She clambered backward, but the other door was locked. Jan was bellowing, staggering for balance as his lowered pants fell below his knees. The Strigoi clamped his hand to his cheek, squeezed shut the flap of sliced skin and muscle that ran from his ear to his mouth, spat blood, and said, I kill you now. No, said a voice behind him. Jan whirled. Lucian stepped into Kate's line of vision, raised a black pistol with a very long barrel, and shot Jan in the face from three feet away. Chapter 36 Lucian walked to the open door of the Mercedes, and Kate set her back against the locked door and held the shears in front of her, her thumb tight on the top of the blades. She was gasping, trying not to hyperventilate, even while her lungs demanded more air. Kate, said Lucian, lowering the long-barreled pistol and holding his hand out. Kate clenched her teeth and lifted the shears like a knife. Stay away. Don't touch me. Lucian nodded and stepped back. He reached into the grass below the car, came up with her underpants, and set them carefully on the rear seat. I'll be out here, he said softly. Kate sat watching, the shears still raised, while Lucian dragged the body of the driver out, then returned for the other two. She pulled on her pants, her body still rippling with disgust and shock, and then peered out the car door before getting out. Lucian had moved the bodies to the far side of the car, near the collapsed barn. The pistol was tucked in his belt, but there was an axe in his hands. Kate, come look at this. She leaned against the car a moment. She was shivering, and her mind refused to focus. Colors seemed to shift, and part of her still wanted to scream or weep, or both. Kate, please come look. Lucian was kneeling by the body of the driver. She approached slowly, the shears by her side. The sight of the driver lying there, still twitching, triggered some medical part of her mind, and she knelt next to the man, her fingers probing the neck for a pulse. There was none. The driver's hands and legs still twitched. I shot him in the throat and the forehead, Lucian said emotionlessly. Wouldn't you agree that he should be dead? Kate stared at the young medical student as if seeing him for the first time. Lucian touched the twitching fingers. It's the virus that refuses to die, Kate. Even now it's sealing off the wounds, 
coagulation working at an impossible rate. The virus is directing a surfeit of oxygen to the brain, even as body temperature drops to that of a corpse. Kate felt for the non-existent pulse again. She was surprised to hear her own voice. It can't send blood to the brain. His heart has stopped. Lucian nodded and set three fingers deep into the driver's solar plexus. Feel here. No. All right. But the shadow organ, the blood absorption mutation, is taking over minimal circulation chores. The virus wants to live. This man is clinically dead, Kate, but if he receives whole blood within the next 48 hours or so, the body will rebuild. There will be no brain damage, or at least minimal. This thing will be walking again if the Strigoi find him and supply the blood. Stand back. Kate stood up and moved away as Lucian spread his legs, hefted the axe, and brought it down in a single vicious arc. Blood sprayed and the driver's head was separated from his body. Oh, Jesus, said Kate and turned away. She went and leaned against the Mercedes as Lucian did the same to Jan and the younger Strigoi. Lucian had dragged the headless corpses into the tumble-down shack. Now he picked up the heads one by one, carried them to the copse of trees, and tossed them far into the weeds. He took clumps of dried grass, rubbed blood from his pant legs and boots, and walked back to the car. Kate stood rubbing her arms, the shears unnoticed in her right hand. Lucian took them away from her and threw them into the high grass. Stand right here, he said softly, moving her away from the car. He opened the door on the driver's side, brushed shattered glass from the slick leather, started the car, and drove the Mercedes under the tumbled roof of the shed. When he came out, he pulled the axe from the soft dirt where he had buried the blade, hefted it, and walked to Kate. I had to leave my car down the road and cross the field on foot. I kept the trees between me and the car. Come. He started to take her hand, but Kate pulled back. Lucian nodded and started off down the lane. Kate waited a minute and then followed. The white Dacia was much like the blue Dacia that Lucian had driven in Bucharest. It squeaked, rattled, and smoked the same, and there was no second gear. Kate settled back in the cracked vinyl seat and let Lucian drive her west and south. It was a temptation to take the Mercedes, he was saying. Everyone would have recognized it as a Strigoi car and left us alone, but it would have been too visible from the air, and everyone would remember which way we went. You followed me said Kate. It was not exactly a question. Lucian nodded. They drove me to Bucharest. I got my car, my father's target pistol, the axe, and binoculars, and drove straight back. I saw them drive the priest east. They must be going to the castle by way of Brashov and Bateshti. The castle? Words seemed strange in Kate's mouth. Her mind kept replaying the moments of the rape, the helpless feeling as he pinned her down, the sense of becoming someone and something else than herself. Vlad's castle on the Arjash River, said Lucian. It's where tonight's ceremony is. They drove the priest the west way. They were taking you via Sibiu and Kulimaneshti. It's just habit, in case they were followed. I only followed your car. He glanced at her. Kate looked him in the eye for the first time. You betrayed us. Lucian glanced back at the road where a gypsy wagon was weaving ahead of him. He honked, passed the wagon, dodged some sheep, and looked back at her. No, Kate, I never did. She clenched her fists. You were working for them. For all I know, you're still working for them. Lucian took a breath. Kate, you saw me kill those three. You said yourself that the street go I fight among themselves. She had not meant to shout. Factions! You may be with them and against them at the same time. You betrayed us, lied to us, informed on us. Lucian was nodding. I had to, to keep you both alive. The Strigoi knew you were coming. As long as I kept tabs on you, they were reassured. You're one of them, whispered Kate. You know I'm not, snapped Lucian. That's why I ran the assay test. Blood tests can be faked. Lucian pulled the Dacia to the side of the road and turned toward her. Kate, I've been fighting the Strigoi since I was a child. My adopted parents died fighting them. Adopted parents? 
Kate remembered the old poet with his elegant manners, his gracious wife. She remembered the two bloodless corpses on the slab in the medical school morgue. Lucian nodded. I was an orphan. I was adopted by them when I was four. My parents were killed because of the medical experiments they were doing on Strigoi, trying to isolate the retrovirus. Kate shook her head. Your father was a poet, not a doctor. I met him, remember? Lucian did not blink. My foster father was a poet. My foster mother was director of the State Virology Research Institute from 1965 until 1987. She was the reason I went to medical school, to learn about the Strigoi, to learn how to destroy them but to isolate the retrovirus so that it could be used. The thing in the tank, whispered Kate. Lucian nodded. Not the first. We needed to experiment to see how the Strigoi survive what should be mortal wounds. Mother worked for years to isolate the virus. Lucian turned and squeezed the steering wheel until his fingers turned white. We never had the proper equipment, access to the proper journals. He looked away out his window. A truck roared by on the highway. Kate shook her head slowly. But you worked for the Strigoi. As a... What do you call them in your James Bond movies? A double agent, a mole, a flunky who observed things that had to be observed. Kate squinted at him. Her head hurt terribly. You went to the United States, not with your parents, but as a guest of Werner Trent's Institute. Lucian was nodding with her words. And to West Germany, and once to France. I ran errands for several of the more powerful family members, the Strigoi trusted me as a messenger. They helped pay for my medical schooling so that I could work with them on the human blood substitute they were helping to research in America and elsewhere. Kate folded her arms and moved away from him. Why would they trust you? He stopped talking and looked at her for a silent moment. Because my biological parents were Strigoi, he said at last. But you said, he nodded, I am not Strigoi. That is true. Remember, Kate, it's a very rare double recessive. Most of the J-virus positive who mate have normal children. The regression is toward the norm 98% of the time. Otherwise, the world would be overrun by Strigoi. And usually, when the Strigoi have normal children, they do what normal parents in Romania do with retarded children or diseased children or malformed children. They abandon them, whispered Kate. She rubbed her temples. So your foster mother and father found you, adopted you? No, said Lucian, his voice so soft she could hardly hear him. I was taken out of the orphanage and placed with mother and father by someone who hates the family more than you or I do, by someone who had decided to act against them. I've worked for this person and for our shared goal of destroying the Strigoi family for most of my life. Who is it? said Kate. Lucian shook his head. This is the only thing I cannot tell you, Kate. I have given my word of honor never to reveal my mentor's identity. But there is no Order of the Dragon, said Kate. Lucian smiled. Only me, and the person who has sponsored me. The smile faded. And mother and father until the Strigoi destroyed them. Kate looked askance at him. Why would they trust you after they discovered your foster parents? Lucian had bitten his lip. Because I informed on them. I had to. It was just a matter of weeks until they would have been discovered. We... I had to go to the Strigoi so that I would be beyond suspicion. The stakes were too high this summer to allow everything to be destroyed at the last minute. What stakes? said Kate. You mean Joshua? You helped me adopt him, and then you helped the Strigoi steal him back. Lucian shook his head. My hope was that you would find the secret of the retrovirus before they found you. You did. Kate lost it then, flying across the seat at Lucian, pounding at his chest with her fists. They killed Tom and Julie, you lying son of a bitch. They killed them and burned my house and took my baby and... God damn it! Only when her fingers clawed toward his eyes did he restrain her wrists. Kate, he whispered, it had to be just as the death of my parents had to be. The stakes are too high. She pulled away from him and threw herself against the far door. 
What stakes? What are you talking about? Lucian put the car in gear and pulled out onto the empty highway. The destruction of the Strigoi family, he said. All of them. Tonight. The stone kilometer marker read Kopsha Mika, eight kilometers. The road wound along the Tirvana Mare River through isolated uplands with no farmhouses, no villages, and no traffic except for the occasional rubber-wheeled cart. The clouds were low, and a cold wind blew leaves across the narrow road and slammed against the Dacia like invisible fists. Tell me, demanded Kate. Lucian did not take his eyes off the road. It would be foolish, Kate. There is little chance that they will come after us today. They won't notice you're missing for several hours, and we'll be far away from here by then. Still, if we were caught... Tell me, said Kate. Her voice held an imperative that she had honed through long hours in emergency rooms, operating rooms, and conference rooms. Lucian glanced at her. Really, it would be stupid to... Tell me. Her tone left no choice in the matter. Lucian licked his lips and smoothed back his spiky haircut. It's arranged, Kate. Tonight the Strigoi family is going to die. All of them. How? Kate said flatly. Lucian shook his head but kept talking. They're gathering at the castle on the Argesh. Hoenare Citadel, it's called. The ancient keep that Vlad rebuilt more than five hundred years ago. It's been arranged. They won't survive the ceremony. How has it been arranged? Her voice showed her disbelief. The citadel has been abandoned and shunned since the days of Vlad, said Lucian. The locals still fear it. The government ignored it. The tourist bureau led the few tourists to fake castle Draculas like Bron Castle near Brashov, rather than acknowledge the real site on the Arjesh River. So, said Kate, so this ceremony has been anticipated for years. Ceausescu began reconstruction of Poinari Citadel more than three years ago. The new government has finished it, despite the economic collapse. The Strigoi demanded it. He paused and looked at her, then went on. Explosives were planted there during the reconstruction. He let out a deep breath. They're timed to go off tonight, during the ceremony. The entire mountain is wired. None of the Strigoi will leave alive. Kate folded her arms. You're lying again. He seemed startled at her attitude. No, Kate, I swear. You have to be lying. The Strigoi would never allow someone access to one of their ceremony sites like that. Also, their security people would sweep the place before the ceremony. They're cruel bastards, but they're not idiots. They were entering the valley town of Kopshamika. It was an industrial town unlike anything Kate had ever seen. The streets were black with soot, the houses were black, the people walking by were gray and black, and tall smokestacks belched out more pollution. Lucian pulled the car into a rutted area beside the railroad tracks. Kate, he said, it's true. I swear it. She stared at him. He sighed. The construction was authorized by the Strigoi family leaders, was paid for primarily by Werner Deacon Trent's foundation, and was carried out by Radu Fortuna's construction company. Kate's arms were still folded across her chest. And you're saying that Fortuna just happened to ignore your mythical bombs being planted, or is it going to be done the way they tried to kill Hitler, one Strigoi turncoat with a bomb in his briefcase? Lucian gripped her arms and then released them quickly when he felt her stiffen up. I'm sorry. Listen, Kate. Fortuna almost never visited the site. Most of the work was done by Hungarian artisans. During my summers I worked as a supervisor on the project. He stopped when he saw her look of disbelief. The Strigoi trusted me, Kate. I had been an international courier as a teenager. I was ambitious and greedy and showed loyalty only to those with the power to help me. And I had help. He stopped. Your mystery mentor, Kate said sarcastically. Yes. And the bomb was set in place while no one was looking. It's not a single bomb, Kate. The two main towers of Vlad's citadel were rebuilt, as were the main hall, the south battlements, the old approach bridge, and the east battlements, where the actual ceremony will be held tonight. They're all loaded with explosives and wired with separate timers. The entire mountaintop is coming off. 
Kate held her cold stare, but she felt her heart rate accelerate. The Strigoi security people will find it. Lucian shook his head. They've been over all of the sites a dozen times. The explosives are sealed in the actual construction. Even the timing devices have been mortared up and shut away. They haven't found anything, and they won't. There's no way to disarm it. If the Strigoi are there tonight, they'll be destroyed. With Joshua, said Kate, and O'Rourke. Lucian touched her hand. I'm sorry, Kate. I'd hoped they might bring the baby with you today, but they must be flying him down tonight in the helicopter with Radu Fortuna and the other VIPs. Kate pulled her hand away. You're lying there, Lucian. You didn't think Joshua would be in the car with me. You wouldn't have rescued us if he were. You need him there tonight, so the ceremony will proceed, so the assassination will proceed. He looked away, and she knew then that he was lying about wanting to save Joshua, but telling the truth about the explosives. Her arms and legs literally ran cold at the thought. Outside, gray shadows moved through the industrial filth of Kope Shamika. Kate? Lucian said softly, not turning to look at her. You have to understand that there have only been three of these investiture ceremonies in the past five hundred years. There will never be a better time. The entire family will be there, all the Strigoi who are important enough to count. Kate nodded. And my baby and an ex-priest who never hurt anyone are a small price to pay for that chance to assassinate them. Lucian wheeled and his eyes were wide. Yes! A hundred babies and a hundred priests are a small price. He took her by the shoulders and shook her. Do you realize how many centuries my people have been enslaved by these monsters, Kate? Do you know how many babies and priests and ordinary people have died horribly because of their cruelty? Can you imagine a nation which has never taken a breath outside the shadow of totalitarian madness? His voice was shaking. His entire body was shaking. Lucian let go of her arms and put the car in gear. It doesn't matter what you think, Kate. It will happen tonight. I'm sorry about Joshua. I truly am. And O'Rourke. They will be martyrs just as my adoptive parents were. He drove slowly down the highway through the black city. Where are we going? She said dully. We'll change to Highway 14B here in Kopshamika, he said. Then north on East 81 to Cluj-Napoca by nightfall, and then west to Aradia and the Hungarian border. How will we get across? Lucian smiled. I have ways better than your gypsy smugglers. We'll be in Budapest by tomorrow night. And Joshua will be dead. He looked at her. Yes. Would you rather he be a full-fledged Trigoy? He'll drink human blood tonight, Kate but it will not turn him into one of them. It will all end tonight. She leaned across and seized the steering wheel. Startled, Lucian pulled into an empty market area near the factory gates. No one was in the broad cinder block area. The road west went on to the right. The road south to Cebu and the citadel branched left just behind them. The sky rained black snow on everything. You know that Joshua can be saved from that, she said. With transfusions of the human blood substitute, his immune deficiency disease can be alleviated, but the shadow organ never has to be involved. He won't build a dependency on human blood, human life. The artificial hemoglobin will be like insulin to him, nothing more. His body could give us the cure for cancer, for AIDS, and he never has to be Strigoi. Lucian touched her cheek. It's too late, Kate. She swooned then allowing her eyes to slide up under her fluttering lids and sliding off the vinyl seat against the door. Kate! Lucian leaned across and lifted her lolling head. Kate slipped the target pistol out of his belt and set the muzzle against his chest. Sit back, Lucian. Kate, for Christ's sake! Sit back, she snapped. He did so, setting his hands on the steering wheel. You're not going to shoot me. She waited until he looked at her so that he could see her eyes. I won't kill you, Lucian, but I will shoot you, in the leg, away from the femoral artery, but smashing a major bone, so you won't come after me. Come after you? To where? I'm going to get Joshua. Lucian laughed. It was a thin sound. Kate, 
let me explain something to you, all right? She said nothing. It's not just the explosives or the usual Strigoi security, he said into the silence. This is the important night. Strigoi from all over the world who were not at the first three nights will be there tonight. It's like Easter to ardent Christians. There will be at least five hundred people up there. All of them will have brought their own guards. Kate held the pistol steady. Lucian ran his hand through his hair again. Kate, we couldn't even get there. There is only one road to the citadel on the Argesh. It's Highway 7C, and it makes this lousy road look like one of your American interstates by comparison. Highway 7C is closed in the Fugarash Mountains to the north of the castle because of early snows and rock slides. It's only open in late June to early August, and even then you risk your life on that road. Even the Strigoi are flying or taking the highway through Bashov or Sibiu. Kate's finger was on the trigger. Lucian held both hands in front of him, asking for time with his palms. To the north of the citadel the road is closed, and there are hundreds of troops stationed there because of the big hydroelectric project on the Argesh River above the castle. The Strigoi have to get there, said Kate. Lucian nodded. They'll drive up from Bucharest and Rimniku Velcha, yes, but the highway will be closed miles below the citadel. There will be roadblocks and security checks from the town of Kirtia de Argesh on. No one who is not Strigoi could get through. How close could I get before the roadblocks? asked Kate. Lucian shrugged. How the hell do I know? The village of Kupatsianeni is only four or five kilometers below the castle. If I get that far, said Kate, I could walk the last couple of miles. Scusatsi, ma, damnu politist, putatsi sami aratatsi cum sa ayung poenari citadel, said Lucian in a falsetto. Muduk la plimbare. What? said Kate. What about the citadel? Nothing, said Lucian. I'm just imagining you asking directions and telling the Strigoi guards that you're just going for a walk. He shook his head slowly. You couldn't get to the Citadel, Kate. If you did, they'd just take you and make you part of their fucking sacrament. There's no way you could get the baby away. Kate did not lower the pistol. Perhaps it would be worth it just to make sure that they did not turn him into a full-fledged Strigoi. He frowned at her. You mean kill the child before they make him drink? But why, Kate? The ceremony starts a little before midnight. The Strigoi are a prompt race. The investiture ceremony is scheduled to take about an hour and a half. The explosives go off at 12.25. Chances are that they will not have gotten to the so-called sacrament part of the ceremony before... before it happens. Kate nodded her understanding. Get out of the car, Lucian. I don't know who to trust or what to believe any more, but I know that I'm grateful for what you did an hour ago. He, they, her hand started to shake and she steadied it on her knee. The muzzle of the pistol was still pointed at Lucian's chest. If you promise not to come after me, I'll just leave you here. You go on to Hungary. Lucian opened the door and stepped out. The road was empty except for a gypsy wagon rumbling by. The sway-backed black horse pulling the black wagon may have been any color under the soot that coated him. The children's faces staring out from under the dark gray canvas were streaked with sooty rivulets where tears had muddied the grime on their cheeks. Their hands were black. Kate, said Lucian, his voice sad, why? Don't worry. You said yourself that when they catch me they'll just make me part of their ceremony. They won't take time to interrogate me. At any rate, I could stand anything until... When? Twelve-twenty-five? Lucian gripped the top of the car door. But why? Kate lowered the pistol. I don't know. I just know that I'm not leaving Joshua or O'Rourke there. Goodbye, Lucian. She slid over, closed the door, put the car in gear, and made a U-turn on the empty highway to head back to the intersection where Highway 14 ran south to Sibiu. The windshield was already so dusted with the rubber ash and soot in the air that she had to turn on the windshield wipers. They clawed back and forth with the sound of fingernails on glass. 
Lucian had jogged across the street while she was making the turn. Now he put both hands out the way she had seen hitchhikers do in Medyash. He switched to an upraised thumb as she came up to the sooty stop sign. Thanks, babe, he said as he slid into the passenger seat. I thought I'd never get a ride. Kate held the pistol in her lap. Don't try to stop me, Lucian. He held up three fingers. I won't, I swear. Scout's honor. Then why? He shrugged and settled back in the tattered seat, his knees high. Hey, Kate, did you know that before we shot Chao Shescu, we tried to electrocute him? Kate started to speak and then realized that this was one of Lucian's dumb jokes. No, she said. I didn't know that. Yeah, said Lucian. But even though we pulled the switch a dozen times, the electricity never hurt him. Afterward, while the firing squad was hunting for bullets, we asked him why the electricity didn't work. You know what he said? No. Lutzatok, mindig is rossis visetso voltam. Kate waited. He said, You see, I always was a bad leader, conductor. Get it? Vizetso means leader, but also like semiconductor. Get it? Kate shook her head. You don't have to go with me on this, Lucian. He spread his fingers and settled lower in the seat. Hey, why not? It's easier to follow. I always was a lousy Vizetso. Kate turned right onto Highway 14. Black letters were just visible on a gray sooted sign. Sibiu, 43 kilometers. Rimniku Vilcha, 150 kilometers. Once out of the smoke and soot of Kopsha Mika, Kate turned off the wipers but had to turn on the lights. Despite the early hour, it was getting dark. Dreams of Blood and Iron If there is any fate more ignominious than to be a patriarch without power in the grip of one's own family, I do not wish to imagine it. Events proceed, although it is apparent that my final act for the family shall be styled as mere ceremonial pawn in the power machinations of Radu Fortuna. Radu. I think of my brother Radu, the boy with the long lashes who became the beloved of more than one sultan, the boy who grew up to wrestle the throne from me through treachery and guile. The people called him Radu the Handsome and welcomed his soft ways after my stern years as their liege lord. The idiots. I knew Radu as the brainless, spineless little sodomite he was. Sultan Mehmed had no difficulty controlling Wallachia and Transylvania with Radu as his puppet. God knows that the Sultan had had his hand up this particular puppet enough times. I, Vladislav Dragvala, had beaten the Turks more decisively than any Christian ruler in history, had sent the Sultan cowering back to Constantinople, and had won the liberty of my people. But my people deserted me. The Sultan had left his play-toy, Radu, in Wallachia to woo my boyars away from me, to undermine their liege oaths. At this, Radu was successful in the dark closets of diplomacy where he and the Sultan had failed on the daylight battlefields, now that I had vouchsafed the freedom of the seven cities through the spilling of my own blood, the boyars of these German strongholds turned against me and made secret pact with the serpent Radu. By midsummer of 1462, my position had become, as the politicians now phrase it, untenable. I had beaten the Turks everywhere I had found them, but behind me my army had melted away like sugar in the mouth of a child. I took my few and most loyal boyars, my fiercest and best-trained troops, and fled. I fled to my castle keep on the Arjesh River. Here is the folk legend that tells of my final hours at Castle Dracula. The Turks were approaching by night, setting up their cannonades on the high fields near the village of Poenari on the bluffs across the Arjesh. In the morning they would storm my citadel. Then, as the folk tales have it, a certain relative of mine who had been taken by the Turks years before, remembering my many kindnesses to him and his love of family, climbed to a high spot and fired a warning arrow through the only lighted window in my tower. Legend has it that the arrow was so well aimed that it snuffed the candle by which my concubine was reading. She was alone in the room, goes the tale. 
When she read the appended warning of the Turkish attack, she woke me, told me in hysterical tones that she would rather have her body eaten by the fish in the Arjesh than be touched by the Turks, and then threw herself from the battlements to the river a thousand feet below. To this day, the river there is known as Rul Domnai, the princess's river, in tribute to this tale, this false tale. In truth, there was no relative, no warning arrow, and no selfless suicide. Here is the truth. We had watched from the citadel for two days as Radu and the Turks advanced to Ponari and to the bluffs beyond. For another two days we had suffered their cannonade, although their cherrywood guns did little damage. I had ordered the towers rebuilt with too many layers of brick and stone to fall to such a minor pounding. Still, we knew that on the morrow Radu's cavalry would cross the Arjesh and swing up the valley to the hills behind the keep, while the Turkish foot-soldiers, stupid and stolid as ambulatory tree-trunks, would die by the hundreds while ascending the cliffs to the citadel walls. But they would win. Our forces were too small, the keep too isolated on its crag to allow any eventual outcome except the defeat of Lord Dracula. That night I was deep in preparations for my escape when my concubine, Voika by name, demanded my time to have an argument. Women have no sense of timing. When they wish to argue, they must argue, and it does not matter what events of real importance are taking place. Voika and I walked the darkened battlements while she went on in a tearful voice. The issue was not the attacking Turks nor the threat of my treacherous brother Radu, but the future of our sons, Vlad and Menea. I should say here that I loved Voika, at least as much as it is possible for a leader of men and nations to love a woman. She was small, dark of eye and skin, but usually light of heart, and she did my bidding in all things, until this night. Of our two boys, Minea had been born normal enough, but his one-year-old younger sibling, Vlad, had the wasting sickness that had plagued my father and me. Vlad had received the secret sacrament only days before. His health shone now in his eyes, and I knew that the boy would be like his father in requiring the sacrament throughout his life. It was on this night, of all nights, that Voika chose to protest that our child would be brought up this way. I pointed out that neither the babe nor I had a choice in the matter. If he were to survive, he would have to drink. This upset Voika. Her mother had been a secret drinker. Indeed, her mother had been tried and destroyed as a witch, and I first met Voika when she was brought before my court to face a similar fate. But Voika had never tasted the sacrament. Instead of ordering her burned or impaled, I took her into my palace, gave her my affection, and allowed her to bear my children. And now she thanked me by striding the battlements on the very night the campfires of Radu and the Turks were visible across the Black River Valley, and demanding that young Vlad be allowed to grow up without the sacrament. She called it blasphemy. She called it witchcraft. She called me Strigoi, like her mother. I reasoned with her for several minutes, but the hour was drawing near when we would have to leave. I pronounced the conversation finished. Voika had always been an overly emotional and dramatic woman. It was probably that as much as her mother's habit of drinking the blood of corpses which had brought Voika to my court in chains. Now she surrendered to her sense of drama and leapt to the parapet, threatening to throw herself and our two babes in her arms into the void below if I did not give in to her wishes. Tired of her histrionics, in a press to leave before the moon rose, I jumped to the top of the low wall and wrestled the children away from her. She lost her balance then. For a second I thought it was part of her melodrama, but then I saw the true terror in her face, and, shifting Vlad to the arm which held Minea, I held out my hand to steady her. Our fingertips touched. She fell backward without a sound, disappearing into the darkness of the chasm like a mermaid diving to greater depths. One of her slippers remained behind on the wet stone. I kept that slipper for three centuries, losing it only when I had to flee a burning building in Paris during a minor revolution. I took the children that night and left everyone else in the castle behind. Their loyalty meant nothing to me. They meant nothing to me. One of the reasons I had chosen Ponare Citadel for my own was that it was built atop two faults in the rock which led down more than a thousand feet to the cave which held the underground river. 
The first vault was only ten inches wide, but it served as a well for fresh water even during siege. The second vault was, with a little help from artisans who died with the boyars who rebuilt Castle Dracula on that long-ago Easter Sunday in 1456, large enough for a man to descend, hanging on to iron cables and rungs as he did so. Below, in the secret cave that ran out to the Arjesh more than a mile above the Citadel Hill, the seven Dobrin brothers were waiting with horses shod backward to confuse those who would track us. The Dobrins took me up the trackless valley, then led me across secret passes and dangerous snowfields of the Fugarash peaks to the north. If it had not been midsummer, even that retreat into Transylvania would have been closed off. When I descended into Transylvania proper in the mountain wilds south of Brashov, I called for a rabbit-skin parchment and deeded all the land north and west, as far as our eyes could see, to the stolid Dobran brothers. None of the rulers who followed me in Wallachia, Transylvania, and now Romania have defied that order. Even Ceausescu, with his collectivization and systematization frenzy, left this one parcel of private land untouched by his socialist madness. That is the true story, although I cannot imagine that anyone cares, not even the family, who have forgotten to honor and obey their patriarch, even though most of them are the descendants of the young Vlad I saved from death that night. My half-dream state is broken by the sound of arriving family members. In a moment they will come up the stairs to bathe me and dress me in fine linen vestments and drape the chain of the Order of the Dragon around my neck. One final ceremony. One final act as patriarch. Chapter 37 Kate and Lucian drove through Sibiu in the failing light, Sibiu where medieval lanes opened onto cobblestone squares surrounded by homes and buildings with sleepy-eyed rooftop windows. They drove down the Alt River Valley as the late afternoon glow faded to gray twilight. The highway wound along the river between steep canyon walls. One minute the road would be broad, smoothly asphalted, with a gravel shoulder, and the next they would be bouncing through a mile of muddy ruts where some roadwork had been started and abandoned months or even years before. They skirted the industrial town of Rimniku Vilce. The Dacia needed petrol, and the only gas station they passed had a line at least an hour long. Lucian said that he knew a black market gas depot on the east edge of town, and they stopped to change drivers. Few Romanian women drove cars, if they were important enough to travel by car, they tended to be chauffeured. Lucian slid behind the wheel, left the highway just beyond the city limits, and bought five liter bottles of petrol out of the back of a lorry parked near an old tunnel. Later, Kate was to think of how the simple act of changing drivers sealed their respective fates. Just beyond Rimniku Vilcha, on the road leading southeast to Petesti, Lucian turned left onto tiny Highway 73C and followed it through a few dimly lighted villages into the darkness of the Carpathians. They encountered the first roadblock fifteen kilometers farther on, right where the road diverged in a village named Tigveni toward either Kurtia de Arjesh to the east or Suichi to the north. Shit, said Lucian. They had just topped the rise coming out of the village when he saw the lights, the military vehicles, and two black Mercedes stopped at the checkpoint. Lucian doused the Dacia's already weak lights, made a U-turn, and drove back into the village, turning down a dark side street that was little more than an alley. Tigveni may have held a hundred people in its eight or ten homes, but tonight, even though it was not yet eight p.m., the town was dark and silent. What now? whispered Kate, knowing that it was silly to whisper, but doing so anyway. The target pistol was in the low console between their two front seats. Lucian's face was just visible. It's another fourteen kilometers to the town of Kurtia de Argesh, he said. Then twenty-three kilometers north up the valley to the citadel. More than twenty miles, whispered Kate. We can't walk from here. Lucian rubbed his cheek. When I worked on the Citadel, I had to drive to Rimniku Vilcha regularly to pick up materials and workers. Occasionally the bridge outside of town here would be washed out by storms. He slapped the steering wheel. Hang on, babe. With the headlights still out, 
Lucian bumped the Dacia down a rutted side street, across what appeared to be a meadow, and then settled into two ruts that ran along a river. Kate heard frogs and insects from the darkness under the trees, and for a moment she could imagine that summer was coming rather than dying. The Dacia halted under the trees on a wide stretch of gravel alongside the river, and Lucian killed the engine. Two hundred meters to their left, the spotlights of the military roadblock lit the night. They're stopping cars at the one-lane bridge, whispered Lucian. As they watched, another limousine approached the roadblock, flashlights flicked on, and Kate could see the gleam of the soldiers' helmets as they stepped up to the car, checked it, and then saluted and let it pass. We should have taken the Mercedes, she whispered. Lucian grinned. Yeah, we look so strigoi, don't we? Did you bring your identity papers? Kate glanced at her watch. Four hours to go twenty miles. What next? Lucian pointed at the river. It was at least a hundred feet wide here, but it looked shallow. Reflected light from the distant searchlights gleamed on numerous ripples. We'll never cross here without them seeing us or hearing us, hissed Kate. Isn't there another place? Farther from the road? Lucian shrugged. I don't know of any. This is where the locals used to reroute traffic when the bridge was out. He looked to his left. Hear their music? Somebody in one of the trucks has a radio going. Yes, but all they have to do is look this way. Lucian cranked his window down and leaned out. The trees overhang here for most of the way. It's dark near the banks. He turned and looked at Kate. Your call, Kate. She hesitated only a second. Go. Lucian started the car. The four-cylinder motor sounded like a jet engine to Kate. Lucian put the car in first and edged out into the river. Within seconds, the water was up to the car's hubcaps, then to the bottom of their doors, then rising along the fender. The Dacia rocked and bumped. We're shipping water, whispered Kate, lifting her feet from the dribbling floorboards. Lucian kept one hand on the wheel and one on the stick shift and jostled them forward. Suddenly, the right front wheel dipped, something smacked the bottom of the car hard, and the engine stalled. They sat there in the middle of the river, the current lapping halfway to the windows, and tried not to breathe too loudly. The music from the two military trucks was a loud gypsy beat. Lucian pulled the choke out and set his hand on the ignition keys. No! Kate said aloud and stopped his hand just as he was turning the keys. A limousine had glided up to the roadblock. The music stopped. In the sudden silence, they could hear the questions of the three soldiers and even soft replies from the car. The beam from one of the bright searchlights atop the truck jostled, lost its focus on the Mercedes, and stabbed out onto the river. A moment later, the limousine rolled on, the searchlights were aimed lower, and the music started up again. Lucian turned the ignition key. Please, God, prayed Kate to a God she had never really believed in. Don't let the coil or the spark plugs or the other things Tom used to try to explain to me be wet or broken. Amen. The Dacia started. Lucian rocked it carefully forward and back, freed the wheel from the hole, and drove on to the opposite bank. Kate felt her skin and muscles beginning to unclench when they were half a mile down the rutted lane and out of sight of the roadblock because of thick trees and the hill. She had not known that one's body physically awaits the impact of bullets. Okay, breathed Lucian as he bounced the Dacia back onto the narrow highway. I don't know what the fuck we'll do when we get to Kirtia de Argesh, but hey, the name of the game is Improvise, right? They bypassed Kirtia de Argesh and two roadblocks they could see in the distance by driving north up the railroad line that ran along the west side of the Argesh River. O'Rourke's idea, said Kate. They had a flat which Kate helped change by the light of the few stars now shining between high clouds. The spare was so patched and so threadbare that she could not imagine it getting them much farther. There isn't much farther to go, she assured herself. Fifteen kilometers. This tire will make it. If you're not planning on coming back, another part of her mind answered. A kilometer farther and the rail line diverged west through tunnels into the Fugarash Mountains. Kate went out on foot until she found two overgrown ruts in the darkness 
and they bounced east down the old access road until they reached a two-plank bridge over the river and Highway 7C that ran past the citadel. Lucian got out of the car and Kate joined him. The highway was quiet here, but they had seen traffic earlier. To the east and west, foothills rose to mountains lost in the night and clouds. To the north, the valley visibly narrowed until it made Kate think of a narrowly opened door into darkness. Lucian pointed toward an orange glow against the clouds low above the peaks ahead. They have the ceremony site lit up already. He glanced at his watch. It's 10.15. Time sure flies when you're having fun. Kate felt like pounding her fists on the car roof. Instead, she touched Lucian's arm. We can't keep creeping along like this. How do we get there quickly? He grinned at her. What do you say we just drive? Maybe they don't have any roadblocks this close. How close are we? He looked toward the black doorway in the mountains. Three miles, four. Kate stepped out onto the highway. I don't see any spotlights like at the other roadblocks. Lucian nodded. Maybe we're past them all. Maybe there's nothing between us and the citadel but valet parking for the Strigoi. Kate tried to smile but found that she was on the verge of crying instead. She walked over to Lucian and put her arms around him. What, babe? he whispered. She shook her head, feeling how soft his cheek was. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you for stopping him today. Her throat was too tight for her to say more. Lucian patted her awkwardly on the back. Kate smiled through incipient tears at the thought of how young he was, how filled with energy. She kissed him on the cheek and stepped back. Okay, let's go find that valet parking. There was a roadblock less than two miles ahead. No searchlights or military trucks here. Two black Strigoi vans pulled out from the woods behind them while a black Mercedes and some sort of armored vehicle became visible around a bend in the road ahead. Lucian hit the brakes and the Dacia wallowed to a stop between the two barriers. Damn, he whispered. There were no back lanes here, no friendly railroad grades, no obvious ways out. The Strigoi had set this trap well. The sides of the road dropped steeply six or eight feet on each side, the river ran by beyond the ditch to their left, and the canyon wall was to their right. Searchlights snapped on from the armored car, and the grimy windshield of the Dacia became opaque with white light. Kate blinked and shielded her eyes, but the intensity of the glare was like a physical assault. Someone hailed them with a bullhorn. They want us to drive slowly to them, whispered Lucian. He was grinning broadly and waving at the unseen figures behind the spotlight. They want us to keep our hands in sight. Kate lifted her hands to the dash. Lucian kept both of his on top of the steering wheel. He put the car in gear and began edging slowly toward the Mercedes and armored car a hundred feet ahead. The bullhorn barked in Romanian again. They want us to stop and get out of the car, said Lucian. He stopped. I don't really want to stop and talk to these guys, do you? No, said Kate. Shall we go for it? Lucian was grinning in all sincerity now. Go for it, said Kate. Her heart was pounding so fiercely that her chest ached. The white light filled the world. Okay, babe. He shifted his right hand, touched her hand, and then slammed the car into gear while flooring the accelerator. The day she lurched, almost stalled, and then whined into motion. The bullhorn barked again. Lucian smiled and waved. Maybe they recognize him, was Kate's thought. Then the shooting began. Lucian jerked the car to the right as if they were going to try to get behind the armored car. The searchlight lost them for a second. Kate saw the slightest gap between Mercedes and armored vehicle the same instant Lucian shifted to third gear and aimed for it, and then the windshield disappeared in a thousand flakes. Kate covered her eyes. Bullets pounded across the hood, roof, and fenders. There was a terrific impact that slammed her against the door, and then Lucian was steering hard to keep them on the road. He turned the headlights on to show empty highway ahead, and then the blazing white light was back in their rearview mirror and rear window. That window exploded inward. Kate felt something tug at her left heel and something else pass between her upraised arm and her ribs. 
and then they were around the bend in the road and accelerating again, weaving wildly as they did so. We made it! screamed Kate, not believing it even as she shouted. She knew that most of the exhilaration she felt was a pure adrenaline high, but she did not care. Lucian grunted something and fought the wheel. The spare on the right front wheel gave way then with a pop louder than the gunfire had been. The Dacia slewed right, Lucian fought it left, and then they were sideways and flipping down the road. Kate threw her arms over her head, felt her knees bang the underside of the dash, and then she was watching through the broken windshield as the road, sky, road, and sky alternated past. The Dacia rolled a final time, came to a stop on its wheels, and then slid sideways down a thirty-foot bank into the river. The old car did not go fully into the water, but stopped upside down and wedged between a boulder and a tree, with the hood under water and the left wheel spinning. The right wheel was only tattered rubber on a twisted rim. Kate realized that she was seeing all this from outside the car, and she sat up, braced herself on a rock the size of her head, and looked at the Dacia upside down, its headlights under the water. Lucian! She ran to the other side of the vehicle, found him half-pinned under the driver's seat that had come out of its brackets and fallen on him, and, ignoring every rule she had learned as an emergency room intern, pulled him from the wreckage. There was no sound of pursuit yet from the highway above them. Lucian, she whispered, dragging him to the shelter of trees downstream. We made it. We got past them. Yeah, he grunted. She laid him against the roots of the largest tree and scrambled back to the wreckage, feeling around for the pistol. She could not find it, but she came up with the binoculars that had been in the back seat. She put the leather strap around her neck and waded back to Lucian, listening hard. Still no sound of the vehicles. Lucian was sitting up and was inhaling deeply as if to catch his breath after having the wind knocked out of him. She knelt next to him. I think I'm all right. My God, what a mess! Are you all right, Lucian? His face was very white in the dim light. He steadied himself with one hand against the tree. Not really, he said. I think I'm going to lie down a minute. She heard the armored car shifting gears and moving down the road toward them. A spotlight stabbed into the water two hundred yards away. No, come on, we have to get across the river and into the woods there, she hissed in his ear. Come on, Lucian. She lifted him to a sitting position and pulled her hands away, thick with something. Just rest a minute, he muttered. Amo durere aici, Kate. Ah, uh, I mean, I have a pain right here. Maduare pieptu. He touched his chest. Kate pulled him forward and ripped away the tatters of his shirt. As far as she could tell in the darkness, there were four large entry wounds high on his back, two near or above the spine, and another entry wound low and to the right. She felt his chest and stomach, but found only one exit wound. It was very large and hemorrhaging badly. Ah, Lucian, she whispered and used his tattered shirt as a compression bandage. Ah, Lucian. Tired, whispered Lucian. Masimt obosit. We'll rest here, she whispered, cradling him and stroking his brow with her free hand. She felt him nod against her. The armored car was almost above them now. She smelled the diesel stink of its exhaust. Babe, whispered Lucian, his voice urgent, I forgot to tell you something. It's all right, crooned Kate, holding the crude bandage in place. The bundle was soaked with his blood and she could hear the bubbling. It was what they had called a sucking chest wound in the emergency room. Only the most immediate and extensive care could save someone with a sucking chest wound. It's all right, she whispered, rocking him. Good, said Lucian in a relieved voice, and died. She felt him go. She felt the energy and consciousness and spark go out of him like air from a ripped balloon. If she had been religious, she would have thought that she felt his soul leave him. Kate knew CPR. She knew mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. She knew a dozen high-tech resuscitation techniques 
and a dozen basic ones. She knew that none of them would help Lucian now. She set her fingers on his eyelids, closed them, kissed them, and lowered him gently to the moss of the riverbank. The armored car was chugging back and forth along the highway like some smelly dragon. Another vehicle had joined it, and there were shouts back and forth. The searchlight swept the river thirty yards below, then twenty yards above where she crouched. Kate realized that the smashed Dacia was under a slight overhang of a boulder here, and that they must have left a trail of tattered rubber and smashed metal for two hundred feet down the highway, but evidently no major sign of where they went off the road. It would not take them long. The searchlight was sweeping in a frenzied arc now, and more voices were shouting up and down the highway. Kate touched Lucian's cooling hand a final time and moved away along the river bank, staying under the trees, freezing when footsteps pounded or searchlights stabbed through the bare branches. Two hundred yards upstream she stopped, gasping, and then pushed out into the water. The river was only four or five feet deep here, but it was very fast and very, very cold. Kate gasped and kept waiting, her shoes sliding across smooth rocks on the river bottom. There were shouts from downstream, and searchlights converged on the wreck of the Dacia. If Kate slipped now, the current would take her downstream to the light in seconds. She did not slip. By the time she reached the far side of the river, her legs were numb and her teeth were chattering uncontrollably. She ignored it and clawed toward the shallows. More searchlights flicked across the river now. One slid over her just as she pulled herself from the water. It moved back immediately as if feeling for her, but she was crawling through the high reeds and mud toward the trees. There was an infinity of forest on this side of the water, stretching a half a mile or more between the river and the black hills. All dark. No roads here. No lights. The sound of shots came across the water. They were shooting at her. Kate ignored it, stood, and staggered into the woods. There was just enough starlight there for her to check her watch. It was still working. It was 10.27. She could see lights far up the canyon, but the citadel was still two or three miles away, according to Lucian. Staying deep within the protective screen of trees, Kate turned north and began walking. Chapter 38 It took Kate an hour to walk to the lights, and the lights were only another village, not the citadel itself. She stayed in the trees, looked across the river at the tiny village busy with military traffic, police, and spotlighted roadblocks, and thought, Lucian mentioned this place, Kubitsineni. The citadel should be less than a mile north. But the river twisted under a bridge beyond the village, the highway ran along the west side of the river beyond that point, and the surrounding bluffs hid the citadel from sight. Kate could see an orange glow against the low clouds, but it seemed impossibly distant, impossibly high. She glanced at her watch, 1134. She would never travel that mile and climb that mountain in time. Lucian had said that there were steps switchbacking up the mountain crag to the citadel, 1,400 steps. Kate tried to convert that to feet and height. A thousand feet above the river? At least. Exhausted, she leaned against a tree and concentrated on not weeping. There was a shuffling, snorting sound to her left, and Kate froze, then crouched with her fists clenched. She had no weapon, only the old binoculars strung around her neck. The sound came again, and Kate slipped forward through the trees. In a meadow between the river and the forested hillside, a single gypsy wagon sat alone. A small campfire had burned down to embers. Beyond the wagon, a white horse cropped the dry grass. It was a huge horse with hooves as big as Kate's head. It lifted its head, made a woofing noise like a sneeze, and began grazing again. The sound of its massive teeth crunching grass was very clear in the cold night air. There was no other sound. Yes, thought Kate. She circled around through the trees, staying low and setting her feet with care. Occasionally bullhorn sounds or the sound of shouts would drift across the river from the village. Once Kate froze into immobility as a black helicopter roared down the canyon just above the river, going from south to north. Then the machine was out of sight around the bluff, and Kate began stalking the horse again. 
Her heart pounded as she moved out of the shelter of the trees and slid through the high grass. The white horse raised its head and watched her with curious eyes. Shh, Kate whispered uselessly as she came up next to the horse, keeping it between the quiet gypsy wagon and herself. Shh. She patted its neck and noticed that its rope halter was tied to a longer rope staked down eight or ten feet closer to the wagon. Shit, she breathed to herself. The stake had been driven deep. Kate crouched, could not free it, shifted her position, put her back into it, and pulled the long peg free. The horse moved away slightly, eyes wide at her exertions. Kate coiled the rope and hurried to the animal, patting its neck and whispering reassurances. A hand fell on Kate's shoulder while a knife blade came around to her throat. A cracked voice whispered something in a language neither Romanian nor English. Kate blinked as the blade moved away. She turned. The gypsy woman may have been Kate's age, but she looked twenty years older. Even in the dim light Kate could see the wrinkles, the sagging cheeks, and the missing teeth. She and the woman were dressed alike in black skirt and dark sweater. The knife the woman held was barely larger than a dagger, but it had felt very sharp against Kate's neck. "'You, American woman?' said the gypsy. Her voice seemed far too loud to Kate. Trucks moved toward the highway bridge behind her. "'You come in Romania with Voyevod Chauba?' Kate felt her knees go weak. "'Yes,' she whispered back. "'Come with Priyo? Priest?' Kate nodded. The woman grabbed Kate's sweater, bunched it in her strong fist, shoved Kate backward in the grass, and brought the knife up to Kate's face. "'You mother of Strigoi!' The last word was a hiss. Kate moved her head slowly back and forth an inch from the tip of the knife. "'I hate the Strigoi. I came to destroy them.' The woman squinted at her. "'They took my baby,' whispered Kate. The gypsy blinked. The knife did not move. Strigoi take many gypsy babies, many hundreds of Ani, years. They take gypsy babies to drink. Now they take gypsy babies to sell to Americans. Kate had nothing to say to that. The woman moved the knife away and knelt in the grass. The horse continued to graze nearby, ignoring them. I come here because entire families of Romani brought here this week. Soldiers have in soldier place near Dam. My husband and daughter are there, I with sister in Hungary. Soldiers will not let people up road here. I think Strigoi will be using Romani tonight. Yes? Kate thought about the ceremony. She and O'Rourke were to provide what Radu Fortuna had called the sacrament, their blood, for Joshua and the Strigoi VIPs. What was to feed the hundreds of Strigoi guests? Yes, said Kate. I think the Strigoi will kill them tonight. The gypsy woman clenched her fists. You do something? Kate took a breath. Yes. You kill them somehow? American smart bomb like with Saddam Hussein? Kate did not smile. Yes. The gypsy woman looked skeptical but got to her feet and helped Kate up. Good. You want horse? Kate chewed her lip and looked at the highway. Military trucks and police vehicles moved back and forth in regular patrols. The hillside on this side of the river was wooded, but too steep to ride a horse on. On the other side of the road, the river stretched to the shale cliffs on the opposite shore. I have to try to get up there to the citadel. The gypsy woman shook her head. Not road. She pointed to the forest behind her. Old trail there. Almost gone. Go back to days of Lad Shepish. The woman stopped, spat, and warded off the evil eye with two fingers raised toward the glow to the north. She walked over to the horse, said something sharp to it, set the dagger in the belt of her skirt, and cupped her hands in what Kate realized was an invitation to mount the animal. Kate did so, although not gracefully. She rode sometimes in Colorado, but never on a horse this large. Her bruised thighs ached just straddling its back. Come, said the woman, and lifted the coiled rope to lead the horse toward the forest. Kate looked at her watch. 
It was 11.46. There seemed to be no trail, but the woman led the horse through the trees, and the horse seemed to know where he was going. Kate had to hunker over and cling to the animal's neck at times to avoid being swept off by branches. The road, if the vaguest hint of trail between the trees could be called a road, cut behind the bluff and rose steeply above the valley floor. Kate realized that the highway below wound a mile or so along the river to the citadel, but this way would shorten that distance by at least half. Two-thirds of the way up the mountain, the woman took out her dagger, cut the rope, handed the short end to Kate, and said, I go down now. Go to dam near Bile Lock. If my man and daughter not freed, I join them. She hesitated a second and handed Kate the short knife. Kate stuck it in her belt, feeling the absurdity of her little dagger against several hundred Strigoi and their armies. The gypsy woman paused and lifted a weathered hand. Kate clasped it in a palm-over-palm -palm handshake, and then the gypsy woman was gone with only the slightest rustle of her black skirt. Kate gripped the short rope in one hand, wound some mane around her other hand, bent low over the horse's neck, dug her heels in the animal's side, and whispered, Go! Please go! The huge beast continued lumbering up a trail that Kate could not even see. It was one minute before midnight when they came out of the forest along the high ridge, and Kate could look down and across at Castle Dracula on its crag. It was more impressive and fantastic than she could have imagined. Two of the five tall towers had been completely rebuilt, the fortified crag was connected to the rest of the mountain only by a long bridge, possibly a drawbridge, over a deep fissure, the center hall and the battlement terraces were ablaze with torchlight, people in black and red robes milled along the hundred yards of rocky crag, along the battlements, and filled the terrace at the farthest end of the citadel. Torches wound down along the steep stairway which zigzagged through the bare trees, south into the forest, then down to the meadows more than a thousand feet below. Kate could see a veritable parking lot of dark limousines down there, as well as Trigoy guards pacing in the torchlight. A grassy area on a lower crag a couple of hundred yards along the stairway below the citadel obviously had been cleared of trees, and Kate could see Radu Fortuna's helicopter at rest there, a single pilot or guard lounging by its skids. Slick, slick, Kate whispered to herself. All along the upper path, into the citadel, and along the north edge of the rebuilt structure, sharpened stakes six feet high gleamed in the torchlight. She slid off the horse, tied it to a branch behind a boulder, and crawled forward to peer at the castle through her binoculars. One of the lens tubes had cracked and filled with water, but the other amplified the scene. From her vantage point on the hill above and a little northwest of the citadel, Kate could see the guards on the drawbridge, the guards near the busy entrance to the citadel, the guards around the north edge of the battlements, and the scene on the terrace farthest from the entrance. Torchlights flickered there on hundreds of faces in silk robes. A space had been cleared on the highest area of the terrace, right where the battlements and south walls dropped a sheer thousand feet to the river and boulders below. In that lighted space, Kate could see Werner Deacon Trent on a small throne near the battlement edge. The old man was dressed in an elaborate red and black robe and looked like a wizened mummy propped up for display. There were two tall metal stakes set into the stone in that cleared area. One was empty. Mike O'Rourke was tied to the other. Kate's heart froze when she saw him. They had dressed Mike in a parody of his priest outfit, black clothes, tall white collar, a crucifix made of thorns hung upside down from a vine necklace, and he had a black blindfold on. His hands were tied behind the stake. Radu Fortuna stood in front of the crowd, resplendent in a pure red silk robe that outshone the old man's. Kate had eyes only for the silk-wrapped bundle in Fortuna's arms. The binoculars were shaking, and she had to steady them on a branch. Joshua's face was quite clear, pale and feverish-looking in the torchlight. On the table between Fortuna and O'Rourke, four golden chalices sat on white linen, the group was chanting softly. Fortuna was saying something. Kate lowered the binoculars and looked at her watch. 
Lucian said the timers were set to go off at 12.25. She was less than a hundred yards from her child and lover, but she might as well have been a light year away. Strigoi guards in black watched the approach, lounged on the bridge, stood at the citadel entrance, and were lined around the rear of the crowd on the broad terrace. The crowd itself would keep her away from the ceremony. Her watch shifted to 12.06. Kate flung the binoculars from her, clambered over the boulder, and began lowering herself into the fissure that separated her ridge from the citadel crag. The rocks were slippery. Slick, she thought. Fifty feet down and the fissure narrowed to a rocky crevasse that dropped another eighty or a hundred feet like the inside of a ragged chimney. It was only five feet across here and from the reflected lights from the torches above, Kate could see a fairly flat rock. She did not think. She jumped. Her cheap Romanian shoes scrabbled on stone and she realized that she was missing part of a heel. Shot off when we ran the roadblock. She was sliding back toward the narrow abyss. In a technique that Tom had taught her during one of their few joint rock-climbing exercises, she spread-eagled herself on the steep rock face, bringing her entire body to a friction point. She quit sliding. A hundred feet to her right, the bridge rose above the fissure, connecting the stairway and path to the citadel. Guards paced back and forth on the echoing timbers. Kate began edging right, finding handholds and footholds more by faith than by vision or feel. Once a rock came loose and she held her breath while pebbles rattled down into the fissure that was at least thirty feet wide here. The sound of sliding rock seemed terribly loud to her, but none of the shadows on the walkway above stopped or shouted. Kate moved under the bridge, clambering over lashed timbers the size of trees. She could climb up here, but that would avail her nothing. She could hear the footsteps of the guards twenty feet above her, listen to the chanting of the hundreds of Strigoi. Kate kept clambering right, always keeping three points in contact with the rock the way Tom had taught her, until suddenly the rough rocks ended and she was staring out at the river canyon itself. Under Kate's right foot now, the cliff fell away for a thousand feet into darkness. Torchlight illuminated only snatches of the stone wall ahead of her, but she realized that the south wall of the citadel along this face rose directly from the stone of the mountain. This end of the castle was not broad, a hundred and twenty feet at most, but the wall was sheer, seeming to overhang at places, and torches crackled on the battlements above. The stones here were part of the original structure, chipped and eroded in places, cracked by ice, and overgrown by weeds and even small shrubs in places. Vegetable holds. Tom had called such plant growth on a cliff face. Don't use them. Kate saw immediately that if she started sliding at any point along this traverse, she would not stop until she slid off the wall into the void above the canyon. She looked at her watch. Twelve fourteen. Just time enough to get to the terrace in time for the end. She shook her head. Without looking down, without looking back, Kate edged her way out onto the vertical wall of Castle Dracula and began the traverse in a steady crab-like motion. Chapter 39 The graduation exercise of Kate's short-lived climbing experience with Tom had been the climb of the third flat iron, a giant limestone slab that lifted above boulder like a piece of broken sidewalk tilted on end. That climb had taken most of a Saturday morning, Kate figured that she had five minutes maximum to make this traverse. There were more footholds and handholds on the castle wall than there had been on the flat iron. Kate continued sliding to her right, slowing frequently but never completely stopping. She remembered from climbing with Tom and from watching Tom climb that sometimes speed itself substituted for friction, the very act of moving quickly over a rock allowing one to cling like a fly where there was not enough friction to hold one on if the climber stopped. Kate did not stop. Fifty feet out and the pitch of the wall increased, becoming true vertical and worse than vertical in places. The torches above shed some light here, but what might look like a promising foothold often turned out to be a millimeter-thin ledge of rotting rock, an apparently sturdy handhold would become a weed with two-inch roots. But Kate kept moving, climbing when she had to get above some obstacle, 
reluctantly dropping lower when she had to pass under an overhang or avoid a smooth stretch of stone. At one point she felt the hilt of the silly little dagger cutting into her waist, but it was too dangerous to leverage her body in such a way she could get at the knife to throw it away. She left it poking her and continued moving. Her mistake was thinking that it would be faster halfway across to follow a four-inch ledge of soil where ice had fissured the stone. For a moment it was, and then the ledge slid away with the noise of sand collapsing and she was sliding down the wall with no points in full contact, no handholds, and the toes of her cheap shoes rattling uselessly against stone. Kate closed her eyes and curled her fingers into claws. Her right hand slammed into a narrow ledge where a block of stone had been displaced an inch by some forgotten earthquake. Three of her fingernails snapped off, but she kept her fingers curled and hung on, all of her weight supported by three fingers of her numb right hand. Kate slapped the wall with her left hand, but there were no handholds. Her toes scrabbled without finding a crack or ledge. Finally, she remembered Tom's technique of wedging the toes and palm and just finding a friction point to balance gravity. She pulled her knees up, forced her feet against the near vertical stone, pressed her left palm tightly against rock, and was able to lift some of the weight from her cramping right hand. She was panting so loudly now that she was afraid they would hear her on the terrace twenty-five feet above, but no sounds came down to her except the crackle of torches and the incessant chanting rising to some peak now. She did not turn her head to look at her watch. The friction point would not hold for long. Two feet to the right of her tiny handhold, another stone jutted farther out, offering a hypothetical hold for both hands. Cracks four feet below that should serve for her feet. If she could only shift her left hand across her body, she could not. Any movement of her palm or arm put all of her weight on the bruised fingers of her right hand. Her toes were slipping and she did not have enough grip anywhere to lift her feet again. The only thing she could do was let go of her one hold and try to scrabble the two feet to her right. One, she thought. Two. Her legs were beginning a sewing machine shake. Her fingers were surrendering the grip. Fuck it. Kate shifted her hand, slipped, kept all four points in touch as she scrabbled to her right, slipped again, too far, and then caught one of the toe-holds as she started to slide past it. It was deep enough for eight fingers to wedge full length between the stone. She set her chin against the tiny fissure and gasped into it. A bat exploded from the hole, its leathery wings brushing her face. Kate did not even consider letting go. I could stay here a few minutes. Rest. The hell you can. Move! She opened her eyes. Another thirty feet should put her where she wanted to be, under the edge of the terrace where the ceremony chanted on. She carefully turned her head and looked at her watch. Twelve nineteen. She did not have time for the rest of the traverse. What if my watch is slow? Kate shook with sudden giggles until she used her wrist to wipe her nose and bring her out of the hysterics. Her arms were shaking again. She looked above her picked out a route from crack to crack, stone to stone, and began climbing. Kate came up over the battlements less than twenty feet from where she wanted to be. All eyes were on Radu Fortuna, who was holding Joshua above him like an offering. A strigoi with a black hood stood next to Mike O'Rourke with a curved blade lifted to the ex-priest's throat. The chanting was very loud. Grunting despite herself, Kate leveraged her body up and over the last stone block and swung her scraped and bleeding legs off the battlement and onto a low ledge that ran along the inside of the wall. She did not take time to feel relief at being off the cliff face. Heads turned her way. Some of the chanting halted. But Radu Fortuna and the man who called himself Werner Deacon Trent were too intent on the ceremony to turn their heads. Before anyone else could move, Kate sprinted toward Fortuna. Her legs, shaky from the traverse, almost went out from under her once, but she gritted her teeth and covered the last ten feet in a flat run. She did not pause to think what she must look like to the hundreds of assembled Strigoi, this wild-eyed woman coming over the castle wall, her face still smudged with Lucian's blood, her hands bleeding, her clothes ripped and in disarray. 
Werner Deacon Trent saw her first, his heavy-lidded eyes widening, one hand rising from the carved arm of the heavy chair, and Radu Fortuna turned and saw her a second later. Not in time. Kate hit Fortuna hard with her shoulder, slamming into his ribcage and hearing the air whoosh out of him. He dropped Joshua. Kate caught the baby and backed away. Joshua was not much heavier than when he had been kidnapped. His skin was pasty, his eyes too wide, too dark, and terrified. He began to wail. The Strigoi were assembled row on row. Now black and red cowls were shoved back, guards shouted and pushed forward from the rear wall fifty feet across the terrace, there were screams and curses from the crowd, and hands reached for Kate and the baby. She glanced at her watch. Twelve twenty. Kate hurriedly backed to the low ledge, leaped on it seconds before Radu Fortuna reached her, and then jumped to the lower ledge of the crenellated battlement wall. Radu Fortuna and the others slid to a stop three feet from the wall. Kate calmly stepped up on the higher stone and held Joshua out over the edge with both arms, her bruised and bleeding fingers tight under his tiny arms. The outer layer of red silk fell away, fluttering on the wind blowing up the castle wall. Not a step, she shouted, or I drop him. Chapter 40 You crazy American cunt, hissed Radu Fortuna, his face close enough that Kate could see the white spittle at the corners of his mouth. You can't believe we are going to let you and the child go. No, said Kate. She suddenly felt very calm. This is where all of her efforts had brought her. This is where she had to be. Joshua had quit wailing and fidgeted only slightly in her hands. His tiny feet were bare, and she remembered all the times they had played this little piggy together before bedtime. He was looking at her with wide eyes. Give us the child, ordered Fortuna, taking another step closer. If you don't get back, said Kate, I drop him. She tossed Joshua slightly, catching him firmly under the arms, but not before the crowd of Reverend Strigoi gasped. Radu Fortuna took a step back. The crowd was too dense and pressing to allow any more room. He turned and said something in rapid-fire Romanian to Werner Deacon Trent. The old man had stepped off his throne and was just another face in the crowd. Doctor, Werner Deacon Trent said to her, there is no purpose to this. Yes, said Kate, there is. She could not see her watch. Three minutes remaining, perhaps. Not enough time for anything. But she would go ahead. Werner Deacon Trent shrugged. Two huge bodyguards were plucking at his sleeve in some haste, as if Kate's very presence were a threat. If you are going to jump, jump, said the old man, and turned away. Kate licked her battered lips. Release him. She had to nod in the direction she meant. Radu Fortuna turned slowly. The priest? He laughed out loud. All this to save your lover? He spat and looked behind him. A dozen Strigoi guards had rifles or automatic weapons aimed at Kate's face. If they fired, Joshua would drop with her. Kate's arms were very tired from holding the baby out above the darkness. Release him said Kate. Release him, and I will step down and give you the child. Radu Fortuna sneered. No. Kate turned and looked down. It would be a long fall. She shifted her wrist so that she could see her watch. Twelve twenty-two. Too late. She wondered if she and the baby would feel anything. Yes, said Werner Deacon Trent from deep in the crowd in his shaky old man's voice. Release the priest. No! shouted Radu Fortuna. I forbid it! Werner Deacon Trent's face seemed to Kate to shift then from something merely old and worn out to something powerful and not quite human. Release him! bellowed the old man, and there was no trace of weakness in his voice this time. Radu Fortuna blinked as if he had been slapped. He gestured weakly to the executioner who stood next to O'Rourke at the stake. The long knife cut the ropes that bound the priest. O'Rourke took off his blindfold, rubbed his wrists, and looked at her. 
Kate, I don't... Shut up, Mike, she said, her voice soft. The only other sound was the crackling of torches. Just go. But I... Just go, my darling. She nodded toward the bridge and the steps leaving the castle. Go down the trail. Past the slick, all right? Past the slick and down to the bend we can see from here. Take one of the torches out when you get there and wave it back and forth so we can see that you are there. Then I will give the baby back to them. Let it be so, Radu Fortuna said in English and then in Romanian. O'Rourke hesitated only a second. Nodding, saying nothing, he stepped down from the sacrificial dais, went around the table laid out with chalices, and made his way through the strigoi. He was limping, but his damaged prosthesis obviously still worked. The dense crowd parted for him. One guard spat as he passed, but no one interfered. Kate leaned out farther and hugged the baby to her side. Anyone rushing her would send both of them plunging. If she were shot, the impact would knock her off. Joshua began crying softly, his pudgy hands gripping the wool of her sweater. He babbled syllables, and Kate was sure that she heard, Mommy. Hand us the child, and we will let you go, Radu Fortuna said smoothly, extending his arms. Kate hunted for Werner Deacon Trent, but the old face was no longer visible in the crowd. You won't let me go, Kate said tiredly. God damn you, woman! exploded Fortuna. Of course we will not fucking let you go, nor the fucking priest. Even if he leaves this mountain, we will find him, return him, and drink his fucking blood. Now give me the child. Kate held Joshua out over the abyss with straight arms. The pain tore at her muscles and shoulder sockets, but the movement froze Fortuna in his tirade. She could see her watch. Twelve twenty-five. She closed her eyes. The white light, when it came, was a surprise. The noise was very loud. The Bell Jet Ranger helicopter just cleared the west tower and seemed to skim the east tower. Its searchlight was on and flashing across the crowd, blinding the Strigoi and Kate as well. The helicopter slewed sideways, seemed to be about to land in the middle of the Strigoi throng, and sent the crowd shoving back toward the far wall, the wind of the machine's rotors pelting them with dust, gravel and grit thrown up from the terrace. The chalices on the long table were blown off as red and white vestments fluttered and linens lifted into the sky like streams of toilet paper in a high wind. Radu Fortuna screamed a curse that was lost in the incredible rotor noise. Guards tried to press forward and left their weapons in the crush of the retreating Strigoi mob. Kate caught the briefest glimpse of O'Rourke on the left side of the helicopter's steel and plexiglass bubble his face intent as he obviously wrestled with the controls, and then she was holding on to the baby with one arm and flailing to keep her balance with her right arm as the rotor wind threatened to tumble her off the wall into the canyon. Radu Fortuna lunged forward and seized her ankle. Joshua screamed at the avalanche of light and noise. The helicopter pivoted, it skid six feet above Kate, and the entire machine moved sideways out over the canyon as if sliding on an invisible layer of ice. The rotor blast almost threw Kate back onto Radu Fortuna. The Strigoi shielded his eyes with one hand and pulled at her ankle with the other. Several guards pushed through the mob. The helicopter slid back toward Kate, the machine rocking like a rowboat in rough waves. Kate ducked as the slick's right skid bobbed where her head had been a second before. She started to rise and then ducked again as the door that O'Rourke had left open on the right side of the machine swung wider and almost took her head off. The rotor noise and gale was beyond belief. Radu Fortuna snarled and grabbed the collar of her sweater. Kate did not look back as she swung her right elbow back hard into his teeth. His hand released her collar. Kate stood up quickly while the door was open, leaned out over the emptiness, and set her baby in the right seat. O'Rourke shouted something she could not hear, lifted his right hand from the stick to reach across and keep Joshua from sliding out, had to return his hand to the controls, and bobbed the helicopter down and to the left to keep the baby from rolling out. Kate pinwheeled her arms, could not catch her balance, and leaped as hard and as far as she could out into the abyss.
Chapter 41 The helicopter was already sliding back toward the castle, and Kate hit the right skid hard, her arms going over it, her chin snapping down, her breasts feeling as if she had been slammed by a baseball bat, and the wind going out of her in a rush. She hung on. The door on the right side was still swinging open and shut, and O'Rourke was working the controls, trying to hover without allowing Joshua to tumble out. The helicopter wheeled right. Kate glanced over her shoulder and saw Strigoi guards raise their machine guns in the hailstorm of grit and dust. No! screamed Radu Fortuna. He stepped up onto the wall. Kate tried to scream at O'Rourke to move left, but the ex-priest was obviously too busy trying to control the machine and keep the rotor from slamming into the tower or battlements. The helicopter slid another eight feet to the right as if on invisible rails. Radu Fortuna reached up, grabbed the open door, and stepped easily onto the skid. O'Rourke glanced left, saw the shadow of the man leaning in, and banked the helicopter steeply to the left. Kate's fingers slid off the fuselage, but she clung to the skid and the metal strut holding the skid in place. Under her shoes, the vertical face of the castle wall suddenly upended and seemed to swing sideways as the chopper first dove, then rose again, always tilting a bit to the left so that Joshua would not tumble out. Kate swung her leg up onto the strut and kicked Radu Fortuna's ankles out from under him before he could step into the cabin. Fortuna fell forward and swung out on the door, his legs hanging free. Kate released her secure handhold, balanced forward on the skid as if doing a forward roll on a tubular balance beam, and got her left hand in the open cabin doorway. There was a ridge there, and she locked her fingers around it and pulled herself to one knee on the slippery skid. O'Rourke leveled the helicopter sixty or seventy feet above the castle terrace. A score of muzzles were lifted toward them, but no one fired because of the baby and Radu Fortuna. With the helicopter level, the door swung inward and Fortuna's stocky body slammed into Kate, squeezing her against the door frame, but not giving her enough room to pull herself into the cabin. His strong left hand seized her by the throat and began squeezing. They were both standing on the bobbing skid now. Their weight tipped the machine sickeningly to the right, and Kate felt Joshua's small form strike her back. If she and Fortuna went off now, the baby would come with them. She tried to twist out of the Strigoi's grasp, but the chopper tilted left, his weight fell against her, and he freed his right hand to complete his choking. His thumbs closed over her windpipe, and Kate knew that he could break her neck in a second. The helicopter bobbed slightly, a space opened between their bodies, and Kate pulled the gypsy's dagger from her belt and plunged it through Fortuna's flapping vestments into his stomach. The blade did not go deep. Kate's leverage was too restricted and Fortuna's robes too thick. But the pain and shock stopped Radu Fortuna's thumbs from closing on her neck. Kate released her grip on the inside of the door and pushed the knife farther in, knowing precisely where the largest bundle of nerve fibers was. Radu Fortuna roared, pulled his hands from her throat, and wrestled the knife away from her, pulling it from its shallow cut. O'Rourke banked the hovering machine to the left at precisely the right instant. Kate leaned far back onto the seat over Joshua's wailing form, lifted her legs, and kicked Fortuna off the skid. She swung her legs in, held the baby tight against the back of the seat, and leaned out the flapping door to watch Fortuna fall. Several hundred white faces stared up from red and black cowls, all of them watching while the short man, arms swinging and legs extended as gracefully as a skydiver's, did two complete somersaults in the air and then fell, face up, with all limbs extended for the final sixty feet, directly onto the metal stake that had been reserved for Kate. The crowd of Strigoi raised their hands as blood spattered their robes and faces. Two of the guards began to fire short bursts. Go! screamed Kate, slamming the banging door shut. Higher! Her watch said twelve twenty-six and thirty seconds. Something banged against the fuselage behind them, but O'Rourke ignored it, twisted something on the stick in his right hand, lifted a lever in his left hand, kicked at rudder pedals, and the jet ranger's engine whined higher. They banked to the left and started climbing away from the citadel and the muzzle flashes. Kate looked down, realized that the castle was now on the other side, saw something dark far below, like a giant bat. 
its shadow rippling across the river for the briefest second, and then she raised her wrist again, looked at her watch, and shouted above the engine roar to O'Rourke. What time is it? He glanced toward her incredulously. You expect me to take my hand off the collective to tell you, What is the fucking time? she screamed, realizing that she sounded a little hysterical even to herself. O'Rourke blinked, freed his left hand for a second, and said, My watch says twelve twenty-five. The world exploded beneath them and around them. Chapter 42 At the last second O'Rourke swung the helicopter around, still in its climb, to face the shock wave, and that probably saved their lives. Instead of being swatted out of the sky like a fleeing insect, the Belljet Ranger rose on the blast like a leaf above a roaring fire. The ride was vertical, faster than any elevator Kate had ever been on, and the view below was not something she would soon forget. Poenari Citadel, Castle Dracula, exploded in a score of places, gigantic mushrooms of flame rising a thousand feet above the crag the castle was built on. More explosions ripped through the woods, the stairway, the grassy area where the helicopter had been parked, and the stairway to the valley below. An instant later, a second series of explosions seemed to erupt from the cliff wall itself. The west tower of the citadel became a billion fragments of shrapnel flying ahead of the blossoming orange ball of flame, but the east tower seemed to rise like some medieval space shuttle, much of the upper battlements seemingly intact and balancing on a tail of pure flame. Then the illusion dissolved as the tower flew apart in ten-ton fragments and fell onto the streaming strigoi crowded on the terrace. The terrace itself was rocked with explosions that sent flame a hundred yards out over the river valley. If there were any human forms left on the east and north sections of the crag that held the citadel, they were not visible as more explosions opened cracks in what little brick and stone that remained. The terrace section of the castle separated itself from the rubble of the main keep and tumbled a thousand feet into the valley, its cloud of dust adding to the pall of smoke and haze that filled the entire width of the canyon. The trees within a hundred yards of the former citadel had burst into flame, the fire jumping to their crowns in seconds, and a great wind seemed to be whipping thick trunks back and forth like reeds. Kate saw all this in the few seconds of their vertical elevator ride. She cradled the screaming Joshua tighter as the helicopter reached the top of its arc and prepared to drop straight down into that conflagration. She had no seat belt on, and she and the baby rose six inches off the seat as the helicopter reached its apogee. Hang on! O'Rourke yelled uselessly, and then he threw the stick in his right hand hard to the left, kicked his right rudder pedal, and squeezed the throttle wide open. The roar of the jet turbine became louder than the explosions and landslides two thousand feet below them. They could not recover in the fifteen hundred feet of altitude they had above the blazing ruins of the citadel. O'Rourke obviously did not try to. He put the helicopter's nose down and dove it into the canyon. The turbine screamed louder, alarms went off on the console in front of both him and Kate, and the wind slammed at the not-quite-latched door inches from Joshua's face. Kate held the baby tight and watched the river rise toward them at a terrifying rate. O'Rourke set both his good leg and artificial one hard against the pedals, gripped the stick in both hands, and began easing the machine out of its bucking, screaming dive. Kate felt the heat of the burning mountain as they hurtled past it, and then the canyon walls were whipping by on both sides, the river rising to fill the soot-streaked windscreen in front of them. Kate closed her eyes for a second. When she opened them, they were hurtling along in level flight thirty feet above the Argesh, heading south. Kate saw trucks and lights on the river bank to her left and realized that it was the spot where the Dacia had crashed, the spot where she had left Lucian. She closed her eyes again. Goodbye, my friend. There will be no more orphans used to feed the Strigoi's thirst. Joshua stirred in her arms and she patted the baby's back. With luck, just a little luck. There will be no more AIDS babies. O'Rourke was clicking off alarms, snapping toggles on a panel between them. He glanced to his right. Are you all right? Kate started to answer but began laughing instead. 
She put her free hand up to stop the giggles, but ended up just snuffling and giggling into her wrist. O'Rourke frowned for a second, but then began laughing himself. When they could stop, Kate shifted the baby to her right arm and touched his shoulder with her left hand. Are they going to shoot us down now? The Air Force or something? O'Rourke let go of the stick for a moment to take a headset from a bracket and slip it over his head. He tapped the microphone and then lifted the right earphone. Nope, I don't think so. Romania has one of those air forces that doesn't like to fly at night. He threw toggles on the console and she could hear a beeping from the earphones near her head. O'Rourke gestured and she set them on. Hear me better now? he asked. The engine roar and rotor noise was a distant thing, his voice clear in her headphones. She nodded. He banked to the right and gained altitude over the foothills. Kate realized that they had already covered all the ground that it had taken Lucian and her hours to drive through the Transylvanian hills between Remniku Vilcha and Kirtia de Argesh. She settled back in the seat, found a shoulder harness, and buckled herself in. Joshua was breathing easily, dozing off. Kate shook her head. This kind of aircraft carries a transponder, O'Rourke said through the intercom. I suspect that no one in Romania would mess with this particular helicopter even if we buzzed the capital. They continued to climb. High peaks were ahead, but they were already flying higher than the snow-capped summits. Do we have enough gas to get out of here? She asked into the little microphone. O'Rourke would know that here meant Romania. He smiled at her. His eye was still swollen almost shut, and his lips were a mess from the beating they had given him, but he looked happy. If I find even the slightest tailwind, we'll have enough gas to land in downtown Budapest, he said. Which side of the river would you prefer, Buda or Pest? You choose, Kate whispered into the microphone. I've made enough decisions for one day. O'Rourke nodded and concentrated on the controls. Mike, she said a minute later. She was gently rocking Joshua, feeling the baby's warm breath on her cheek. Lucian is dead. I'm sorry, he said. Do you want to tell me about it? And how you managed all this? In a while, said Kate. But tell me something first. Do you know anything about Lucian's mentor? Mentor? No. His voice was puzzled. It wasn't you? No, Kate. She rubbed her hand across her baby's head. His hair had grown. He was blowing bubbles in his sleep. New cure for colic she thought irrelevantly. Take the baby for a helicopter ride. Could it have been the church, sponsoring Lucian in his fight against the Strigoi, I mean? O'Rourke thought a minute. No, I don't think so. I think I would have heard about it if the church had been actively involved like that. The best the church could do was tend to the victims all these years. I'm sorry, Kate. Is this mentor thing important? Perhaps not, said Kate. They were flying through scattered clouds now, still climbing. The instrument lights were red. O'Rourke fiddled with something and a heater came on. The sound and feel of the warm air was soothing to Kate, like being a child again, out on a ride in her parents' car at night with the heater fan blowing gently. Despite the adrenaline still surging through her body, Kate actually felt sleepy. There is something important we have to talk about, though, she said. She did not add the us. O'Rourke nodded. She looked his way and saw him smiling at her. I look forward to talking about that, he said softly. Joshua made the kind of vaguely troubled noise that babies make while dreaming, and Kate rocked him gently. Suddenly they came out of the cloud layer, and it seemed to her that the tops of the clouds were like a sea, and they were a submarine rising to the surface and above it. The cloud tops gleamed beneath them as far as she could see in each direction. There was no sense now of national boundaries, or of nations, of the darkness that lay below those clouds. Kate would not mind staying above these clouds for a while. She rocked the baby, crooning very softly, and watched out the window as they leveled off and flew northwest. "'I've got the tailwind we needed,' said O'Rourke, "'and I'm pretty sure the Navstar system is working right.' We'll be following the Danube for part of the way. Kate nodded in a distracted way. 
She had just realized how bright the stars were up here in this moonless sky, so bright that they turned the cloud tops into a milky ocean of subtle white hues. O'Rourke was holding the stick with his left hand now, turning a radio dial with his right. When he had found the channel he wanted, Kate reached over and gently took his hand. Not speaking, still holding hands, they flew west under the canopy of stars. Epilogue When they opened my grave on Schnagov Island, they found it empty. That was in 1932. In the winter of 1476, I had briefly regained the throne of Transylvania, but my enemies were legion and they would not cease their attempts until I was dead. That winter, surrounded and outnumbered by foes, I was driven into the swamps near Schnagov by those who would have my head. Instead, they found my headless and mangled body in the marshes there. They identified me by my royal clothes and by the signet ring bearing the sign of the Order of the Dragon on my finger. I had taken only one loyal boyar ally in my flight to the marshes. He was loyal, but not terribly smart. He was my general size and build. It was to be the first time I left Transylvania with one of my sons. It was not the last. I admit that I was not sure whether I would stay at the Citadel for the denouement. That morning, being outfitted in my clumsy robes and flown south in the machine, I decided that I would. I was very tired. If my body would not die of its own accord, I would give it peace by other means. But when the woman showed up, the irony of the situation appealed to me. I suppose dear young Lucian had violated his orders and interceded to save her. I had half expected him to. Sometimes it is best to allow fate to play the last hand. I had only met Lucian the two times I brought him to the United States to receive his instructions, but I will not forget him. At first the boy refused to believe that he was one of my sons, but I showed him the photographs of his mother, taken, of course, before she fled from me to return to her homeland. I showed Lucian the documents that proved that it had been Radu Fortuna who had killed his real mother and placed him in an orphanage. I told him that he was lucky, that most pure Strigoi couples put their normal offspring to death. Lucian's zeal served us well. He joined the Order of the Dragon. He never doubted my motives of purifying the family of its decadent branches. He understood my sincerity in finding a scientific answer to the family disease. Which may be another reason that I did not stay for the final act. The morning of the ceremony I had injected myself with a serum the woman doctor had brought all that way only to lose in Sigishwara. By evening I could feel the change. It was like the sacrament without the hormonal ragings that had so tired me out over the ages. By the time the absurd woman pulled herself over the parapets of our citadel, I felt centuries younger. My long disgust at what Radu Fortuna and the others of his ilk have done to my family, not to mention the people of my nation, was burning in my gut like the flames of pure anger I had not felt for many years. So, in the end, I decided not to stay for the end. The Dobrins whisked me through the crowd to the secret exit in the basement of the main hall. The German elevator I had installed there worked efficiently, as do all things German. I must admit that I thought of the tons of explosives set in the walls we were descending through. I thought of the Czech, Hungarian, and German engineers I had brought in to set those charges over the past two years, and about how their bones were now mixing with the new mortar there. The irony was inescapable, but we were running late and the Dobrin's obvious anxiety did not allow me to enjoy an old man's love of irony. There were no horses waiting in the cave this time, only the golf cart and the third Dobrin brother. It took less than a minute to race down the paved tunnel to the river exit, but we only had a minute or two. The black OH-6 Loach helicopter was where I had directed it to be, the engine warmed, the rotors turning the fourth Dobrin brother at the controls. We were away in thirty seconds. It was almost not in time. The entire mountain came apart above us as we roared up the canyon toward Sigishwara and home. I must admit, I have always enjoyed fireworks, and this may be the best show I have attended. In the weeks and months since that night, 
I find that the hemoglobin substitute has other effects beyond renewing my capacity to enjoy life. It reduces the amount I dream almost to zero. This is not an unwelcome thing. I have thought about the child of mine who was taken that night. At first I considered retrieving him, of raising him the way I raised Vlad and Menea. But then I remembered what potential he holds, and I have decided to let the woman doctor raise him and learn from him. I have been a source of terror to my people and employees many times in my long life. I know now that I would have welcomed being a savior to my people. Perhaps, through this child, just perhaps. Meanwhile, I am considering returning to the States, or at least the civilized part of Europe, to be closer to the laboratories making my hemoglobin substitute. It occurred to me recently that Japan is a place I have never lived. It is an intriguing place, filled with the energy and business that is the lifeblood I feed on now. In the meantime, I have given up thoughts of dying soon. Such thoughts were the products of illness, age, and bad dreams. I no longer have the bad dreams. Perhaps I will live forever. Acknowledgements The author would like to thank the following people for their invaluable help in the preparation for this novel. In Romania, my sincere thanks to the poet Emil Manu and to his wife and family for their wonderful hospitality. A special thanks to Lucian and Joanne Manu for their friendship, insights, and for a peek into a Bucharest most tourists do not see. Also, a sincere Motumesc Foarte Mult to Marius from ONT and to Anna Manol and her sister in the village of Ciofringeni for their kindness to strangers. In the USA, I would like to thank Gayan Wilson for the pleasant dinner conversation and the copy of his 1977 Playboy article, Dracula Country. It was the single best source for tracking down the real Castle Dracula. My thanks also to Keith Neidenhelser of DePaul University for sharing the research of Robert Cochran and Laszlo Kurti on the politics of joking in Romania and Eastern Europe. I would also like to thank Dana Gall for the Romanian instruction and Radica Varna for keeping me out of a Bucharest hotel which had its walls shot out. A special thanks to Byron Priest and Richard Curtis for making me write about Dracula in the first place. And thank you to Chris Pepe at Putnam's for her patience and enthusiasm. In the USA, Romania, Hungary, and Austria, an inadequate but sincere thanks to Claudia Lagerquist for her research, linguistic skills, stamina, courage, and spirit of adventure. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my debt to Radu R. Florescu and Raymond T. McNally, authors of Dracula, Prince of Many Faces, In Search of Dracula, and other works. Their writings have almost single-handedly renewed interest in the historical Vlad Dracula, and I recommend their books to the interested reader. One caveat for the serious Dracula seeker, however, the caption under the photograph of the only extant bust of Vlad Shepish on page 170 of Dracula, Prince of Many Faces, says that the statue is to be found in the village of Kopitineni, sick. In truth, the bust is to be found not in the shadow of Castle Dracula in Kupitsineni, but across from the old palace grounds in Tirgovishta, some one hundred kilometers away. Thanks to the research of these men and other scholars, I can say that all of the memories I ascribe to Vlad Dracula in this book, with the possible exception of the sacrament, are true. End of Children of the Night by Dan Simmons Read by Barrett Whitener in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services, Incorporated, for the Library of Congress, October 1994. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, G. P. Putnam's Sons, 200 Madison Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. End of book.